All right, in this lecture, uh, we're moving into convective heat transfers. So we'll begin by looking at the principles of convection. So for a lot of the problems we've been looking at, uh, our external boundary condition, whenever we refer to convective boundary conditions, we assign the convective heat transfer coefficient h, and we have seen this over and over in all of the things we've looked at thus far. Uh, but what convection will enable us to do is figure out what the value of h is. And if you recall, way back at the beginning of the course, we talked about what convective heat transfer actually was. And it's essentially transfer of energy between a surface, either being uh, hotter than a fluid going past it or cooler, but it's energy exchange between a solid and a fluid, and that fluid could be a gas or a liquid. So when we're looking at convective heat transfer, uh, what we're going to be considering uh, pretty much for the remainder of the course is going to begin with principles of convection, which is what we will be covering in this lecture. We'll then move into forced convection. And forced convection can be either internal or external. Internal would be an example of the flow within a pipe. Uh, external flow would be the flow over a heated fin, for example, where you're forcing the, the fluid to go over that fin. Uh, we'll also be looking at free convection, sometimes also called natural convection. And we'll be looking at convection with phase change. And we refer to this, there are two types that we'll be looking at, uh, boiling and condensation. And finally, we'll be looking at convective heat transfer when we study heat exchangers. So you can see uh, we're going to be looking at convection quite extensively for the remainder of the course. And if you recall, the equation that enables us to quantify the amount of convective heat transfer uh, was Newton's law of cooling. And so through Newton's law of cooling, we have a temperature differential between our free stream velocity and the wall temperature. And the net consequence of that is that temperature differential results in energy exchange or heat transfer, either from the wall to the fluid or from the fluid to the wall, dependent upon which is larger. And, and so we've been using this over and over and over again throughout the course, but one thing that we haven't really addressed is where does H come from? And so that's what we're now going to set out to determine is how to quantify H. Okay, so in determining H, there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. Now, given that convective heat transfer involves a fluid flowing over the surface, we need to examine that fluid flow in order to be able to quantify the value of H. And consequently, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at analytical solutions. And there are only a limited number that exist. And the reason for that is if the flow is turbulent, we have no analytical solutions for the particular flow field. 
and otherwise uh, it, it's only for fairly restrictive geometries that we can get an analytical velocity profile from which we could then get the temperature profile using the energy equation. Uh, and so we'll use analytical solutions. We'll look at a few. And, but for the most part, what we do in heat tra transfer, uh, convective heat transfer, is we use empirical data. And, and so this is data uh, that has been collected via experimentation. And this is quite widely used. And so what you're going to find is we're going to be uh, using uh, different values, namely the convective heat transfer coefficient that will be embedded within non-dimensional numbers. And, and that data has been collected experimentally and then collapsed into these non-dimensional numbers to give it application to geometries that are different from the ones that are studied uh, in an experiment. So they, they would scale geometrically. Uh, but but they, they would be either subscale models or things like that. So anyways, we'll, we'll be looking at that as we look at convective heat transfer. So really what that means is that convective heat transfer, uh, it, within the heart of it, it really is a fluid mechanics problem. And the other thing that we'll find is uh, the convective heat transfer coefficient We'll find that the convective heat transfer coefficient itself will often come from experimental data. And like I said, it will be represented in non-dimensional numbers for force convection. Quite often we're using the new salt number, which is a number that we'll be taking a look at. Uh, but that's what we're going to be doing. So we'll be doing a lot of fluid mechanics in this lecture and in the next couple. And, and then it turns into a matter of collapsing experimental data into forms that we can use for engineering applications. So that will be a lot of what we're doing with convective heat transfer and estimating the convective heat transfer coefficient H. Okay, in the last segment, what we said was that uh, we're looking at convective heat transfer and trying to determine the value of the convective heat transfer coefficient. And we said that uh, convective heat transfer really does come down to being a fluid mechanics problem. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin looking at one of the most basic flows within fluid mechanics, and that is the flow over a flat plate. And what we'll be doing is taking a look at the boundary layer, uh, which is the flow that is adjacent to a flat plate. And that will kind of become the basis of a lot of the things we're going to be looking at in terms of being able to estimate the convective heat transfer coefficient H. So we'll begin, I'll draw out a schematic of the boundary layer going from laminar through transition to turbulent. Okay, so what we have here is a schematic uh, representation of what is going on in the boundary layer, starting from the leading edge of a flat plate. And so th this is the leading edge up here. And the flow starts off on the flat plate growing in what we call a laminar boundary layer. And, and so that is where the uh, flow is relatively smooth. There are not a lot of significant fluctuations within the flow. 
And then what happens is the flow undergoes instabilities and growth of these instabilities and, and it transitions from laminar into a turbulent boundary layer. And the turbulent boundary layer has very, very different characteristics from the laminar boundary layer. Uh, growth rate is very different as well as heat transfer characteristics would be very, very different. Uh, but this transition process begins at uh, Reynolds number and we use Reynolds number uh, to characterize many, many different fluid mechanic flows and, and the boundary layer flow is one of those. And the way that we define the Reynolds number is U infinity, which would be the free stream velocity times some characteristic length scale. And for a flat plate boundary layer, it's usually the distance from the leading edge. And then we divide that by the kinematic viscosity nu. And remember that nu is just mu, our dynamic viscosity, divided by the density of the fluid flowing over the flat plate. So what happens is uh, we have this transition region, boundary layer thickness is shown here, and that basically represents how thick the boundary layer is, and we'll be defining that in a moment. It's basically where the velocity goes up to being about 99% of the free stream velocity. So that is what is happening in the boundary layer. And the main thing to take away from this is just to understand that uh, laminar boundary layer characteristics are very different from turbulent and consequently there will be very, very different heat transfer characteristics. Um, and what else should we take away from this? Uh, we'll be looking at the growth rate. Uh, we'll be looking at the heat transfer characteristics in both regions. So those are probably the main things uh, to take away at this point. So let's take a look at the boundary layer thickness itself. Ah, one other thing that we should take away. We can perform analysis on the laminar boundary layer. However, we cannot uh, perform analysis on the turbulent boundary layer. For that, uh, we try to do it using numerical methods. Direct numerical simulation is really the only one that truly is able to replicate it. Uh, but for the most part, we end up using uh, different experimental values that are uh, kind of tweaking a numerical solution or we just go and do experiments directly. So laminar boundary layer we can come up with solutions for but turbulent is hard. Uh, even laminar can be hard depending upon the external pressure gradient that might be with our flow. But, but so looking at the boundary layer thickness delta x So there are different definitions for the boundary layer thickness, but we'll use this one, 99% of the free stream velocity. We already introduced the Reynolds number, but I'll write that out again. And in a generic sense, Reynolds number for the flat plate boundary layer is U infinity, the characteristic length scale, which is distance from the leading edge, divided by our kinematic viscosity. Okay, and the last thing, uh, well, another thing that I want to say about this, we talked here about this critical Reynolds number, and that is the Reynolds number uh, typically where we would expect the boundary layer to start going through a transition process where it goes from laminar to turbulent. And the value of that, uh, there are different values that you'll find in the literature, but typically one that is often used is 5 times 10 to the 5. And the reason why there are different values is uh, the transition process is dependent upon a number of different things. One of them is the baseline turbulence in the flow coming in to begin with. We always assume that this flow is perfectly laminar coming in, but there, there's always residual turbulence in any kind of flow field that you'll have. And, and consequently it would be dependent upon that and it would also be dependent upon surface roughness how how rough the flat plate is and and that can have an impact on this critical Reynolds number there's a field called hydrodynamic stability and that is involved with studying the process of transition from laminar to turbulent
but rule of thumb, typically 5 times 10 to the 5 is the number that you'll often see uh, quoted in the literature. And this is the point where, and sometimes you'll see the acronym LBL, that stands for Laminar Boundary Layer Transitions, to a TBL, and that stands for the Turbulent Boundary Layer. So if you see LBL or TBL, that is what that is referring to. So that is the boundary layer flow, and that is a flow that we will be studying uh, in the next uh, this lecture and in the next lecture, and it kind of forms the basis for a lot of the uh, heat transfer relationships that we'll be coming up with. Uh, because even with a rounded object, uh, let, let's say you have flow over an object like this, uh, what we can do is we can zoom in to parts of that object and treat this as being almost like a flat plate. There will be a pressure gradient external which will have an impact on the boundary layer, but any point you can piecewise uh, look at the flow over any kind of object uh, in, in the manner of looking at it like a boundary layer. Unless you get to a separation point. When you have separation, uh, then you're going to get uh, the boundary layer lifting off. And, and the flow in here is very, very uh, non-stationary and, and, and very, very complex. And consequently, the boundary layer, uh, you would not be able to really apply it in that region. And we'll be seeing that when we look at flow over bluff bodies, such as cylinders, and then the heat, uh, heat transfer characteristics of a cylinder. But that is the flat plate boundary layer, and that's something that we'll be looking at as we go along. Okay, in the last segment we introduced the idea of the boundary layer and the fact that fluid mechanics is very important in terms of determining the convective heat transfer coefficient. What we're now going to do, uh, we're going to look at the flat plate again, but we're going to consider only the first part of the flat plate boundary layer flow, and that is where we have a laminar boundary layer. So, in analyzing the laminar boundary layer, uh, some of the earliest development came uh, with Ludwig Prantl, and what he did is he took the Navier-Stokes equations, and these are the governing equations for fluid mechanics, basically F equals MA, uh, and he took the Navier-Stokes equations and he simplified them for a boundary layer flow, and then what happened is one of Prantl's students, Blasius, he solved these equations uh, through numerical hand calculation. And so the Blasius solution is uh, what will become the basis of a lot of the results that we're going to be using when we look at the laminar boundary layer. Uh, one thing that, that I should say is that no exact closed form analytical solution exists. Blasius solution uh, only comes about by doing numerical integration and consequently you get a table of values that you can use for the velocity. Now, Theodore von Karman, a little later, played around with different types of profiles, quadratic, cubic, and he came up with approximations for the velocity profile. But it was not a, an exact velocity profile like Blasius's came out to be. And both von Karman and Blasius were students of Prantl at Göttingen in Germany. And so what von Karman came up with uh, was a velocity profile that looks something like this. You divide by the free stream. And this is looking at a quadratic. There's also cubics that, that he came up with. Uh, di different functional profiles. 
And so if you want, you can look at my fluid mechanics lectures and, and I go through uh, the use of this profile for coming up with things like the skin friction coefficient and the momentum thickness. Uh, we're not going to worry about that now in, in this lecture because we're looking at heat transfer. But looking at the velocity profile, uh, it would be something like this. Here's our flat plate. Remember, X is going in the direction of the flow. Y, when we're looking at boundary layers, is always normal to the plate. And then we have our delta of x and our velocity profile. And so here is the velocity profile. Once we get out into the free stream, we get to u infinity. And here we have u. And I'll show it, of, sorry, not y, it's u. Uh, the velocity u of y, and really implicitly it's also of x. And, and that results given the fact that delta of x is in here. And, and consequently it is scaling with u, uh, with y and x. And delta, the boundary layer thickness, is delta of x. And remember we said that's where we get the 99% the free stream. Now, that is a velocity profile that von Karman came up with. Now with Blasius, he was able to, using his numerical integration, come up with the value for delta of x. So let's take a look at what that value was obtained as being. And he got delta of x, the boundary layer thickness, was 5.0x divided by Reynolds' number of x to the 1 half. And, and so this was uh, Blasius solution. Okay, so that is only one half of the problem, and I'm not going to go through and, and come up with a Blasius profile. You can look in textbooks of fluid mechanics and, and find that. Some heat transfer books may have it as well. Uh, but having the velocity profile is only one half of the problem, because really, remember, we're interested in heat transfer and the convective heat transfer coefficients. So uh, we have to go a little bit further than that. Okay, so uh, having the velocity profile, that's only taking us halfway. Uh, what we need to do, we need to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient. And so how can we go about doing that? Well, it turns out that you need to be able to get the temperature profile in the boundary layer in order to estimate the convective heat transfer coefficient. And let's take a look at uh, how we may go about doing that. So here we have a, the flat plate again. I assume that's our boundary layer. And here we're assuming that the flat plate, oops, not T infinity, uh, that should be T wall. And then we have some flow field. And this is not the velocity boundary layer that I'm drawing. This would be a profile of the uh, temperature distribution. Let's say the wall is hotter than the fluid. You may have something that looks like that. So that would be your temperature profile. And then eventually you get to the point where you are at T infinity, which is the free stream uh, temperature profile. And what we're going to do, we're going to introduce a thermal boundary layer thickness, which is going to be a function of X as well. And so that would be the point where we get out to the free stream temperature and you do not see the presence of the wall any longer. So T of Y, I remember Y was normal to the wall. And the result of this is we have heat transfer taking place. And so there's Q. And we know through Newton's law of cooling, we have the convective heat transfer coefficient, which is what we're ultimately after here. So looking at the equations, what we can do, uh, we know through Fourier's law, And what I'm doing is I'm taking advantage of a thing called the no-slip boundary condition. And what that means is right along the wall, if we look at the velocity profile, that's not a very good plate. Let me do this. Okay, so here is our flat plate. And, and if we look at the velocity profile right along the wall, if you were to go microscopically into the wall, at the wall, the velocity is zero. 
u at y equals zero is equal to zero. And, and so that is what we call the no split boundary condition. And with that, uh, the only mechanism of heat transfer when there is zero velocity is going to be via conduction. And consequently, we can use Fourier's law. And so that's what we're doing with this expression up here. And we also know that that, through Newton's law of cooling, is going to be equal to H times T wall minus T free stream. And we have that expression. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to work to isolate H. So let's isolate H. And we obtain that expression there. And so this is going to be the basis by which uh, we're able to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient for the laminar boundary layer flow that we're looking at. But in order to get this, what we need to do, we need to know temperature as a function of y. And, and that is uh, part of the solution technique that is required. So we need to know the temperature profile. Okay, so in order to get the convective heat transfer coefficient, we need to know the temperature profile. And then once we obtain H, uh, what we do uh, typically in fluid mechanics is we embed that within a non-dimensional number. And, and that number is the Nussault number. So there is the Nussault number. What it is, it's the convective heat transfer coefficient times some characteristic length scale, in this case x, the distance from the start of the plate, divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid. And so let me write those out. Okay, so a Nussault number is the number that we will use quite often. And one thing I should say is, notice we have new salt number X. That denotes that this is a local new salt number, not an average. Uh, other times you'll see new salt number with an over bar. That denotes average for an entire plate. So just be uh, careful. This new salt number refers to uh, convective heat transfer coefficient evaluated at some specific X location. Other times this would have H bar and that would be the average convective heat transfer coefficient over an entire object. But anyways, that is the new salt number and that is what we will use, uh, just like the Reynolds number, uh, but we'll use it for characterizing the amount of convective heat transfer coefficient on some object that we're studying. So that's the laminar boundary layer, uh, the new salt number, and what we're after, we need to get the temperature profile. So what we are going to do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at the thermal boundary layer uh, in relation to the viscous boundary layer, the velocity boundary layer, and, and, and they are related to one another, but, but we'll be looking at that as, as we move along, looking at an introduction to convective heat transfer. All right, in the last segment, what we did is we took a look at the laminar boundary layer and we said that uh, in order to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient, uh, we needed to be able to determine the thermal boundary layer or the, the temperature distribution normal to the wall. So what we're going to do in this segment, we're going to take a, a brief look at what the thermal boundary layer development may look like. And we're going to begin by looking at the thermal boundary layer thickness. Remember we saw the boundary layer thickness itself, that was delta of x. Now here we will have delta t of x. And just like we said for the hydrodynamic or velocity boundary layer, uh, this is defined as the point where we reach 99% of the free stream temperature. 
And there may be other definitions for it, but that's one that we'll use here. Uh, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to begin by looking at just a generic flat plate. And we're going to make it very generic from the perspective that not all of the plate is going to be heated. So this is the leading edge of the plate up here. And this is our plate. And what we're going to do, we're going to assume that the first little bit of the plate is not heated. And consequently, we can say that in this region up here, the temperature of the plate is equal to the free stream temperature. And the free stream we have coming in this direction. So that is U infinity and T infinity. And coordinate system normal to the wall and then along the wall is X. And we will call this distance here X naught. And what we are going to assume is that heating is starting there. And consequently, this here is equal to T wall. And how you go about obtaining that, uh, that would depend, but you'd have to have some form of heat flux. Uh, and if you want to maintain an isothermal wall temperature at Tw, uh, you would probably have to vary the amount of heat flux as a function of position along the plate. Uh, it would not be a constant Q. It, it would have to vary. But anyways, you'd have to have some sort of regulation process, a controller or something like that. But nonetheless, what we have is heat flux coming in, and that would maintain the wall temperature at Tw. Uh, but what we're interested here in this segment is looking at what happens and how the boundary layers grow. So I said boundary layers. We do have two. And so I'll begin by drawing the hydrodynamic. And so I'm assuming that we're dealing with a laminar boundary layer. And the thickness, we've defined that as being delta. Now, with the thermal boundary layer, it is going to begin at the point where we have heating starting. And consequently, its growth is going to be slightly different. And we don't know exactly what it is yet. It depends upon the fluid that we're looking at. Uh, but the growth of that and the symbol for it is going to be delta T, denoting thermal boundary layer. So that is a, a case where we could have uh, a, a plate where we do not have heating at the beginning, but then it eventually starts. Now, if X naught was zero, well, then obviously the heating would be at the beginning, but the boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer may not grow at the same rate. And, and so they could grow at different rates. So just be aware of that. Now, quite often when we look at these types of flows, we put the temperature profile into a, uh, an expression that would be uh, non-dimensional. And we've seen this quite often as we've studied heat transfer. We just saw it in the Heisler charts when we were looking at uh, transient heat transfer, convective heat transfer. But what we do, we take T minus T wall divided by T free stream minus T wall. And T here would be uh, at a given uh, spatial location in the boundary layer. So that is one thing. Another one is our thermal boundary layer thickness. And delta, that is our uh, hydrodynamic or velocity boundary layer thickness, divided by delta T. Now, we haven't seen this yet, but we will. Uh, it is, can be expressed as being a relationship involving Prandtl number raised to some power n, and we haven't determined what that power is yet. And the Prandtl number, this is a number that is used quite often in heat transfer, uh, PR. It is nu over alpha being our thermal diffusivity. So it is the 
kinematic viscosity over thermal diffusivity, expanding these two. So another way of expressing it is Cp mu over k. But essentially what the Prandtl number is quantifying is the kinematic viscosity over thermal diffusion. So basically viscous diffusion over thermal diffusion. And so depending upon the fluid that you're looking at, uh, the Prandtl number will vary quite significantly. Uh, if you're looking at oils uh, or liquid metals, uh, they, they would be very, very different Prandtl numbers. We typically look at water and air, but we could look at many of these other uh, substances as well. And, and so if you're looking at liquid metal, uh, well, their thermal diffusion would be very, very high because high thermal conductivity, consequently the Prandtl number would be very, very low. If you're looking at an oil, the viscosity might be very high. So the numerator in that term could be high, and, and consequently you could have a, a very high Prandtl number. But those are different uh, Prandtl numbers that would depend upon the fluid that we're looking at. So that is a bit of a brief introduction to some aspects about the thermal boundary layer, and we'll look at it a little more closely when we start looking at some of the uh, solutions that come out for the laminar boundary layer. We'll look at the new salt number and the relationships. Um, the last thing we're going to do in this lecture, we'll look at it in the next segment, is the relationship between heat transfer and, and skin friction. And, and there's an analogy that, that works really quite nice. And, and it's one that enables us to get a lot of heat transfer data using fluid friction measurements. And many of those have been collected. So we'll be talking about that in the last segment. Okay, the last thing that we're going to look at in this introductory lecture to convective heat transfer is going to be a, an analogy between heat transfer and fluid friction. So uh, this analogy, it turns out, it will apply to flat plate flows, be it uh, laminar or turbulent, so it is quite flexible in that regard. Okay, and, and so what this analogy is going to enable us to do, it's going to enable us to take uh, friction measurements on flat plate flows, so frictional drag, and relate it directly to the convective heat transfer coefficient h, which is what we're after here. So let's begin by taking a look at uh, wall friction or, or shear stress along a flat plate uh, boundary layer flow. And the friction coefficient, or the uh, shear stress, I should say, along the wall is related to the dynamic viscosity and the gradient of velocity in the y direction. And this can be determined in a number of different ways. Uh, but uh, typically, the most common ways are either indirectly measuring the velocity profile and then taking the derivative and, and you get the wall shear stress. And another method is actually measuring the drag force. And with MEM sensors, uh, that, that's becoming more and more possible. Uh, but but th this can be measured by... And in measuring the velocity profile, what uh, is quite commonly used is a pedostatic tube called the Preston tube, which is basically a squashed pedostatic tube that enables you to go right along the wall. And so the probe body itself would come up and away from the wall. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I can draw that in 3D. I probably can't, but let's give it a try. So you would have something like this where your probe body is coming up and then eventually it goes away from the wall 
And so your flow is coming in this direction here. Uh, and, and that would enable you to get the velocity right very close to the wall. You could also do that with uh, different optical techniques as well, although it'd be difficult to get seeds uh, particles uh, very close if you're using laser Doppler velocimetry, for example. Uh, but anyways, it would involve some indirect measure uh, where we get the velocity profile. A second technique is to directly physically measure the drag or the, the friction on the wall. So conceptually what this might look like is you may have a section of the wall removed where you have some element. Now th this is going to be a very, very small element. I've drawn it as being a little bit larger. Uh, but with MEM sensors, uh, microelectromechanical systems, we can make these very, very small now. Uh, and, and so you would have that above, you have your shear, so you have your velocity profile coming over. You'd want to ensure that the gap here is very, very small so that you don't disturb the flow. Uh, but out here you would have your velocity coming along. And by measuring then a drag force or the restoring force on this little element, that would be area A. By measuring that, we can say drag is then going to be the wall shear stress multiplied by that area A. And from that, we would then be able to determine what the wall shear stress would be. So we'd measure that, we would know that, we would get the wall shear stress. And once you have the wall shear stress, uh, if we look back here, and that is what we're after here, uh, once you have the wall shear stress, you can then determine the friction coefficient. And so the friction coefficient, and I'm going to put it here as being a function of location on the plate. If we divide the friction coefficient by 2, we have our wall shear stress divided by the dynamic pressure, but I've divided by 2, so it's going to be rho u infinity squared. And for Blasius's uh, boundary layer solution, uh, he got 0.664 for the skin friction times Reynolds number to the minus one half. I've divided by two, so that turns out to be 0 0.332 Reynolds number x to the minus one half. And it'll become apparent in a moment why I'm writing this out. So that is for the Blasius solution. Uh, for a laminar boundary layer. And what we're going to see in the next few lectures is for the laminar boundary layer, uh, we'll find that the uh, you can determine the new salt number. And the new salt number for the laminar boundary layer is 0 0.332 parental number to the one third, Reynolds number to the one half. And you'll see we're starting to look kind of similar. We have the 0 0.332 there. That, that's interesting. And th this would also be uh, basically Blasius and energy using the energy equation temperature profile. You can get the convective heat transfer coefficient from that like we've seen in this lecture. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to divide both sides of that by Prandtl Reynolds number. So if we go new salt number X divided by Prandtl Reynolds number X. And here, oops, sorry. That's not one half, that was one third. Okay, so what we have here is this is going to result in parental number to the two-thirds in the denominator. And I'm going to take that over to the left-hand side of the equation. And with that, we get new salt number x Okay, so I brought that over to the left-hand side. And then the other thing that we have here, we have Reynolds number to the one half divided by Reynolds number, that results in being Reynolds number to the minus one half. 
And so what we end up with on the right hand side And what is interesting about this is this here and this, well, actually that, are the same. And, and that is where the analogy starts to come from. And it turns out that this applies for turbulent flow as well. But uh, what can we do with that? Well, let, let's take it a little further. And so what we're going to do, we're going to play with this term over here. And we're going to expand everything out. So expanding that term out, we have the new salt number. We have new salt, we have Prantl and Reynolds in the denominator, so I'm going to invert them. That is the Prandtl number and then the Reynolds number. So with this here, we can cancel some things. K goes with K, mu goes with mu. We have an X and an X. And what we're left with, I think I've canceled everything out that I needed to. We're left with the convective heat transfer coefficient divided by rho C sub P U infinity. And that I forgot something. I forgot the parental number to the two thirds. So let me pull that in. This should have been multiplied by parental number to the two thirds. So we will keep it here. And then on the right hand side, we had 0 0.332 REX to the minus one half. So what we can do, we're going to introduce a new non-dimensional number and that is referred to as being the Stanton number and that is right here. And it is given the symbol STX. Do not confuse it with the Struhl number. Uh, we always have different numbers with hopefully different uh, letters, but in this case, it looks like they're the same. Anyways, okay, so what do we get here? We get STX. So that is the definition of the Stanton number. And then plugging it into the above relationship, what we get is Stanton number parental number to the two-thirds is related to the local skin friction coefficient divided by two. So what's so significant about that? Well, and let's see, before I get into that, I should say that this is restricted over a range of parental number. Uh, some textbooks say 60, but essentially 0 0.6 up to about 50 or 60. Uh, what's significant about this is it applies for both laminar and turbulent. And, and this is referred to as being the Colburn analogy. And a fellow named Colburn came up with this, I think it was in 1933. And it applies for laminar and turbulent flow over a plate. And so what is nice about this is that there already is a great deal of data characterizing the skin friction coefficient over flat plate uh, boundary layer flows, laminar or turbulent. And so all of that data can be used in this relationship to determine the Stanton number. And from the Stanton number, we get the convective heat transfer coefficient. So that's the beauty of this. Uh, it opens up uh, a lot of data you know, that we can use for the heat transfer calculations. And so, anyways, that is the Colburn analogy, the Stanton number, uh, and we will use it from time to time and coming up with relationships that we will be using to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient. So that concludes this introduction, what we'll be doing in the next lecture. Uh, we're going to start going into further detail with uh, laminar boundary layer relationships and, and then we'll start looking at different empirical relationships for determining the convective heat transfer coefficient.
In the last lecture, what we did is we took a look at the introduction to convection to begin with, and then we looked at the concept of the boundary layer, both laminar and turbulent. Uh, what we're going to do in this lecture, we're going to focus in a little bit more on the equations that enable us to determine the convective heat transfer, uh, and we'll be looking at both the laminar as well as the turbulent boundary layer. So in this segment, we're going to begin with the laminar boundary layer. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to consider the laminar boundary layer with an isothermal plate. So the entire plate is at one fixed temperature that is different from that of the free stream. And in looking at this, uh, th this is one that there is a solution. It's not an analytic solution, it's a numerical solution. It's one, uh, the velocity profile uh, was solved by Blasius, I think it was in 1908. And if you recall, he was a student of Ludwig Prantl. Uh, and then later on, it was coupled with the energy equation to give the temperature profile, which provided then the convective heat transfer coefficient and the new salt numbers. That's what we're going to look at in this segment. Okay. <clears throat> so Blasius was able to solve, he, he did this numerically, hand integration. Uh, he used the momentum and the continuity equation. So momentum is Navier-Stokes equation uh, that has been reduced for boundary layer flow. So it makes it a little bit easier. He was able to solve it using uh, what we call a similarity solution. And so he converted the partial differential equation into a nonlinear differential equation, ordinary differential equation, and then he integrated that by hand. But when you get that solution for the velocity profile, you can then take it with the energy equation and come up with the temperature profile uh, above the wall. So we have our flow, um, we have it coming in this direction, and if you recall, we said that our temperature profile, if the wall was heated, might be something like this. And we're going from temperature of the wall would be here. And then out here would be T infinity. And this is T of Y. That's what we're after in order to get the convective heat transfer coefficient. I am not going to go through that solution procedure. You can look in many different textbooks and find it, uh, be it a fluid mechanics book or... Uh, some heat transfer books have it as well. Uh, but what we're going to do, we're going to move into taking this temperature profile and uh, determining the convective heat transfer coefficient from it, which is what we are interested in in heat transfer. So if you recall for the boundary layer, we said in an earlier uh, segment, that was actually in the last lecture, we did basically a coupling of Newton's law with Fourier's law, and we applied Fourier's law in the fluid right at the wall. And this approximation is made assuming that there is no slip or no fluid velocity right along the wall, which is true because there would be no velocity in a boundary layer right at the wall. And so we can use Fourier's law right at the wall, and then we equate that with Newton's law of cooling. And so we know the temperature profile from the Blasius solution coupled with the energy equation. We can take the derivative, and everything else in this equation is known. It's an isothermal plate. We know the free stream. We know the thermal conductivity of the fluid above the plate. And so with that, we can determine the convective heat transfer coefficient H. And writing out the equation, it would be expressed this way. Okay, so that's the equation that we can use to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient in the laminar boundary layer. And so when you take the solution with Blasius's solution coupled with the energy equation, uh, this gives the following. Okay, so we get this expression here, and notice what we're looking at is H of X. So what this is, this is the convective heat transfer coefficient at some position from the leading edge of the plate. So X would be from here. So what we're looking at would be H at X. That's the convective heat transfer coefficient at this little element. Uh, let's see, I should draw that being X. Let me redo that. 
So that would be location x, and that's where we're evaluating h of x. So h of x is changing along the length of the plate, and we'll look at how to compute the average in a moment. But knowing this, we can then go ahead and with the definition of new salt number, Remember, new salt number is a convective heat transfer coefficient times some characteristic length scale divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid above the wall. And, and the characteristic length scale in this case is going to be distance from the leading edge. And so with that, we can write out that the new salt number for the laminar boundary layer is as follows. And notice here, I have Reynolds number x. That denotes that the Reynolds number is evaluated at that x location. And so this equation here, th this is valid for a laminar boundary layer. And there is a restriction on the parental number. So 0.6, that would be something like error up to 50. That's the range of the parental number. So what we're going to do with this, this is giving us the new salt number at a given location along our plate. What we're interested in, and typically in engineering calculations, we're usually interested in average heat transfer from a surface. So let's take a look at how to compute the average heat transfer from the plate. So if we're looking for that, we can evaluate it using an integral. And so plugging in the value that we have for the convective heat transfer coefficient. Okay, now this is a peculiarity or something that's interesting with the laminar boundary layer. We have an integral of x to the minus one half and if you look at the process of integrating that, we have x to the minus one half. When we integrate that, we're going to get two x to the one half. And when we sub in the limits of integration, that is going to be two L to the one half. So the overall length. And with that, that essentially enables us to take uh, the L to the one half and pull it into this term here. And if you look at that, that is nothing else but the Reynolds number. And, and so it's kind of a convenient little thing that occurs. So let's take a look at the average or mean. And sometimes it is expressed as being H over bar. I did HM there, but sometimes you'll see it with H over bar. Um, but with that, and the two goes to the front. So we obtain that uh, for the average convective heat transfer coefficient over the plate of length L. And looking back at the expression that we had uh, for the convective heat transfer coefficient itself, we have basically this. What that tells us is the average convective heat transfer coefficient for the laminar boundary layer is equal to two times the convective heat transfer coefficient at the end of the plate. And, and so when I say end of the plate, remember that we have a plate like this. X is starting here. And then this would be the end of the plate, and that would be X equals L. So that would be the length of the plate. But the average convective heat transfer coefficient is nothing more than two times the value of the convective heat transfer coefficient at the end of the plate. So that's kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of an easy thing to remember. Remember, it only applies for the laminar boundary layer with an isothermal plate. Uh, but we can then write an expression for the new salt number. And I'll put an over bar here to denote average. And finally, uh, Reynolds number at L, that is nothing more than the Reynolds number evaluated with the length scale being the length of the plate. Mu is the viscosity of the fluid. Now, you'll notice in here, uh, in these equations, we have a number of things going on. We have the parental number, we have the Reynolds number. 
we have our thermal conductivity. Within the Reynolds number, we know that we have the density and we have our viscosity. And within parental number, we have C sub P. Again, we have viscosity and we have thermal conductivity. So the question arises, at what temperature do we evaluate the properties within these equations? And th this is always something uh, with fluid mechanics, depending upon the equations, sometimes they'll evaluate properties at different temperatures. But, but for these equations, uh, what we do is we evaluate the properties at a temperature that we call the film temperature. So what are we talking about for the film temperature? What that is, it's nothing more than the wall temperature. Remember, we're talking about an isothermal wall plus the free stream temperature divided by two. It's just the average between those two temperatures. And this is going to have an impact on the following properties. Uh, and, and sometimes you'll denote it with K with a little F, and that denotes film properties ev evaluated at the film temperature. So we have there for the thermal conductivity of the fluid over the plate, the viscosity with the little f denoting the f for film. Means that it's evaluated at the film temperature. And finally for the density, same thing. And you can combine, oops, not all of them. you combine these two and you go to the kinematic viscosity instead of the dynamic and so you might see this and that is essentially just the ratio of mu over rho okay so you will sometimes see that uh, sometimes you'll also see REX with a little f or REL with a little f the little f is denoting film temperature, meaning that the properties are evaluated at the film temperature. So that is how we are able to compute the heat transfer coefficient as well as the new salt number for a flat plate, uh, isothermal flat plate with a laminar boundary layer. <laughs>
uh, to rewrite this and express the temperature difference between the wall and the free stream as a function of x. Okay, so all I've done there is I've plugged in the value that we had for the new salt number above. Now what we're going to do, we're going to try to compute the average wall temperature. So the average wall temperature uh, would be the average difference between the wall and the free stream. Uh, because what I should have done is said out here, that is the free stream temperature. And that is far away from the plate where it has not been impacted by the plate. And in this case, T wall is a function of X. So let's look at the average wall temperature. And we're going to be doing a little bit of mathematical uh, manipulation here in order to get this expression. Okay, so we have that integral, and what I've done here is I've pulled x to the one-half out of the Reynolds number term. So we have x over x to the one-half, and uh, it'll kind of become apparent why I have done that in a moment. So let me integrate that and rewrite the expression. Okay, so after integrating, what we have... Uh, we get L to the three halves in the numerator. And what I've done is I've taken the L here and I've split it into two L's, L to the one half and L to the one half. And the reason why I've done that, I want to pull this L in here to form the Reynolds number. So let's rewrite that. And so I get that expression. And what I can do Looking back at the expression that we had for the new salt numbers, so let's go back here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this expression here, and I'm going to pull it into the equation that we have here, enabling us to rewrite it. And in the process, what I'm going to do essentially is isolating for this h value here. And you can go through the algebra as an exercise, but what you get out of this is the following. And so with that, what we can say is that the heat flux in the plate is the following. So the average temperature is related to the heat flux uh, and multiplied or divided, I should say, by 1.5 times h at x equals l. And so that is the expression that we get uh, from doing the calculation for a laminar boundary layer flat plate constant heat flux condition. So that's another expression that you might use if you have constant heat flux. Uh, there is another expression that, uh, if you recall when we looked at the solution with Blasius and the energy equation, uh, it was limited over Prandtl number from 0.6 to, I think it was 50. There is another expression that exists that is based on empirical data, so based on experiments, but gives us a wider range of Prandtl numbers. So let's take a look at that now. And so again, this is still laminar flow, but it is wide range Prandtl number, or wide range of Prandtl number. And it is empirical. So what that means, I'll talk about that in the next segment, but that means that they've done experiments. And they would have used the original functional fit from uh, the solution that Blasius came up with and the coupling Blasius with the energy equation. But the Prandtl number, the Prandtl number will vary depending upon the fluid uh, that we are looking at. So we can have Prandtl numbers that are very low and things like liquid metals would have very low Prandtl numbers. And typically in this course, we're going to be dealing with things like water and air. If we look at the Prandtl number for air, it's around 0.7. Prandtl number for water is about 7.0. I do realize that it's going to change as a function of temperature, but in the ballpark, it's something in around there. And then if you have oil, oil is going to have a much larger Prandtl number and it would be up on the order of maybe 2,000. 
And looking at the definition of parental number, remember we talked about this in an earlier lecture. Uh, it is, if we write out our uh, kinematic viscosity divided by the thermal diffusivity, it's essentially quantifying viscous diffusion over thermal diffusion. And so that is why, if we look at a liquid metal, liquid metals, they are going to be highly conductive. And consequently, K, uh, which is in the denominator, is going to be really, really large. And consequently, our Prandtl number is very, very small. Oil, on the other hand, the viscosity for oils tends to be quite high. And consequently, we can have very high Prandtl numbers. So that gives you a little bit of a feel for how the Prandtl numbers vary depending upon what liquid we're looking at. But with this expression, it's a wider range and it's for laminar boundary layers. I'll write it out. Okay, so that's an expression that you can use for the new salt number. Now, what we're finding uh, even here, we're relying on an empirical fit. So we're relying on experimental data to be able to give us a relationship for a laminar flow. And we haven't even started to talk about turbulent flow yet, which we will be in the next segment. So what we're starting to see is that the analysis capabilities for determining the connective heat transfer coefficient are really quite limited. And, and, and so with that, uh, what we'll be doing as we move into more complex shapes, we're really going to be moving into this area where we are doing empirical uh, functional fits of data. Now we use the theory in order to give us an idea as to what the functional relationship would look like, like we have here. But then there will be corrections that result due to the experimental data that is being collected. So that's where we're going in the next couple of segments. We're continuing looking at uh, convective heat transfer over flat plates, but we're moving into uh, the cases where we would have turbulent boundary layers. And that's what we'll be looking at in the next segment. <laughs> Okay, at the end of the last segment, we looked at solutions for the laminar boundary layer, and we found that in order to get the new salt number over a wide range of parental numbers, we needed to start to look at empirical or experimental data. So what I'm going to do in this segment is just introduce us to that, and that will then enable us to move onward into turbulent boundary layer flows. So we're looking at empirical force convection. Okay, so uh, what we've been starting to notice is that the analytical methods, such as the solution by Blasius, only gets us so far. And, and that only works for rather restrictive and, and limited uh, cases. And when we want to get to more practical or flows of, of engineering interest, we, we need to start to bring in experimental results. And, and that is the empirical... Uh, data that I'm referring to. And, and so when we're looking at these, uh, the empirical data could be in a number of different forms. We could have empirical formulas. And an example of that could be new salt numbers. So let's say it's new salt number based on some characteristic length scale diameter. Uh, a plus B Reynolds number to the N. We haven't looked at this one yet, but th this is convective heat transfer over a cylinder and it's referred to as being King's Law. And if we plot new salt number versus Reynolds number, we'll get a curve that would look something like this. And so what you would do is you collect experimental data and then fit that curve to the experimental data that you have collected. And I show scatter there because all experimental data is going to have noise in it and, and a little bit of uncertainty. So you can come up with empirical formulas like that. Uh, sometimes there are graphical charts. 
and you'll look up data that way. But in any event, what we try to do is we try to take experimental data and collapse it in terms of these non-dimensional numbers like new salt number and Reynolds number. And then when we're doing our curve fitting, what we're trying to do, we're trying to determine these constants A, B, and N. And, and that would then give us a relationship that would describe the curve that I've sketched in the middle of this Reynolds number, uh, new salt number plot. And sometimes what you'll do, you'll take the log of, of both sides of those equations, enabling you to determine the constants in a power law. Or you can also do numerical methods uh, to minimize uh, the, the, the difference between the data that you've collected and the curve that you're trying to fit. Uh, we won't be looking at that in the, this course, but that just gives you an idea as to where these relationships are coming from. Okay, so when we collect this experimental data and we're trying to collapse the data onto a curve, so you might wonder how do you know what the functional form of that curve would be? Well, there are a couple of different tools that we have. Experimentalists quite often use dimensional analysis. We're not going to talk about it in this course, but uh, if you want to see things, it's called Buckingham Pi. Uh, look at my course in Introductory Fluid Mechanics, and if you find the lecture on Buckingham Pi, uh, you'll be able to watch about dimensional analysis and learn a little bit more. Maybe you've already taken a course that has covered that. Uh, physical insight. So Ludwig Prantl, when he took the boundary layer, or derived the boundary layer equations, came up with them, uh, that was partially based on physical insight, partially based on uh, doing dimensional reasoning. But uh, that enabled Blasius then to come up and solve simplified forms of the Navier-Stokes equations that we call the boundary layer equations. Uh, and then also sometimes what people will do, they come up with very simple analytical models. And these can sometimes be quite powerful uh, because they will give us an indication as to what the functional relationships might be between the variables that we're interested in. So what we're going to do uh, with this, we're going to be looking at uh, different uh, relationships uh, for heat transfer over and across a number of different types of objects and bodies and plates. So what we're going to be looking at is So this is where we're going in the next few segments and the next couple of lectures. We're looking at flow over flat plates and We'll now be moving into looking at turbulent boundary layers. Then we're going to look at the flow uh, that we call external flow over things such as cylinders and spheres. And then we're going to be looking at tube banks. And, and tube banks are quite uh, commonly found in cross-flow heat exchangers. And, and consequently, that is the interest that we have within this course. So those are the types of flows that we're going to be looking at. We refer to them as being forced convection external flows. Uh, and then after we go through all of that, we'll be moving into internal flow, which would be pipe flow, but that will be uh, in later lectures. So in the next couple of lectures, these are the things that we're going to be focusing on, and we'll be using a lot of experimental data. And, and consequently, what you're going to be finding are a lot of relationships that you may not really understand where they're coming from, but don't worry. They, they've come from experiments. The main thing is to know how to apply them. And the other thing that I should say, and I'll say it again later on in the course, when you're applying these relationships, make sure you understand how the properties have been evaluated. Uh, I mentioned the film temperature, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you evaluate properties at other temperatures. So just be very, very careful to read the paragraphs above and below the equations that you're going to use to ensure that you're applying them in the right way. Uh, but anyway, so that's where we're going in the next segment. We'll then move into looking at uh, expressions for the turbulent boundary layer. Okay, in this segment what we're going to do, we're going to continue looking at the flat plate. Uh, however, what we're going to be doing is looking at that for a turbulent boundary layer.
So if you recall from the end of the last lecture, we talked about a fluid friction analogy or the coal burn analogy. That is the best thing to use if you're trying to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient for a turbulent boundary layer over a flat plate. And if you recall, the relationship looks something like this. And what it enabled us to do was rely on a wealth of information uh, that currently exists in terms of the friction coefficient for flat plate uh, turbulent boundary layer flows. Okay, so what we're going to do, uh, let's take a look at using the coal burn analogy for a turbulent boundary layer on a flat plate, and this will be the case of an isothermal flat plate. Now, if for the turbulent boundary layer, we have no analytical solution for the velocity profile. The only thing we have are uh, basically curve fits for different types of boundary layer flows, turbulent boundary layer flows. You can take a look at my fluid mechanics uh, course. I do have some information on how to try to determine the velocity profile for the turbulent boundary layer, but we run into what is called the closure problem uh, with turbulence, and it, it has to do uh, with uh, terms that arise in the Navier-Stokes equations that we are not able to solve for the velocity profile when we have turbulence. And, and so this is an approximation that is sometimes used. Uh, it's a one-seventh power law, and you can take that and, and you can couple it with a momentum, integral momentum analysis, and use it to predict the boundary layer thickness. And there are a number of different ways that you can do this. In my fluid mechanic course, I do this using a, a functional fit that von Kerman came up with. And I can't remember if it was a, a square or a cubic. But anyways, if, if you look there, I, I go through a process of coming up with the boundary layer thickness. But doing a similar sort of thing, but using the 1 7th power law, uh, delta can be approximated to be. And remember, this is a case where what we're assuming here is that we have a turbulent boundary layer starting right from the beginning. So in order to do that, you would have to trip the boundary layers. Maybe you put uh, sandpaper or a wire on the front. That would be X measured from that location there. So that gives us an expression for the boundary layer thickness, uh, but what we're, we're really after here, we want to know the convective heat transfer coefficient. And, and so for that, uh, what you do is you go and you use Colburn analogy and you find relationships that uh, have been collected experimentally uh, that characterize the friction coefficient. And so uh, I'm just going to put one here and, and we'll work with that with the cold burn analogy. But here is one for a skin friction coefficient. And this is for a turbulent boundary layer. And so CFX, that denotes that it's the friction coefficient at a spatial location from the leading edge. And we have a minus one fifth. And, and so you can see uh, they would use uh, things, we, we have similar sort of functional form that we had here. Uh, but anyways, that, that is experimental data. And this particular data set, it turns out that it applies from the transition point up to a Reynolds number of 10 to the 8. So if you recall the boundary layer, it's going to begin with the laminar boundary layer. We go through transition and then it becomes turbulent. And the turbulent boundary layer grows at a uh, faster rate than the laminar boundary layer. So this is our laminar boundary layer, turbulent boundary layer. And in this case, what we're saying is that it only applies from the transitional. For a flat plate, typically we use 5 times 10 to the 5. Uh, for being the critical Reynolds number where we go through the transition process from laminar to turbulent. But anyways, that, that's not critically important. What we're going to do here, though, we're going to take this skin friction coefficient and we're going to plug it into the cold burn analogy and we're trying to determine the new salt numbers. So let's take a look at that. So writing out the cold burn analogy, the, this is an expression that we uh, had at the end of the last lecture. And this was equal to, it was equal to CFX divided by 2. 
So taking our friction coefficient and dividing by 2, we get 0 0.0296. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these terms here and this term and bring them over to this side of the equation. And what we then obtain is we get a new salt number that looks like this. So that would then be an expression that we could use to determine heat transfer when we have a turbulent boundary layer and an isothermal plate. And obviously isothermal, the plate's going to be higher than the fluid temperature or lower, uh, but we're going to have heat transfer. So there's some uh, temperature differential driving the convective heat transfer process. So that is an example of what you would do if, if you want to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient for a turbulent boundary layer. You basically uh, use cold burn analogy and you use the friction coefficient values, plug it into cold burn analogy, and then you obtain your expression. Uh, you could do it experimentally as well and do curve fit, but why do it if you can easily get the values of CFX? So that is the boundary layer. What we're going to be doing in the next lecture uh, is we're going to be looking at external flows on bluff bodies, so cylinders, spheres, things like that. And then after that, uh, we'll be looking at two bundles, so multiple cylinders arranged in various patterns. So that, that's where we're going for external force convection flows. All right, in the last lecture, what we did is we took a look at the flat plate boundary layer. And so we're looking at external flows, force convection. And what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to external flows over bluff bodies. And we're going to begin by looking at flow across cylinders. So uh, looking at force convection across cylinders, uh, this is important uh, to engineers for a number of different reasons. One of the most common applications within heat exchangers, uh, cross-flow heat exchangers, are where you would have a tube bundle and flow coming across multiple cylinders, which we'll be taking a look at uh, in a later lecture. Uh, but essentially what we have are a number of cylinders, so the flow over cylinders is of interest there. Uh, another place could be mass flow sensors inside of automobiles for measuring the mass flow rate of air coming in. And a third application could be in the measurement of velocity uh, for either experimental or HVAC applications, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And these are quite often referred to as being hot wire anemometry or hot wire anemometers. And so if you're looking at HVAC applications, you're measuring the velocity at a uh, low frequency. And if you're doing experiments, uh, you could be uh, measuring it at a high frequency. And so the difference would be uh, your cylinder would be much smaller uh, in the case of an experiment. So anyway, those are three different applications of areas where we would have an interest in convective heat transfer over a cylinder. So let's begin by taking a look at what the flow field itself looks like. And so what we're going to do here, we're going to take a look at uh, flow visualization. And there you can see on the top normal speed, on the bottom I'm going to slow it down. So that becomes slow motion. And you can see the red points there denote separation points. That's where the boundary layer is separating. And then downstream of there on this uh, cylinder, we have what we refer to as being a very broad wake with a strong recirculation zone. And so this has a fairly large implication onto the convective heat transfer uh, that will be taking place around the cylinder because we only have attached flow on the front of the cylinder. And, and then once we hit the separation point, we, we have what we call separated flow, uh, as you can see with the strong recirculation zones that exist. And, and so what we're going to do, let, let's begin by taking a look at what the flow field itself looks like on a cylinder, and then that will help us understand some of the physics in terms of the heat transfer.
Okay, and so what I've drawn here is the flow over a cylinder up until a certain point. Uh, and, and what we have to begin with, let's see, we, we have the free stream out here on the left. And through Bernoulli's equation, we know that the total pressure is going to equal the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure, which is one half rho u infinity squared. And what I've drawn on the cylinder, I've drawn pressure taps at locations 1, 2, and 3. And these are static pressure taps. So they're measuring the static pressure in the boundary layer coming over the cylinder. And if we were to have an inviscid flow, which no flow would ever be that way, but if we had a flow without viscosity, what we would find is that the velocity on the top of the cylinder would equal 2 times u times the free stream, twice the free stream. Now in reality what happens is the boundary layer forms and, and the velocity does not behave in that way as we'll see momentarily. Uh, but with this, what we could do uh, with these static pressure taps, we can then say pressure wall at 1, so that would be static pressure wall at location 1 is the total pressure, we calculated the total pressure out here, minus 1 half rho u1 squared. Now I've drawn this right at the front and that would be a, oops, where did my cylinder go? There we go. Uh, that would be what we call a stagnation point and so really the velocity there would be zero. Uh, but anyways, let's just say it's u1 for now. Uh, P wall location 2, again would be P naught minus 1 half rho u2 squared. And then P wall at uh, location 3, again the total pressure, minus 1 half rho u3 squared. So what's happening here, uh, the velocity is going from a very low velocity at the front and the flow is accelerating as it comes around the cylinder. And consequently what is happening is the static pressure is going lower and lower. And that, that's a region that we refer to as being a favorable pressure gradient because as you're flowing along, the pressure is getting lower and lower. So the pressure is essentially uh, pushing the fluid and, and causing it to accelerate. So if we were to look at the velocity at these different locations, we would have U1 is equal to zero because that was what we call a stagnation point. And then U2 is greater than U1, obviously, because the flow is starting to move and accelerate around. And then U3 is greater than U2. And this represents the flow accelerating around the body. But from the flow visualization that we just saw, we, we saw a case where we have this broad wake and, and then a very large recirculation zone. And that does play a very big impact or part in what is happening with the flow around the cylinders. So uh, let's take a look at what is going on with the pressure distribution around a cylinder. And so bear with me, I'm going to sketch out the pressure distribution here. It won't be the most accurate thing, but anyways, it'll give us an idea as to what is happening. Okay, uh, so what we have, that's my best effort of being able to show the pressure distribution, not at all pretty. But anyways, what's going on? Uh, first of all, we have the inviscid curve. Now, inviscid, that, that's one that assumes that there is no separation on the cylinder. You can calculate this using potential flow theory, and, and that would be something that you would take in a fluid mechanics course. Uh, but basically a model the cylinder as a doublet with a free stream and, and with that you can then come up with the uh, shape and the pressure distribution around a cylinder and what we find from that is we have a functional form for the pressure distribution. In reality however what is happening if we look at our cylinder the flow comes along the stagnation point is at the front everything is going good but 
it will depend upon the nature of the boundary layer. So if the boundary layer on the, on the uh, cylinder as the flow is coming up and around is laminar, we get here, there will be a separation point if it's laminar, and if it's turbulent, the separation point will be further delayed on the back side of the cylinder. And that's why these two pressure distributions look different. And, and what we can see is that the turbulent boundary layer has a very different pressure distribution from, uh, that says lamina, that should be laminar. Uh, we should have the R in there, the laminar boundary layer. So uh, just by looking at the pressure distributions alone, we know that there's something different going on. Uh, let's take a quick look uh, at a schematic in terms of what this might look like. So if we have the laminar boundary layer, let me just sketch a cylinder here. So this would be the case of a laminar boundary layer. And for the laminar boundary layer, the separation point is at around theta equals 82 degrees. So that's typically where you will find the separation point with the cylinder if you have a laminar boundary layer forming. So we have our stagnation point right here. And then as the flow is moving up and around, we have a boundary layer forming. And if that boundary layer is laminar, separation will occur at about 82 degrees and it is symmetric. So we would have a separation point at either of those locations. And what the separation point means is that the boundary layer is lifting off of the body. And, and so from the flow viz, you could see we had kind of uh, the, the structures coming off. And then in the downstream, we had large scale vertical structures. And they call that the Von Karman Vortex Street. But essentially, it's a broad wake in the downstream. And the implications to heat transfer is this region in the downstream is being impacted by the fact that you have all of this recirculating flow. So this here is a separation point. And if we were to look at the drag coefficient, drag coefficient for a cylinder with a laminar boundary layer is around 1.2. Now it's going to depend upon the Reynolds number. You've got to be careful because a very, very low Reynolds number would be what we call creeping flow and, and it would be a very different drag coefficient. Uh, but that would be, I don't know, I'm guessing a couple thousand uh, up to, I, I don't know what the transition, oh, here we have critical Reynolds number, 3 times 10 to the 5, so I'll get into that in a moment. Now, well, let's draw the cylinder again, and what I'm going to do here is this case, we're going to assume that we have a different Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number here would be where we have a turbulent boundary layer. So this could occur in a number of different ways, obviously if the Reynolds number was higher. You can also sometimes trip the boundary layer uh, on a cylinder. What you do is you either put a wire or sandpaper at the front and that can cause the boundary layer to transition. But we would have our stagnation point. The boundary layer is forming around here, but let's say it then goes through transition, it becomes turbulent. When it goes to turbulent, what happens is the separation point, the flow is actually able to make it around the top of the cylinder. Here it is not. It, it separates before it gets to the top. But for the turbulent boundary layer, it's actually able to make it around the top of the cylinder. It's coming around to the back side. And at about 120 degrees, that's where we find separation for the turbulent boundary layer. So theta approximately 120 degrees. And with that, consequently, we have a much narrower wake. And, and that then consequently has implications onto the convective heat transfer on a cylinder. And so here, CD uh, 0 0.3 would be an approximation. This is why golf balls are dimpled. Golf balls are dimpled in order to cause the boundary layer to transition. And through the transitioning process, the drag coefficient goes down and golf balls fly much further than if you only had a laminar boundary layer forming on the golf ball. So that is the purpose of the dimples. They cause the boundary layer to transition. Okay, so where does that transition take place? The critical Reynolds number for a cylinder 
is about 3 times 10 to the 5. And so that would be Reynolds number based on, that would be Reynolds number based on diameter, I would assume. Yeah, it must be. Okay, so 3 times 10 to the 5, and that is where we go through the transition process, and then your separation point moves further downstream. You have very different heat transfer characteristics. So uh, that has an impact on convective heat transfer, and obviously that means that we need relationships that will then be a function of Reynolds number, and that's what we'll be seeing in a later segment of this lecture. In the last segment, we took a look at the flow around a cylinder and convective heat transfer, and we found that uh, the separation point varied depending if we had a laminar or a turbulent boundary layer. So what we're going to do in this segment is we're going to take a closer look at what is happening with the boundary layer. So with the boundary layer on the cylinder, I'll draw Y normal to the wall. So th this is looking at a section of wall, assuming that it's uh, normal to the cylinder itself. So let's see here. Uh, let me sketch out. If this is the cylinder, what we're doing is we're zooming in on a section and Y would be normal to the surface of the cylinder. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. And in this region of the cylinder, uh, here is our stagnation point, but in the upstream region here, what's happening is we have what we call a favorable pressure gradient. And so the boundary layer may look something like this. It's going to vary depending if it's laminar or turbulent, but let's assume here it's laminar. Uh, U infinity is the free stream velocity far away, so U infinity here. Now I should be careful because U infinity is going to change depending upon where you are. Uh, that, that would be U external, I guess, because what we had done originally is we said U infinity was up here, uh, but the velocity outside is going to change and it's going to be a function of theta or angle as you go around the cylinder. So remember theta was our angle here. So this would be the case of what we would call a favorable pressure gradient. And what is going on here is we have a situation where dp by dx, where what I've done is I've defined x as being parallel to the uh, surface of the cylinder, it is less than zero. So the flow is going from a region where the pressure is getting lower and lower and lower, and consequently the flow is accelerating as it's going. And so that is easy for the flow to navigate. Now, if we go further along, we'll get to a region. We'll call this region one. This here would be region two. And again, I'm going to draw a section of the wall, the normal. Now, we're going to get to a location where dp by dx is equal to zero. And x is the direction here. I should have drawn x there. And our boundary layer is going to look a little bit different. It might start to look something like this. And then that would be U external. I should have written that as being external. And so that's the case where we have no change in the pressure as the flow is going along. So what's going to happen here is the fluid will still have inertia, so it'll continue to move. Uh, and then you're going to eventually get to a location, we'll call this region three, where we have what we would call a critical adverse pressure gradient. And so looking again at what's going along along the wall or what's happening, why it would be normal, our velocity profile may start to look something like this. And this would be dp by dx greater than zero, but this is what we would call a critical adverse pressure gradient. And the reason why we call it critical is because what has happened here is the velocity right at the wall is, has gone to zero. 
So, well, we know that we always have the no-slip condition, but I guess that would be at a point above the wall. Uh, it really comes down to the gradient of the velocity. Uh, but what, what is happening is our fluid right along the wall is losing the ability to overcome the pressure gradient. And if we go a little bit further downstream, what we'll find is a bit further downstream, we have a scenario like this and we actually have backflow along the wall. And when you get that backflow, that is when you have a separated boundary layer. And you can see kind of it in the flow viz in the, the first segment. Uh, you, you can see what looked like the boundary layer lifting off the wall. And that is when this is taking place. And so that would be separated flow. Okay, and so what we said is that that separation point is going to vary whether or not we have a laminar, and I think I said 82 degrees, and then for turbulent I said 120 degrees. That would be the separation point. And, and it would vary. If it was a laminar boundary layer, it's 82 degrees, and if it's turbulent, it's 120. Why is there the difference? Well, the reason is it, it has to do with the mechanisms of the boundary layer itself, what is happening. Uh, in the turbulent boundary layer, we, we have very large-scale structures, and, and they provide energy to the flow, uh, and, and that helps energize the boundary layer. So let me just make a comment along those lines. So what is happening here is the laminar boundary layer has less energy or inertia, I guess you could say, than the turbulent boundary layer. Turbulent, we have these large scale structures and they are able to overcome the adverse pressure gradient more than the laminar boundary layer. And, and so the, the fluid is moving into a region of increasing and increasing pressure. Uh, if there's turbulence, it can overcome that more, and that's why we have the separation point further downstream. So the implications of all of this in terms of heat transfer, and that's what we're interested in, uh, the, the main thing is that separation, a separation point, has an impact on the convective heat transfer coefficient on a cylinder. And so with that, you can expect that the heat transfer characteristics of the cylinder will be dependent upon the Reynolds number of the flow over the cylinder. And, and you can uh, compute convective heat transfer, well not compute, measure. Uh, you, you can measure it as a function of theta, but usually we don't really get into that level of detail. Usually what we do is we come up with a new salt number uh, for the entire cylinder, which gives us an average convective heat transfer coefficient for the cylinder. And that's what we'll be taking a look at in the next segment. I'll pr give you some equations or an equation that we use, and it enables us to get the convective heat transfer coefficient for flow over a cylinder. So uh, the main thing, though, boundary layer has an importance in terms of where the separation point is, and that has an impact on the convective heat transfer characteristics. <laughs> Okay, so we've been talking about the convective heat transfer over a cylinder, and we said that the boundary layer has implications, and consequently the Reynolds number has implications into the nature of the heat transfer. Uh, what I'm going to do now is provide an equation that enables us to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient from a cylinder. So this is the case where we have uh, heat transfer over a cylinder in cross flow, so the flow is coming along like this. And depending upon the boundary layer, we saw that the separation could either be up here or down here. But anyways, we, we have this flow field coming over a cylinder. And the equation that we have, we express it in terms of a new salt number with the length scale being the diameter of the cylinder. So that would be the diameter there and it's HD divided by KF, and I will define what F is. That's the film temperature, but I'll give you that later. Uh, you can express this in the following manner. 
what we have here, U infinity D over the uh, kinematic viscosity, and that again is evaluated at the film temperature. And so this term in brackets here, you'll recognize that as being the Reynolds number based on diameter. And we raise this to the power n, and then we multiply this by the Prandtl number, again evaluated at the film temperature, raised to the power one-third. So looking at this expression and this equation, uh, what we see is we have these coefficients c and n, and these would be obtained by conducting experiments. So what I'm going to do now is just write out the values, and we'll assume this here is RED evaluated at the film temperature. Okay, so that there is a table that you can use to determine the values of C and N that you then apply in the expression up here. And uh, the thing that you can note is that these coefficients are a function of the Reynolds number uh, coming over for the, the flow over the cylinder. Uh, here we have U infinity. A couple of other things to note, we have F, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, that denotes the film temperature. But the main thing is, just as the flow around the cylinder changes, the convective heat transfer characteristics will change. And, and like I said at the end of the last segment, you there are expressions that can enable you to determine the value of H as a function of position as you go around the cylinder. But just like for the flat plate, if you recall for the flat plate, we looked at a situation where we could determine H as a function of X. Usually we're more interested in the average heat transfer across the plate. So same thing pertains or applies to the cylinder. We're usually more interested in the average convective heat transfer. Uh, around the entire cylinder because that's what we use for engineering calculations. So uh, the last thing that I want to comment on here is just the case of the subscripts. So the subscripts that we see, there's infinity, and that usually refers to free stream conditions. And what free stream means is that you're so far upstream of the cylinder that the uh, presence of the cylinder, that the flow has not yet responded to it. So uh, as far as the flow is concerned, there is no cylinder there. That's free stream conditions. F, that denotes the film temperature. And we'll use this quite a bit in heat transfer. Oftentimes properties, we're told to evaluate them at the film temperature. The film temperature is just the wall temperature plus the free stream temperature divided by 2. And I just said it, W, that is the wall temperature. Okay, so those are some of the uh, different subscripts that we have. And, and you may see REDF, that pertains to the fact that you're evaluating Reynolds number based on diameter with properties evaluated at the film temperature. When we look at Reynolds number, uh, there are a couple of different ways that you can express it. Rho UD over mu. The properties where you have to worry about temperature then would be the density and the viscosity. Or we can also sometimes see it expressed in this manner like I did on the previous slide. There, the only thing that you need to do is that would have to be evaluated at the film temperature. That is our uh, kinematic versus the dynamic viscosity. So anyway, that is the equation that you can use to calculate the convective heat transfer on a cylinder. There are other equations that, that you can find in different textbooks, uh, but the one that I gave you is one that is quite often used, and it's quite simple and straightforward to apply. All right, the uh, last topic we're going to take a look at in this lecture is going to be that of uh, forced convection over non-circular cylinders. 
So what is a non-circular cylinder? Well, it, it's a cylindrical object that uh, it does not have round cross section. It can have other cross sections. So cross section could be a square. Uh, it could be a hexagon or a, a simple flat plate. Uh, it could be another example of a non-circular cylinder. And essentially what we mean that they're long objects that have cross section be it square, hexagon, flat plate, triangular, it could be another one. But really the, 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 what the, this turns out to be is for any of these different shapes, we again have a correlation for new salt number that we can determine the convective heat transfer coefficient from. And the equation that we use is identical to the one that we saw for the circular cylinder that we looked at earlier, where we had C Reynolds number based on diameter. and parental number evaluated at the film temperature raised to the power one-third. So what you'll notice here is we have C and uh, I forgot something, I forgot the N. We have the power, Reynolds number raised to the power of N. And so values of C and N, these depend on Reynolds number well, first of all, they depend on the shape and the Reynolds number. So depending upon the book that you're using, you'll find tables that will have non-circular cylinders and they'll have different values of CNN. Just be careful to make sure that you're pulling the values at the right Reynolds number. And then from that, you get C, you get N, and embedded within the new salt number, we have the convective heat transfer coefficient, because remember, HD over K, and if we're evaluating at the film temperature, it'd be that. So, what we're going to do now, now let's take a look at, at what some of the fluid mechanics looks like with these different objects. And so what we have here uh, are a set of videos starting with a circular cylinder, and there you can see the C and the N. For this one, the Reynolds number was around 550, so it's on the lower end. This is the flat plate, a very interesting flow dynamics downstream, massive separation, and consequently, uh, the C and N values vary from the front to the back. There we see a, a square, uh, a square rotated at 45 degrees. You get a very much different uh, flow pattern downstream, very strong oscillations. There we see a hex and the specific CNN for the hex, and then the hex rotated at a different angle. And, and you can see, again, a very different dynamic flow pattern downstream. So the main thing here, you know, just watching these uh, different flow visualizations, you can see the flow over these different bodies is very, very different. Uh, it depends upon orientation. We, we can see by examining, for instance, the cube, uh, when it's aligned one way or rotated, very, very different dynamics downstream and consequently the C and the N values will change, which is what people would determine from experiments. And again, the main thing, be careful about the Reynolds number that you're uh, applying these correlations to. Uh, if you're pulling values out of a book, make sure that the Reynolds numbers that you're using are the correct Reynolds numbers. So anyways, interesting flow viz. Uh, that is non-circular cylinders. The last shape that we're going to cover in this lecture are spheres. And again, there are different correlations that exist for spheres. I'm going to give you one. And this one applies for Reynolds number based on diameter that goes from 17 up to 70,000. So uh, again, be careful to make sure that it applies over the range. And for this one, it turns out that the properties are being evaluated at the film temperature. Uh, which we saw earlier, T film was T infinity plus T wall divided by 2. And so anyways, that's a correlation that exists for uh, a sphere. <clears throat> and you can see it's similar to what we saw earlier for the non-circular cylinders. Uh, but there are other correlations that exist. The, the main thing with any of this, uh, pull out the right uh, equation and make sure that you're evaluating properties at the right temperatures. Uh, because these are experimental correlations and <clears throat> we have to apply them 
using the same conditions that the people who have collected the data uh, did in the first place. So just be a little careful of that when you're solving problems in heat transfer. And with that, that will conclude this lecture where we're looking at uh, flow over external flow over bodies. What we'll be doing in the next segment or in the next lecture I should say is we're going to be looking at flow over multiple cylinders and we refer to these as two banks if you recall at the beginning we, we talked about uh, cross flow heat exchangers and so that's what we're going to be moving into uh, looking at the fluid mechanics and the convective heat transfer for those types of configurations. In this lecture, we're going to consider the topic of flow across two banks. And the area of flow across two banks is of engineering interest, mainly for the case of cross-flow heat exchangers. Now, we are going to be looking at heat exchangers more extensively later on in the course, but for now, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at the case of external flow over two bundles or two banks. So it turns out that when you're looking at two bundles or two banks, there are two different types of configurations that you can have. You can have a case where the uh, two bundles are aligned or you can have staggered. So let me just draw it out and that will help illustrate the difference between one and the other. So first of all, what we have drawn here is the case of aligned or inline two bundles. And the second case is that where we have a staggered arrangement. So let me draw that. Okay. <clears throat> so what we can see here, uh, some of my tubes don't look that good. Let me redraw that one. Anyways, these are all supposed to be of the same diameter. Uh, but what we can see uh, with the inline arrangement, all of the tubes are organized in a nice uh, pattern where they all line up with one another. Whereas in the case of the staggered two bundles, what we find is that we do have rows and columns, but uh, they are staggered with respect to one another. And that guy there is in the wrong spot. There we go. So uh, with this, we can have very different flow fields. Uh, before we look at the flow field, however, what I'm going to do, let me define a few things. On the uh, diagram I've shown SP and SN, that is basically the spacing in the normal and the parallel to the flow direction. So SN is spacing normal to flow direction and SP is spacing parallel. And in all of these diagrams, we're assuming that the diameter of the tube, each tube in the tube bundle is D. So D equals diameter. So with that, uh, we can have two bundles with either arrangement. And what we're now going to do uh, we're going to take a look at some flow visualization that helps us understand or appreciate the differences in the flow between either the aligned or inline or the staggered. So what we're going to begin with is the case where we have the aligned or inline. And so there you can see two cylinders. We're adding two more. And we continue to add more and more cylinders. But what you'll notice for the inline or aligned, we have kind of a center line jetting occurring between the tubes. And, and there we can see under different arrangements. And it's quite prominent and evident that we have this jetting going on between sets of tubes. 
And then when you zoom in, you can see there's strong recirculation zones between the tubes themselves. And consequently, that has a fairly large effect upon the convective heat transfer that occurs. Now, moving on, we can then look at what happens when you have staggered. So here we have one single tube that would be in a flow. And then we add two, very similar to what we saw before. But then we add one in the middle, and you can see it starts to distort the wake of the previous two tubes. There we add two more and then another on the uh, inside. And so the flow here is very, very different from that of when we had the inline or aligned two bundles. And when we zoom in, we can see that the flow is undergoing fairly significant changes in direction. And again, there are strong recirculation zones behind the tubes, but not as large themselves. It then becomes instructive and interesting to look at comparing uh, the aligned on the left and the staggered on the right. And that's where you can see more prominently the recirculation zone for the aligned between the tubes and smaller recirculation zones and significant changes in the flow direction uh, for when we have the staggered tube bundles. So that gives us uh, some appreciation for what is happening with the fluid mechanics in tube bundles and consequently we can expect that the convective heat transfer coefficient will be heavily dependent on the arrangement, the spacing, and the diameter. And, and so that's what we'll be looking at in the next couple of segments as we study two bundles and convective heat transfer into bundles. <laughs>
uh, are evaluated at the average between the inlet and the outlet to the two bundle. Okay, so with that, uh, let's take a look at what is going on within our tube bundle uh, because you might be wondering if you don't know the outlet temperature, for example, how are you going to evaluate the properties? So let's take a look at uh, geometrically what is going on when there is flow coming across our tube bundle. So what we're showing here is a tube bundle that is in the align configuration. And I'm just going to say there's some arbitrary number of rows in the streamwise direction. Uh, one thing that we do know here, you know, we'll say that we know the velocity coming in and we will call that U infinity. The other thing we're going to say is that the temperature of the flow coming in, the inlet flow to the two bundle is equal to T infinity or T free stream. The wall temperature, what we're going to do is we're going to make an assumption that the wall temperature of all of the tubes is the same temperature. Now that's a bit of an approximation. However, sometimes you may have something uh, where you have fluid going through a phase change, such as a condensing unit. And in that case, that would be a fair approximation to say that the fluid on the inside of the tube bundle uh, was all at the same temperature. So that's the wall temperature. Another thing that we will say, and we saw this in the previous segment, the spacing between the tubes themselves, going from center line to center line, uh, will be S subscript N, denoting normal direction to the flow. And the final thing is the diameter of each of our tubes is a little d. And, and then what we have on the back side of the tube bundle, where the flow is emerging, it will have gone through a change in temperature, either a higher or a low, lower temperature. Uh, and two more things that we will denote are capital N with the subscript N. That denotes the number of tubes in a row. And capital N is the total number of tubes in the bundle. Okay, so if you recall from the previous slide, what we said is that we want to evaluate the properties at this temperature, Ti plus T outer divided by two. Well, usually you're going to know the temperature coming in, but quite often you're not going to know the temperature of the fluid leaving the tube bundle. And consequently, what we need to do, we need to go through an iterative process. And so solving problems with two bundles can be a little bit on the laborious side because you have to go through a couple of iterations. But uh, the first place to start, if you do not know the temperature of the fluid leaving, what I would recommend is you begin by evaluating properties at the inlet temperature, if you know that. And then what you can do is you can go back to the correlation equation, assuming you know how to determine U max, which we will be doing in the next segment. You use this equation here to come up with an expression for H bar. So that will be the average convective heat transfer coefficient within our tube bundle. And then I'm going to give you an equation that will enable you to estimate the fluid temperature leaving the tube bundle. Okay, so using this equation here, what we can do, uh, we know most of the information on the right. Well, it's going to depend upon the problem, but what we're after, we're after this. And so we can determine the temperature of the fluid leaving. And then what we're going to do, we're going to use a thing called the log mean temperature difference. And we will see this when we look at heat exchangers later on in the course. But for now, I'll just give you the equation and we'll work with it. So that there is the log mean temperature difference. And what we then do is we use the LMTD, log mean temperature difference. Sometimes you'll see this expressed as LMTD, depending upon the book. Uh, but then what we do is we use that to determine the total heat transfer. And so the total heat transfer, I'm going to do heat transfer per unit length. 
is going to be using Newton's law of cooling, H bar, that is the average convective heat transfer coefficient for the tube bundle, all of the tubes, times the area. Now it's going to be area divided by the length because we're doing heat transfer per unit length. That's going to be the total number of tubes times pi times d, so the circumference, and then you'd normally multiply it by the length of the tube bundle itself, but we've brought that over to the left-hand side of the equation uh, to give us heat transfer per unit length, or watts per meter, and then we will have delta T L M for the log mean temperature difference. And, and so with these equations here, the first one is to estimate T naught, and once we have T naught or the outlet temperature, we can evaluate the LMTD, and then we can get the heat transfer. And so with this, what we can do is we can go through an iterative procedure, and we would then be able to uh, go through a step by step. And and once you determine a T naught, at this point you could go back and you could e reevaluate the properties again at the average of ti plus t naught divided by 2. And if you go through a couple of iterations, it should converge relatively quickly. Uh, other thing to notice in the denominator here, I'm evaluating these properties at the free stream temperature conditions, so the inlet temperature uh, that we have coming into our tube bundle. And that, this essentially is just mass flux. On the bottom here, that's m dot c sub p, uh, it's not quite m dot because I don't have the length in there. Uh, and then on the top here, that is basically Newton's law of cooling. We have uh, the area times h, so that's h bar times a. And, and that, that just relates to the way that this approximation is formulated. But anyways, those are the equations that you can use to solve for heat transfer in a tube bundle. Uh, another thing to note is there are different correlations. I've shown you this one here. Uh, but there are different correlations that exist, and you're free to use whatever you can find for this. Uh, uh, the, the one that we're looking at here does work, but there are restrictions. And also remember that if you have fewer than 20 tubes going in the flow direction, you have to apply a correction. And you get that from a table that would be in your heat transfer textbook. <laughs>segment we looked at a correlation for determining the convective heat transfer coefficient across a two bundle and you recall we had a Reynolds number that was evaluated based on the diameter and a thing called u max so what we're going to do in this segment is figure out how to determine that maximum velocity now, in determining Umax going through a tube bundle, it's going to depend upon the configuration that we have. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin with the simpler, and that is for the inline arrangement. So let's assume that we have this configuration here where we have three cylinders, inline arrangement. The spacing between tubes is SN in the direction normal to the flow. We have free stream coming from the left to the right. And so the free stream velocity is at U infinity. And if you go back and look at the flow visualization from the first segment of this lecture, you'll notice that uh, there is fairly significant jetting going on or, or accelerated flow between the tubes. And we had this region of high velocity in the middle there. That is what we are going to refer to as being U max for the inline configuration. So what we want to be able to do is this is where we have the lowest area. Oops, sorry about that. The lowest area and consequently that is where we will have the maximum velocity. So what we want to be able to do is evaluate the velocity at that plane, basically the point between the two cylinders. And so the way that we're going to go about evaluating U max for the inline configuration is we're going to rely on fluid mechanics and the continuity equation. 
So if you recall from your fluid mechanics courses, continuity, here we would look at the mass flow coming in. And what I'm going to do is I am going to look at a section of flow that extends out in this direction. And so on the inlet, what we would have, let me erase those, that and that. And on the inlet, what we would have is we would have this here. And these are all at U free stream. So coming in, what we have is the density multiplied by the free stream velocity. Sn is our spacing. And we're going to assume unit width. And that is going to be equal to the mass flux coming through this region here where we have the constriction. So again, it is going to be the density of the fluid multiplied by this new maximum velocity. We do not know what that is yet. And the size of that opening, we can compute that from Sn as well as knowing the diameter of our cylinders. And so what we have here on this side, we have D over two, that would be this distance. And then here we have another D over two, that would be that distance. So I'm looking at half of the cylinder. So what we can say is that we have Sn minus D over two minus D over two, which just turns out to be Sn minus D. Uh, we can now do some rearranging. First of all, density is going to cancel from the left and the right hand side. And what I want to do, I want to evaluate this so that I can isolate U max because that's what we are interested in. So we then obtain an expression for U max is equal to the free stream velocity multiplied by Sn divided by Sn minus D. And that is the way that we can evaluate U max when we have the inline arrangement. The next thing that we want to do, let's consider the case that is slightly more complicated where we have a staggered tube bundle. Okay, so there is our staggered tube bundle. What I want to do is I want to put the dimensions on here. So you recall from the first segment in this lecture, we talked about the direction parallel to the flow. That was SP or the spacing in that direction. And we also talked about spacing normal to the flow. That was SN. And again, like before, we will have D as being the diameter of each of our cylinders. And what we are now going to have, again, we have U infinity out here. And if you go back and review the video for when we had the staggered tube bundle, uh, you'll find that the flow comes along and, and it goes through a fairly severe change in direction. And, and, and so what is happening, we have two locations where we could say that we have a fairly significant constriction in, in space between the two bundles. One of them would be what we just saw where we called U max. That was for when we had the inline tube bundle. But I'm going to call this U1 because at this point we don't know if that is the maximum velocity or not. And then another location where we have a constriction is, although in this particular drawing it may not look like a constriction, but if you go back and watch the video, uh, you will see that between these two tubes here, we have velocity going in this direction, and I'm going to call that U2. And one of those two is the one that would give us the maximum velocity. And what we're going to do, we're going to again use geometry and continuity and come up with an expression for U1 and U2. And whichever one is larger, that would be U max that we would use in our Reynolds number. 
So what we're going to do, we want to find which is greater, u1 or u2. And we know from the analysis with the inline arrangement, we've been able to determine what u1 is. So that was the expression for u1. So that one we can put off to the side. And now what we want to do, we want to work on u2 and determine what it is. So let's take a look at determining u2. And looking back at our diagram, we notice that Sn, which we have here, is the distance from this center to that center. And so if we look at the distance from this tube center, that distance there is going to be Sn divided by 2. So we will use this in our drawing here. And then in the direction of the flow, or parallel to the flow direction, we know that this is Sp. So what we have here, we can construct a right angle triangle right here. And with that, we can write the following. And I am going to solve for L. So we now have an expression for L, which is telling us the distance from center to center of our tubes that are in the tube bundle. And just like before, what we'll be able to do, uh, we know that this distance here is d over 2, and this is d over 2 as well, going from the center line to the surface of the tube, and so we will be able to correct for that. We're now going to apply the continuity equation, and what I am going to do is I am going to say u infinity was up here, Looking back at our larger picture, what we're doing is we're zooming in on this section of the flow here. So we're looking at that to there. So we're making the assumption that a streamline coming along here, it would hit a stagnation point on that cylinder. So half of the flow needs to go this way and half is going to go up that way. And that's how we're able to do this and apply it at Sn over 2. So with that, on the inlet side, we will be looking at rho u infinity Sn divided by 2. And on the right-hand side, that is going to be equal to rho u2, which we don't know yet, L minus d, because I'm minusing d over 2. Eh, I'll put it out explicitly. So we're doing minus d over 2 minus d over 2. And so with that, we can go through canceling out the density and rearranging our terms. We end up with the following expression. Okay, so we obtain that for u2, a little bit more complex than what we saw for u1. But what we can do, we can come up with a method, and essentially what we can say is the following. So if this condition is met, then what we can say is that u max equals u1, and if that condition is met, Therefore, u max is equal to u2. And all I'm doing here is I'm taking the, the term that is multiplying u infinity and comparing it. So that term, or looking back, this term. So I'm taking those and doing a comparison between them, seeing which is greater, and that enables us to determine u max. And once you have u max, 
once you have that, then you can evaluate Reynolds number based on diameter at the max velocity, which is required in order to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient within the tube bundle. So that is the way that we determine Umax in the tube bundle. Okay, the last item that we're going to take a look at in this lecture uh, has to deal with uh, estimating the pressure drop across a tube bundle. Now, th this is going to have significant implications to the performance of the heat exchanger unit or cross-flow heat exchanger or whatever it is that we're looking at that involves the tube bundle. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to begin by looking at a video clip of an aerial cooling unit, uh, which is a gas-to-gas -gas heat exchanger, and so I'll begin the video clip. And so what you can see here is the aerial cooling unit. This is actually on the exit side, where the gas is coming out of the tube bundle. But air is being forced, atmospheric air, up through a tube bundle at the top of this unit. There you can see one of the fans. Uh, in the upper right hand corner we have the infrared camera showing uh, that this is a case where we're cooling a gas and so air is being forced up each of these different units there's a big fan connected to an AC motor and there you can see the AC motors uh, the airflow goes up through and across the tube bundle which is then cooling a gas and and so that is a gas to gas heat exchanger and sometimes also referred to as being an aerial cooling unit now when you're looking at that clip, what, what you'll notice is that we had, first of all, the fans on the bottom with AC motors, and consequently there's a coupling between the pressure drop and the performance of the fan, and that, that's why it's quite important for us to be able to estimate the pressure drop across a tube bundle. and quite often the pressure drop is written as being delta P. So schematically looking at what we may have going on in this type of a scenario, uh, I'm going to draw out the configuration that we just saw in that video clip. So here we have a tube bundle, and in this case the flow is going vertical up and through the bundle. Now it very well may be that there are fins on the tube bundle which could increase the pressure drop. But we won't worry about that right now. So let's say this is our tube bundle and it is confined within some sort of a duct. And we have forced convection heat transfer. And so below the tube bundle, we have a fan unit that is forcing air to flow up and across the tube bundle. And consequently, we're interested in being able to determine what the pressure drop is across this tube bundle because that has important implications to the performance of the fan and also determining the volumetric flow rate that would be coming through this system and that's why we want to be able to determine the delta p so let's take a look at the fan curve So typically when you're selecting a fan for an application, we'll have fan curves. And sometimes they'll have static pressure, sometimes they'll have inches of water, but then you use your OGH to determine what that is in pressure. And on the horizontal axis, we'll have volumetric flow rate. It could be uh, cubic feet per minute, standard cubic feet per minute, meters cubed per hour, something like that. And what you'll then find is you're going to get a series of curves that may look something like this. These are the different fan curves. And as we go out in this direction, this is increasing RPM. So that would be the rotations per minute of the fan. 
And typically in the video that we just saw, the fans were being driven by an AC motor. Now, depending upon where you are, uh, it depends on the power grid. But if you have 60 hertz power, typically that gives us 3600, 3560 is sometimes what is used to allow for slippage. Uh, but 3560 RPM, so you wouldn't want these fans spinning at that high of a, a speed so, or rotational rate. So what you would do is you would either have a pulley system to reduce the rotational rate or you would have a gearbox uh, that would reduce the rotational rate. If you have 50 hertz power, uh, other parts of the world have that. And there we would get 30 or 3000 RPM would be what would be coming off of the motor, the electric motor in this case. So... Anyways, the increasing RPM is going in that direction. Depends where you are, what it might be. And, and using belts or a gearbox, you can change the RPM that you're at. Now, the system itself, as determined by the pressure drop, so if we're looking at the pressure drop, this pressure drop, delta P, is going to be a function of uh, the volumetric flow rate going through the system. And consequently, as we change the volumetric flow rate, we will have a curve that does something like this. And that would be what they sometimes call the resistance curve. And what would happen, dependent upon the RPM that you are operating at, uh, the intersection of these two curves is where your system would be operating. And so it would depend upon RPM. Normally, you don't want to be operating right up there. You usually want to be operating a little bit lower because fans themselves have efficiency. And so you want to be operating a little bit lower than that intersection. But that is why we have an interest in being able to determine this. I am not going to give you the equation for determining that. It's kind of a long one and it varies depending upon which textbook you're using. There are different correlations. But, but this gives you a background in terms of why it is that we may want to know uh, what the pressure drop is. Because then this would relate directly into the volumetric flow rate that our unit is operating at and that would have direct implications into the convective heat transfer coefficient as well as uh, the amount of heat transfer that we have going on with our uh, two bundle. And so anyways that gives you a bit of a background of two bundles and industrial application with an aerial cooling unit. <laughs>
the flat plate boundary layer. However, here what's happening is the boundary layer is growing from both the top and the bottom. And, and consequently, our velocity profile will change as we move uh, from left to right. So I'm just going to sketch that out now. So what eventually will happen is our boundary layer will grow and grow and grow and eventually we'll get to some point within the flow field where the boundary layers have merged from uh, around the perimeter of the wall. So here we're looking at, for example, a round pipe. And when that occurs, that denotes what we call the hydrodynamic entry length. And then downstream of that point, the velocity profile is what we would call fully developed pipe flow. And the exact profile is going to depend on whether or not the flow is laminar or turbulent. But for right now, what we'll do, we'll just assume that it's fully developed. And the unique nature of fully developed pipe flow is that the velocity profile itself will not change as we go further downstream. Uh, unless we go through transition and go from laminar to turbulent, but we're not talking about that yet. So that is the entrance region. And so over here we have uniform inlet flow. And then once we get through the hydrodynamic entry length, we have what we call fully developed pipe flow. Now, when we're looking at pipe flow, we use a non-dimensional number to characterize what is happening, very much like we saw for the flat plate. Uh, but here we use Reynolds number based on diameter. So that is the characteristic length scale. The velocity that we use, we use a mean velocity, which we'll take a look at in a moment. And then we have our dynamic viscosity. So the mean velocity, let's take a look at the definition of the mean velocity. The mean velocity can be determined uh, by computing rho ua, which is essentially the mass flux, that is what is in our numerator, divided by rho a in the bottom, and then that will give us a mean velocity across the pipe. So if we were to go and try to expand this integral for the case of pipe flow, we would be integrating from 0 to r naught. so let's say this is our pipe, this is the center line, the radius is going to go from 0 to r equals r outer, r naught. We have our density, the velocity, the velocity is going to be a function of r, and it can also be a function of x in, as we evolve, but once we get to fully developed it won't change with x. And then we have our dA term. So the circumference of a circle times dR, and we're integrating from 0 to r naught. And then on the denominator, we have our density and the area, the cross-sectional area of this. Remember, we're dealing with a pipe. So we have something like that. It is just going to be pi r outer squared. And so immediately what we can see here is a few of these terms are going to cancel out. Density is gone, pi is gone. And so this expression will simplify somewhat. So that then becomes an expression for the mean velocity in our pipe flow. And we'll be using this again later when we look at computing a bulk velocity or bulk temperature for uh, non-isothermal pipe flow or pipe flow where we have heat transfer. So what we have here, we have a couple of different terms. UM is the mean velocity over the tube cross section. And D, that is the pipe or tube diameter. and that would be the inner diameter. Okay, so that is the entrance region, a way to calculate the mean velocity. Now, for pipe flow, just like we saw for the flat plate flow, we have a transitional Reynolds number, 
And this is the Reynolds number whereby we can expect the flow to transition from a laminar flow uh, starting to move into a turbulent flow regime where the velocity profile will change. And rule of thumb number about 2300, although it can range quite a bit, uh, you can even get pipe flow at much higher Reynolds numbers up to about 10,000 if you've really, really controlled conditions and you'll still have laminar flow. Although for industrial applications, you'd never be able to get that type of uh, low vibration type facility. And consequently, 2300 is a number that we often use. Uh, and with that, we also have a way to be able to define the entry length, because if you recall from our schematic, this is the entry length here. And so we have a way to quantify this length, uh, depending on whether or not we have a laminar or a turbulent flow. So entry length, and so this would be H denoting hydrodynamic entry length to get to fully developed flow. If we have a laminar flow, it is approximately 0 0.05 times the Reynolds number based on diameter. And if we have a turbulent flow, So to get to fully developed flow uh, for the hydrodynamic flow field, rule of thumb is between 10 and 60 diameters. That's how long it will take to get to fully developed flow uh, for turbulent flow fields. And, and so uh, quite often in flow metering applications, we're not talking about that here, but quite often they'll say, you need to have 10 pipe diameters upstream or downstream of a flow meter. And so that would kind of be agreeing with this. Uh, there you might have something where you have pipe flow coming along and then you have an elbow. Uh, you, you want to make sure that you go at least 10 diameters before you would put any kind of flow metering device in order to measure what the flow rate would be in that pipe. So anyways, that, that's just how to get to the fully developed flow regime. Uh, and here the elbow would be a thing causing an instability that changes the flow field. And, and so it takes a while for the effects of the elbow to wash out. So that is the entrance region, uh, transitional Reynolds number, the mean velocity field, and how to compute the entry length in uh, pipe flow looking at the hydrodynamics. What we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at the thermal boundary layer, the growth of the uh, temperature distribution within the pipe flow. In the previous segment, we looked at the uh, hydrodynamic entrance region uh, for pipe flow. And so what we're going to do now, we're going to take a look at the thermal effects. We're going to look at the thermal entrance region in pipe flow. And so just like before, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch out a section of pipe. And we can consider that we have a fluid flowing into that pipe. And we're going to begin with a uniform temperature profile. So let's assume that we have the fluid coming in. And this would be at location x equals 0. Now what is going to happen is just like before, uh, depending upon the wall conditions. So remember here, we can either have two different boundary conditions. One we can have a constant surface temperature or we can have a constant heat flux on the surface and so those would be two different types of boundary conditions that we could have upon our wall uh, but with that we have either heating or cooling taking place and consequently the temperature along the wall will begin to change and as the fluid flows that temperature will move in and, and consequently, we will eventually get to a point where our thermal boundary layer has moved from the walls in towards the middle, just like we saw for the flat plate. So if we go a little bit further into the pipe, 
our temperature profile may look something like this. And so we have this heating effect. This is the case where we would have heating on the wall, is what I'm sketching here. And that should be symmetric. So let me clean that up. So we would have a temperature profile that may look something like this. And you'll notice that in the center, we still have the same original temperature that we did on the inlet. And that's because our thermal boundary layer is growing. And so if I draw a dotted line for the thermal boundary layer, eventually what's going to happen in the pipe flow is that boundary layer will close. And then that is when we get to the case where the effects of the wall have been felt throughout the entire pipe flow. And when that occurs, we define that as being at the location where we're at what we would call fully developed flow with the thermal boundary layer. Now, the nature of the profile that we will have is going to depend upon the boundary conditions around the pipe, be it a constant temperature boundary condition or a constant heat flux. So I'm going to begin by sketching the case of a constant temperature boundary condition. So this would be one where the wall surface temperature is different from that of the fluid. And the temperature profile for a constant temperature boundary condition will look something like this. So that would be a constant temperature boundary condition. And then the case of constant heat flux. A constant heat flux boundary condition would look something like that for the temperature profile. Now the thing about the thermal boundary layer and the, the temperature profile, if we continue to add energy, uh, be it either through a constant temperature boundary condition or constant heat flux, this temperature profile will continue to change as we continue to move in the x direction. So unlike fully developed velocity profiles where the velocity profile doesn't change, this thermal energy or the temperature profile will continue to change. And so that's a little bit of a difference. Uh, but when we say fully developed, we're referring to the fact that the uh, uniform temperature no longer exists and the effects of the wall have been felt throughout the entire pipe. So across all the radii or radius. So with that, what we can do, just like before, we defined the length for, uh, before we got to the fully developed flow for the hydrodynamic boundary layer, we can do the same thing for the thermal boundary layer. And so beginning, if we have a laminar flow, the growth of our thermal boundary layer, non-dimensionalizing by pipe diameter, it's approximately 0 0.05 Reynolds number based on diameter, which is what we saw earlier for the hydrodynamic. But then we multiply it by the Prandtl number. And similarly, if we have turbulent pipe flow, and so fully developed thermal, that's what the T stands for, non-dimensionalized by pipe diameters for turbulent, approximately 10 pipe diameters. So it takes about 10 pipe diameters before you get to the case where the uh, discontinuity or whatever your surface boundary condition has been felt across the entire pipe. And that's if you have a turbulent flow field. So that is the thermal entrance region. Uh, what we'll be doing in the next segment, we'll be looking at a way to be able to compute the bulk temperature or the mean temperature. Remember we looked at the mean velocity in the previous segment when we were looking at the, uh, the hydrodynamic growth or entrance region uh, to the point where we had fully developed flow. What we'll be doing is we'll be looking at an equivalent thing to the mean velocity in a pipe flow. We'll be looking at the bulk temperature within pipe flow.
Okay, so when we're dealing with convective heat transfer uh, within pipe flow, uh, we have to come up with a way to express the temperature of the pipe flow. And the, the temperature depends upon the radial location. And so there really is no one fixed temperature. And so that brings up this concept of a mean or a bulk temperature. Now, if you recall Fourier's law, when we looked at the flat plate, we had H A T wall minus T infinity. Well, for pipe flow, we can have a wall temperature. Now, that's quite straightforward. But the thing that we don't have here is we don't really have a free stream temperature like we did with the flat plate boundary layer flow where we had the boundary layer growing but out here we had u infinity t infinity and so we could define and then that would be our wall temperature for pipe flow what we have we've seen is we're going to have different temperature profiles dependent upon whether or not it's a constant wall temperature or if it's a constant heat flux boundary condition. And, and consequently, we need an expression. So that this is supposed to be temperature that we're looking at here and there. Now, so we need a way to be able to define some form of temperature that we can use in our calculations. And that brings up this concept of a mean or bulk temperature. Okay, so with that, what we're going to do, we're going to consider pipe flow and we're going to consider the total amount of thermal energy in transport. And so we will refer to that as being energy in transport. So this is going to be in units of joules per second. And the way that we're going to compute that is we're going to integrate across the area of the pipe. And what we're going to integrate is rho u and there will be an area that we have in there and and that area will be a differential area as we integrate around it and that will give us a mass flux rho u area is a mass flux and we're going to multiply that by the specific heat so m dot cp times t t at a given location and then this brings in our area to close out the integral so looking at the units here, we have kilograms per meter cubed, we have meters per second, we have joules or kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, we have Kelvin and then meters squared. And so with that, uh, we have meters squared with a meter, so that and that cancels with a meter cubed, kilograms goes with kilograms, Kelvin goes with Kelvin, and so looking at the units, we're left with units of joules per second, which is what it should be because we're looking at energy per unit time being transported through our fluid. Now what we're going to do, uh, we're going to equate this with some bulk temperature. Sometimes they call this a mixing cup temperature because if you were to put a cup at the end of the pipe and let the flow come out into that cup and then mix it up, that would be your bulk temperature. But we're going to equate it with a bulk temperature. And again, so this is thermal energy in transport. And this time what we're going to do, we're going to say that it's equal to m dot, so the total mass flux in our pipe, specific heat of the fluid, times Tb. Tb is what we're trying to determine. We don't know what that is. That is our bulk temperature. So I'm going to equate those two. So when we equate them, and what I will do, I will, uh, I'll write it out first. Make it more explicit. Okay, so that's the integral over our pipe. And this DAC, this is going to be a 2 pi r dr. So that's what we will be substituting. But what I want to do, this is what we're interested in. So that's what we're going to try to solve for. So let's solve for that on the left-hand side. And then the right-hand side becomes the following. Now what I'm going to do, in the denominator, I am going to put in a value for m dot c sub p. 
and I'll pull the rho and the C sub P out of the integral in the numerator. And so that is our m dot term in the denominator. Notice here we have a 2 pi and a 2 pi. Those cancel. We have a row and a row, a cp and a cp. So all of those cancel. And what we end up with is you get that in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we have that term. Now, if you look back a couple of segments, we had, when we were evaluating, let's see, I have it here. We were evaluating the mean velocity in the pipe. And when we were doing that, for the mean velocity, this is what we said was the mean velocity. And when we look at this, uh, we can see that this integral here is exactly what we have in the denominator. And so consequently, what we can do is we can re-express the denominator as um r naught squared over 2. And so making that substitution, we can then rewrite our bulk temperature in the following manner. And so this becomes an expression for the bulk temperature, sometimes also called the mixing cup temperature. But essentially, this is a temperature that we can then use once we've evaluated it. We can then use it in Newton's law of cooling. Because recall, at the beginning, we said that we did not have a free stream temperature. Well, this is kind of the equivalent of a free stream temperature. But with that, we would then have heat flux. And we would write it this way, Ts. That is going to be the wall temperature. And Tb, that is our bulk temperature. So that is the mean or bulk temperature and how we would then use it in Newton's law of cooling. What we'll be doing in the next segment is starting to take a look at new salt numbers for pipe flow and those then become the way by which we can estimate the convective heat transfer coefficient and, and then enabling us to determine heat flux for pipe flow. <laughs>
So that's the mean or bulk temperature. All right, so that is uh, two sets of equations that you can use if you have laminar pipe flow, either constant heat flux or constant wall temperature. Okay, so this is the last segment of this lecture and what we're now going to do, we're going to take a look at uh, trying to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient for turbulent pipe flow. And just like what we saw for the boundary layer, the laminar boundary layer we were able to come up with analytic expressions or it is possible. Well, not analytic, but it would be through numerical integration and, and you get coefficients. Uh, for turbulent, uh, either flat plate or in this case pipe flow, it's very, very difficult. And so what we need to do is rely on empirical data. And what we're going to do, we're going to use the cold burn analogy, which is something that we saw for the boundary layer flow. Now, the cold burn analogy expressed in the following manner. And if you recall, it relates convective heat transfer coefficient to skin friction measurements. And that was for the case of a flat plate. So what we're going to do, we're going to come up with the skin friction equivalent for pipe flow. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be using the Moody friction factor. And this friction factor can either be obtained from the Moody diagram or it could be obtained from something like a Colebrook white equation where you have to iterate and you would then determine the friction factor. But if you recall from the friction factor, we can relate it to pressure drop. And in this expression, L is the length of the pipe or the section that this pressure drop pertains to. So what we're going to do, we're going to uh, look essentially at a force balance for a pipe flow. And so what we have, we have shear stress on the wall multiplied by the outer area and the length of the pipe. And that is going to be balanced by the pressure, uh, the, the pressure forces within the pipe and the pressure forces are going to be acting over the area, the cross-sectional area of the pipe. And if we have a pressure gradient, then I'll multiply it by the same length L. And so there we have essentially what amounts to being a force balance of shear stress with pressure gradient or pressure forces. This should be d naught squared. Sorry about that. And this equation then translates into the following. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to approximate this knowing our delta P, so the pressure drop over a given length. And we have this expression. What I'm going to do is I'm going to combine this with the expression that we had using the friction factor from back here. So combining those two equations, before I do that, however, I'm going to look at the definition of the skin friction coefficient. And the reason why I'm doing that is because with our cold burn analogy, we have the skin friction coefficient. So let's take a look at the definition of the skin friction coefficient, CF. That is the wall shear stress divided by the dynamic pressure evaluated using the mean velocity in the pipe. And now what I can do, I can take the expression here for the wall shear stress and substitute it in for the skin friction expression. 
So expressing the skin friction coefficient using our value for tau w. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take our expression for delta p that we had from the uh, Moody friction factor. So what I've done there is I'm just pulling in this expression here. And now I can do a lot of cancellations. So we get that. Skin friction coefficient is the friction factor divided by 4. I can then take that and put it into the Colburn analogy and we obtain the following. It's just the friction factor divided by 8. So with that what we can do is we can find empirical relationships for the friction factor within pipe flow realizing that it is a function of the roughness of the pipe wall but I'll just take one of the expressions so this is an empirical expression and with that we can then come up with an expression for the new salt number based on diameter So using nothing but the friction factor, which is measured from the pressure drop in pipe flow, uh, we can come up with an expression for the new salt number. So this is entirely based on fluid mechanic measurements and the Colburn analogy. Now, uh, what people have done is they've taken this expression and they've used it or tested it out uh, to see how well it matches heat transfer data. And it turns out that it's good, but it's not perfect. And so people have used that functional form and have fine-tuned it to come up with a better expression for the new salt number. So taking that basic functional form for the new salt number and using direct heat transfer measurements results in the following expression for the new salt number based on diameter. This expression is referred to as being the Dittus Bolter equation. And it is a very useful equation for computing the convective heat transfer coefficient in turbulent pipe flow. Now, there are other expressions that are a little bit better that cover wider ranges of temperatures and Prandtl numbers and things like that. But th this one actually turns out to be quite the useful one because it's quite compact, uh, not all that complicated. I notice we have an exponent n, and n will depend on whether or not we have heating or cooling. If we have a case of heating where the walls are te wall temperature is higher than that of the fluid, then in that case n is 0 0.4. And if we have cooling where the wall temperature would be cooler, then n is 0 0.3. And the last thing is that the properties in this equation are evaluated at Tb or Tm, so the bulk or mean temperature. Okay, so that is an expression for computing uh, the convective heat transfer coefficient in turbulent pipe flow. And what we did is we took advantage of the Colburn analogy and the wealth of information that exists uh, in computing pressure drop in pipe flows and it enabled us to come up with an expression that was close to this. But then this one was fine-tuned using experimental measurements and that is the Dittus bolter equation. <laughs>
In this lecture, we're going to begin by taking a look at the energy balance for fluid flow in a pipe. And so this is a pipe with either a constant surface temperature that is different from the fluid or with a constant heat flux. But in any case, there's heat transfer on the surface. So I'll begin by drawing out a schematic of a pipe, and then we'll apply an energy balance to that pipe. Okay, so here is a schematic of our pipe and what we have is we have a pipe with fluid coming from the left to the right. Uh, the fluid begins at the inlet I and then eventually at X equals L it goes to the outlet O. Uh, but what we're going to do, we're going to consider a section of the pipe in the middle where we have heat transfer taking place. And so we're going to say that we have convective heat transfer coming in and we don't know the exact nature of that, but we do know that it is through convection. So it could either be constant temperature, constant heat flux, or a combination for right now. Uh, but the way that we will quantify that is we are going to have some surface heat flux in watts per meter squared. And then we're going to multiply it by the area or the wetted area on the inside of the pipe. And that is going to be the perimeter of the pipe multiplied by dx. And dx is the length of our little differential element. Uh, that we are applying the control surface to. So we have fluid coming in at a bulk temperature TM and leaving at a different temperature. So it's either becoming hotter or cooler, but there is a DTM. And then we also have the pressure multiplied by nu. That is the specific volume. And then on exit, we have the pressure times specific volume plus the differential change. Of the PV term. So to express that, what we have is TB, that's the bulk temperature, mixing cup temperature, and it is also equal to TM. And so that is the bulk or mean temperature. And the other thing that we have is new. And if you remember from thermodynamics, that's where we use specific volume quite often. It is one over the density. And so that is specific volume. All right, so that is the system that we are going to uh, perform an energy balance on. We're going to perform an energy balance on the control surface. So let's go ahead and start that process. So to begin with, uh, remember we said that we have some form of convective heat transfer around the perimeter. So energy is coming in that way. And then we have energy flowing into our system on this side because we have flow coming in here. So energy is flowing in. And at the same time, we have energy flowing out through the fluid. And all of this needs to equal zero because we're operating in steady state. And if you're wondering where I'm getting these terms from, essentially this is just the first law of thermodynamics and the CVT, that is our internal energy. PV is the flow work because we have an open system where we have mass crossing our control boundary. And so uh, that is where that formulation is coming from. But now with this expression, what we note is, first of all, some of the terms are going to cancel out quite quickly. Uh, most importantly, this and this cancel out. And then what we're left with uh, for the differential amount of heat being transferred through convection is equal to the mass flow rate times the following. And we have that expression there. Now, what we're going to do, uh, we're, we're going to work with expressing this and this in other forms. And we're going to take advantage, uh, we, we could have a liquid or a gas, but uh, let, let's consider if we have a gas for right now. So we know 
through the ideal gas equation, we have that expression. And here, that is the relationship between C sub P and C sub V. And so what we can do, we can make a substitution here. First of all, for the PV term. And then noting this, the CV plus R, that is just CP TM. And consequently, we can rewrite Q convection as being the following. So that becomes one expression that we can work with, and we will be working with that as we go through. Now, if we're dealing with a liquid, and so what this is saying is that if we've been dealing with a liquid, the specific volume of the liquid is, is very small. And for a liquid, Cp is equal to Cv, and consequently we would result in the same equation uh, for a liquid. So although we made the assumption of the ideal gas, uh, it equally we could have gone through for a liquid and have come up with the same. So that means that this expression here applies for both a liquid and a gas, which is good because that's what we'll be using it for. Now, what we can do, we can take that differential equation and we can integrate from the inlet to the exit. And we obtain this expression and I'm going to box it because we will be using this expression later on in this lecture. And the last thing we can say is we can look at Fourier's law. And if all of the heat is being transferred along the inside wall of the pipe, we can write out Fourier's law in this manner. Now, this here, that T wall, that could also be expressed as T surface. And then this is the fluid temperature TM or the bulk fluid temperature. So this is what we have been looking at. We've been finding ways of obtaining this and quite often we have relationships for new salt number for either laminar or turbulent flow and we can determine the value of H. But the thing that we now need to ask is how can we handle this temperature difference for different types of problems? And what I'm referring to is that if we have a constant wall temperature, for example, how is the bulk temperature going to vary as a function of position along the pipe? And if we have constant heat, heat flux, how will this vary as a function of position along the pipe? And so consequently, we, we have a bit of a challenge when we're dealing with pipe flow in terms of being able to resolve this term here. And that is what we are going to be looking at in this lecture, finding a way or ways to be able to handle the temperature differential term for convective heat transfer in pipe flow. So that's where we'll be going in the next couple of segments. In the last segment, we took a look at an energy balance for pipe flow, and what we came up with was we came to a conclusion that we weren't sure how to be able to calculate the bulk temperature as the fluid was flowing through the pipe, be it a constant surface boundary condition or a constant heat flux. So what we're going to do now, we're going to explore in a little more detail the bulk temperature with position. And what we'll do, we'll derive a differential equation that enables us to explore the two different boundary conditions, either constant surface temperature or constant e heat flux. So let's begin uh, by pulling a couple of equations from our energy balance segment that we just looked at. 
So this is one of the equations that we came up with from our energy balance. And if we consider a section of pipe, and what we're going to do, let's consider a little differential element in the middle of that pipe, which is what we did when we came up with uh, perform the energy balance. dx is the length, so x is going in this direction as we go along the length of the pipe. And we have some form of heat transfer taking place. We'll quantify that as QS, uh, double prime, giving us watts per square meter. Now, what we can write is knowing th this is one equation that we have, but we can also do a balance based on the amount of convective heat transfer taking place. So. Uh, what I'll do, let me go to the next slide. So DQ convection can also be expressed as our surface heat flux multiplied by P, the perimeter of the pipe, times DX. That would be the area. And then that can be equated to our M dot CP DT, the bulk or the mean temperature change with distance. And so what we're going to do here, we're going to play with this equation beginning by rearranging. So what I've done here is I've taken these two and I've done a little bit of rearranging. And we end up with a differential equation that gives us an expression for how the bulk or mean temperature is changing as a function of position within the pipe. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take this and let's take a look again at Fourier's law or the way that we quantify convective heat transfer in the pipe. And so we have this expression here for QS double prime. And that would be the heat transfer, the convective heat transfer uh, due to convection on the wall. There we have our wall temperature and then the bulk temperature. And what I'm going to do is I am going to use this expression and I am going to bring it up into here for the QS double prime term. So let's go through that process. So this provides us with a differential equation where we have the slope or the gradient of the bulk temperature with position on the left. And on the right, we have an expression that contains the bulk or the mean temperature. And also embedded is the convective heat transfer coefficient. Now, if we're outside of the entry region of the pipe, so we're in the region that we call fully developed flow, the convective heat transfer uh, coefficient in pipe flow does not change with position. So that is a constant outside of the entry region. And these other two terms, if we can assume that the specific heat is remaining a constant, mass flux is going to be a constant. And if it's a constant area duct or pipe, perimeter does not change. And so those are constants as well. But that gives us a relationship. And what we are going to do uh, we're going to explore this equation and we're going to explore the equation to examine how TM varies with X and we'll do it with two boundary conditions. One is a constant temperature boundary condition. The other one is constant heat flux. And so that's what we're going to be doing in the next couple of segments is looking at this equation and seeing what it can tell us about the bulk temperature uh, for those two different boundary conditions. In the last segment, what we did is we came up with a differential equation that enables us to try to determine what happens with the bulk temperature as we go along uh, the length of a pipe. And so what we're going to do, we're going to begin by looking at the constant heat flux boundary condition. 
So if you recall constant heat flux boundary condition, that means that the heat transfer per unit area is going to be a constant along the wall of the pipe. And so with that, let's take a look at our differential equation for the bulk temperature in the pipe. So this is the expression that we had derived. It was one part of that equation. And looking at this equation, well, we just said that the heat flux is a constant. If we're dealing with a pipe of uniform cross-sectional area, uh, the perimeter of the pipe is not going to change with length or position. So position X is in that direction. And mass flux is always conserved within any kind of closed duct flow and consequently m dot is conserved and if we assume that the temperatures are not varying that significantly we can then make an approximation that cp is a constant so with that what that tells us is that that is equal to a constant and it is not a function of x so that, that's an interesting result. It's telling us that the uh, temperature gradient is going to be a constant. So what does that mean? That means that temperature is going to change at the same rate with position. So let's integrate this equation. And we'll plot up the temperature profile in a moment, which will help us uh, see what is going on. But to integrate this expression, the first term is a constant. And then we will have a constant of integration C1. And so what we need to do, we need to apply a boundary condition. So what we're going to do, we're going to say at x equals 0, the temperature is the bulk temperature on inlet, TMI. And that will be our boundary condition. And so with that boundary condition, what we can do is we can rewrite this expression. In the following manner. So that becomes the temperature distribution for constant heat flux. And with that, what we're going to do Let's take that and plot it. So we have TMI. This is X equals zero. And what we can see from the equation, let me write it out again. it's just a constant slope and this is the slope and so consequently what we can do is we can say that the temperature the bulk temperature is going to look something like that it's a constant slope curve a linear curve now what else can we extract out of this well the other piece of information looking at our pipe so here's our pipe we have, we've just determined a way to express the bulk temperature in the pipe as a function of position. We have the case of constant heat flux. So we have QS double prime equals constant. Another piece of information that we're interested in is what about the wall temperature? What is happening with the wall temperature? So TW as a function of x. What is going on there? And we can shed some light on that by looking at Fourier's law. So looking at Fourier's law in watts per meter squared, we have this expression and we know that this here is a constant because we have a constant heat flux boundary condition. 
If we're in the fully developed flow region outside of entrance region effects, then H as well is going to be a constant for pipe flow. And so what that tells us is that this difference also needs to be a constant. So T wall minus TM is equal to a constant. And so if we look back at our plot, so if we take this and bring it up here, what that tells us is that the wall temperature has to be a constant amount larger than the bulk temperature and it as well will be a linear variation where the difference here is related to the heat flux divided by the convective heat transfer coefficient and so that would be an expression for t wall of x so that gives us some insight into what is happening uh, with both the bulk temperature as well as the wall temperature under the case where we have a constant heat flux boundary condition. And what we'll be doing in the next segment, we'll take a look at what happens when we have a constant wall temperature versus a uh, constant heat flux boundary condition. <laughs>
and the length of the pipe, uh, let's see, uh, we will use that here, x equals L, x equals 0. Okay, so let's integrate that expression. And integrating. So upon integrating, we obtain this expression here. And H refers to the average convective heat transfer coefficient in our pipe. Now, if it's fully developed flow, H will not change. But if we have an entrance region, then we may have to worry about entrance region effects. And uh, what I am going to do, I want to recast this equation so that we can look at what this term looks like on its own. And so in order to do that, uh, we take the exponential of both sides so we can rewrite it. So this becomes an expression that helps us look at how the temperature is changing within the pipe. Now it might look a little abstract at this point. So in order to assist, what we're going to do, let's plot the temperature as a function of position. And remember we have our constant surface temperature. This is x equals zero. It goes up to x equals L. And on the inlet to the pipe, we had our bulk or our mean temperature on inlet. And looking at the relationship that we have here, so this is our relationship. We have the change in temperature related to an exponential function. And consequently, when you plot that, you end up with something that looks like this. And then this here would be our bulk temperature on outlet. But what we can see here is the temperature difference between the wall or our surface temperature, constant surface wall, and the bulk temperature of the fluid in the pipe, delta T. This is a function of position X. And consequently, if we want to determine the difference between the two fluid streams in order to evaluate the total convective heat transfer coefficient. It's a little bit of a challenge because delta T is constantly changing. If you recall when we looked at the flat plate, it was quite simple because we had T wall minus T infinity and T infinity was not changing. That was a constant. Here, however, uh, we don't have that case because we have T wall minus t mean or t bulk and that is changing as a function of position which makes it a little confusing a little challenging so what we need to do we need to find a way to be able to handle the fact that our temperature differential or our temperature difference is a function of position and so what we're now going to do uh, we're going to try to relate this back to the convective heat transfer which is taking place between uh, the wall and the fluid flowing through our pipe. So this was an expression that we uh, put down on the very first segment of this lecture. And what we can do, we can rewrite this in terms of our delta T. And this was where delta T was defined as being T wall minus T mean, or our bulk temperature. So we can re-express it in that way. And what I'm now going to do, I'm going to solve for M dot C sub P from this equation. And we obtain that expression. And the other thing I'm going to do, so I'm going to park this now for a moment. And I'm going to go back to the expression, uh, to this expression here, the one with the natural logarithm. So let's pull that expression. And now I'm going to isolate for m dot c sub p in this equation. And that will enable me to compare the two equations that we have here. 
Okay, so here we have an expression for m dot c sub p, and here we have an expression for m dot c sub p. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to combine or unite equations 1 and 2, and I'm going to, in the process, what I'm going to do, this is what we're interested in. We're interested in the convective heat transfer taking place between our fluid streams. So that's what I'm going to try to isolate. Okay, and then we obtain this expression here. Now, AS here is the surface area, the wetted surface area along the pipe wall, the inside. And this last term here, the one that has the natural logarithm in the denominator, we call this the log mean temperature difference. And sometimes you'll see it with the acronym LMTD, but it's basically a temperature difference that enables us to determine the convective heat transfer between the wall at a constant temperature and the fluid stream. So if we look back, essentially what LMTD is doing is it's taking this changing difference and coming up with an average temperature difference which is the LMTD. But it's taking into account the fact that we have this nonlinear function here. It's not a linear function. If it was linear, we could just do the average uh, difference from the inlet to the outlet, but we can't do that. It's a nonlinear function. So what LMTD does is just an expression that computes the difference given the fact that we have uh, a constant function and an exponential function. And that is what LMTD does. And with that, we're equipped with a way to be able to compute the convective heat transfer from a constant wall to a fluid uh, that is flowing through a pipe. And so that is how we handle the constant surface boundary condition in pipe flow. And we will be looking at this equation again when we look at heat exchangers. And there's even a method called the LMTD method of, of analyzing uh, the flow through heat exchangers and the amount of heat transfer. But we'll be getting that to later uh, in the course. For now, we're just interested in pipe flow. So this is the expression that tells us if we're dealing with pipe flow with a constant wall surface temperature, and we've come up with an expression for the convective heat transfer, but it also gives us an indication as to how the bulk temperature within the pipe changes as a function of position. In the last two segments of this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to consider the topic of non-circular geometry pipe flow. And when we're dealing with non-circular geometry, uh, one of the things that we have to do is determine what diameter we should be using for our analysis. And, and what we tend to do with non-circular geometry is, is we use what is referred to as being the hydraulic diameter. Now, the definition of the hydraulic diameter, first of all, it has the symbol capital DH. It is four times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. So with that, let's take a look at a couple of common shapes that we may encounter dealing with this. Okay, so there we have two different cross sections for a pipe, one a traditional round pipe and then the other one a square pipe. And so, and recall we said the hydraulic diameter was four times the cross sectional area divided by the wetted perimeter. So for the round shape, the area we know is pi r squared and the perimeter is two pi r. 
and consequently evaluating the hydraulic diameter What we end up with is the hydraulic diameter for the round shape is just two times the radius, which would be the normal diameter. Now looking at our square cross section, we end up with just directly the uh, one of the dimensions of the square cross section. So those are ways that you can calculate the hydraulic diameter and this is what you would use for the length scale when you're calculating the convective heat transfer coefficient dealing with non-circular geometry. Now for laminar flow, fully developed laminar flow, there are tables that exist that will show values of the new salt number as well as a pressure drop uh, characteristic for different types of shapes, so different aspect ratios. Uh, triangular cross sections, all kinds of different things. If you look in any uh, heat transfer textbook, you'll probably find uh, a table with these values in it. And typically what they will plot is they will have a new salt number and it, there will be new salt number with subscript H and that usually denotes constant axial heat flux. And new salt number with T, and that would be constant axial wall temperature. And if you recall, those are the two boundary conditions that we used when we were determining the bulk temperature within a uh, round pipe flow. And other things that they may have, they may have a thing with the friction factor uh, multiplied by the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number is evaluated using the hydraulic diameter. So those would provide us with information about the convective heat transfer coefficient would be embedded in the new salt number and the friction factor the pressure drop would be in the friction factor Reynolds number and in both of the non-dimensional numbers new salt and Reynolds uh, the length scale we evaluate They're evaluated based on using the hydraulic diameter dh. So that is how you handle cases of non-circular geometry. What we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to solve an example problem uh, that involves a non-circular geometry system and we will compute the heat transfer for that type of geometry. <laughs> All right, we're going to close out this lecture with an example problem looking at uh, water flow through a pipe with a non-circular cross-section. So I'll begin by writing out the problem statement. All right, so there is the problem statement. We're dealing with water uh, flowing in a duct with a cross section 5 by 10 millimeter and we're told that the mean bulk temperature is 20 degrees C and we have a constant wall temperature of 60 degrees C and we're dealing with fully developed laminar flow and then what we're looking for we want to calculate the heat transfer per unit length and so in this problem we're told the bulk temperature 20 degrees C and the wall temperature 60 and we want to evaluate the amount of heat transfer per unit length in that section of pipe. And consequently, this is not something that we would be applying the log mean temperature difference to, uh, given that we're interested specifically what is going on at this particular point within the pipe. So what we'll do is we'll begin by writing out what we know for this problem, and then we'll start the solution procedure. So that is the information that we know and what we're trying to find 
we're trying to find the heat transfer per unit length and so I'm going to assume a length of one meter and going through the solution for this. So what we'll do, we'll begin by drawing a schematic. So there we have our duct and then looking at a cross section of the duct. So that would be a cross section of the duct, a rectangular cross section. And now uh, in terms of the analysis, what we will do we know that this is non-circular geometry. We're dealing with laminar flow. Uh, we have constant axial wall temperature. And if you recall from the last segment, I mentioned that any heat transfer book would probably have tables showing these values. Sure enough, you look up the value in a book and you will find uh, that would be a rectangular channel with an aspect ratio of 2. So we would have A and B as shown there. And you get a value of the new salt number for that condition of 3.391. And remember, this is new salt number evaluated using the hydraulic diameter. And the properties, where will we evaluate the properties? Well, the property that we have to worry about is going to be K. And given that we're told that we're dealing with a section of pipe where the mean or bulk temperature is 20 degrees C and the wall temperature is 60 degrees C, What we'll do is we will evaluate our properties at the 20 degrees C value. So the property that we have to look up in a table is going to be the thermal conductivity of water. Doing an interpolation. And the hydraulic diameter. That is four times the area divided by the perimeter. Well, the area is dimension A times dimension B, and the perimeter is 2A plus 2B. And so when you put in the numbers or the values for A and B, we get this. So what we can do, we can take our new salt number, which we have right here. We've solved for K, well we looked that up in the tables, DH we just computed. So the last thing left here is going to be H, the convective heat transfer coefficient, and that's what we want to solve, or solve for. So with that, we can isolate H and we get this value 306.6 watts per meter squared kelvin for the convective heat transfer coefficient now that's kind of a high value uh well although we're dealing with water and consequently we would expect it to be quite high uh, but that is the value that we get for h and now looking at the problem statement what we were looking for we want to find the heat transfer per unit length so heat transfer per unit length that is going to be watts per meter so looking at it in terms of things, it's going to be Q prime. So coming back here, first of all, let me express this in terms of H A T wall minus T mean or bulk. And that would be H length times 2A, the perimeter of our duct. Now I'm going to bring the length over to the left hand side and that's going to give us Q prime which will be watts per meter. Then we have the following. So we have all of the values in this equation. We can plug them in and what we find is the following. And so we get that for the heat transfer per unit length. 
and that is for our rectangular duct. Main thing is just looking up the value in the table for the new salt number and computing the length scale being the hydraulic diameter. So that is an example of performing a heat transfer calculation using non-circular geometry. In this lecture, what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at another form of convective heat transfer, and that is free or natural convection. The reason why we call it free or natural convection is because the body forces in the fluid are provide the driving mechanism for the convective heat transfer. So unlike with force convection, we don't need a pump or a fan in order to circulate the fluid. And so in a way, this is kind of a green form of convective or a form of heat transfer in that you don't have to add energy to the flow. You're using the natural buoyancy of the fluid in order to drive the heat transfer process. And so there's the definition of free or natural convection. So what we're looking at is we're looking at convective heat transfer in the absence of any kind of forced velocity. So we don't have a pump, we don't have a fan causing circulation in the fluid. And it is the body force within the fluid that is actually providing the mechanism of moving the fluid over the surface where we have the heat transfer taking place. And buoyancy is the body force that is the thing that is driving. It could either be a fluid being hot, in which case uh, typically with a gas or a liquid, it will be less dense and it will move up. Or if it is cooler, it will become more dense and then it will drop or descend. And that becomes the mechanism by which we can have uh, what we call convective current. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin by looking at some common engineering examples where you could have free or natural convection. So the first one that we'll look at are electronic cooling packages or fins. And then we will look at another form, which is natural convection on the back of refrigeration systems or refrigerators. And the last thing that we will take a look at is heating systems and these could either be electric where you have dual heating it could be where you have hot water circulating or you could have steam so let's go ahead and start looking at some of these different applications where we would have free or natural convection and what we'll begin with we'll begin with electronic cooling and so here we can see the fan on the motherboard of a computer and that's a pretty standard thing that has convective heat transfer. There's a refrigerator and you can see all the heat coming from the back on the IR camera. And then when you flip the refrigerator around, you can see the cooling coils. Uh, here is a radiator inside of the household. Uh, and, and so it is heated. We have fins inside the radiator. Hot fluid goes through the copper tube. Uh, there are other applications. This is in Reykjavik, Iceland, and, and they have very interesting free or natural convection. With the geothermal power, they generate electricity from the steam. And so there you can see them generating the electricity in a turbine. Uh, they expand the steam, but then the waste heat, they send that many, many kilometers to Reykjavik. And it is used for different applications along the way. Here we have a greenhouse. And, and so the water comes in, it's about 52 degrees C. They then circulate it through these pipes on the bottom of the greenhouse. Free or natural convection is what is providing the, the uh, circulation mechanism. And then the water drops down to about 36 degrees C. And they grow tomatoes with this. So a really, really neat application of the geothermal heat. Uh, when it gets to Reykjavik, they store it in these big tanks. And then they circulate it throughout the city. And the water is very hot. You can use it for hot domestic water. 
uh, but quite often they use it for heating. And so there you can see a radiator. There are all different types of styles, radiator, two radiators on the other side of the, either side of this window or door. Uh, there you can see a larger radiator. And they put them by windows because that's where you have cold air and that really drives the process quite efficiently. And they also actually put it in on the streets. And so here you can see a sidewalk, they have a circulating loop. And with that, they don't have to shovel snow when it snows. So great application of natural convection in Reykjavik, Iceland. So there we can see three different applications, electronic cooling, household heating, uh, as well as uh, growing tomatoes in Reykjavik, where they were using the heat uh, and the tubes in the bottom of the greenhouse in order to pro provide the heat for the growth of the tomatoes using uh, natural convection, no pumping mechanism uh, to circulate the air throughout the greenhouse. So what we're going to be doing in the next segment, we're going to take a look at the fluid mechanics behind what is going on in free or natural convection. And then we'll start moving into the correlations that are used for quantifying free or natural convection. In looking at free or natural convection, it is quite instructive to take a look at what is happening in terms of the fluid mechanics. And so that is what we're going to do in this segment. And so before jumping into looking at the governing equations and things about the velocity profile and non-dimensional numbers, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to begin by looking at a fairly classic example of free or natural convection. And that is one that deals with a heated or cooled a flat plate flow. So what we'll be looking at uh, in this segment is a vertical flat plate. And we'll begin by looking at a flat plate that is cooled followed by one that is heated. So let's begin by looking at the cooled flat plate. And in order to do that, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at a video. And what we have here is we're boiling, pouring boiling water and vinegar, water on the left, vinegar on the right, into a container that has ice water in the middle. So you can kind of see there's something in the middle. That's a stainless steel tube that has ice water in it. So we have hot flu fluid on the outside. And you can see the index refraction variations in the liquid. It's quite prominent. And, and then what starts happening, you can see along the ice water surface or the cooled surface, the fluid is descending and you can see it in waves. And I, I've taken this, we're looking at about four and a half minutes of time here, condensed into uh, shorter periods of time, but you can see the cool fluid descending along the ice water, uh, the stainless steel cylinder in the middle. And as it warms up and the fluid on the outside uh, cools, then we come into equilibrium and the driving force goes away. And that's why it becomes less and less pronounced with time. And, and so eventually you can see there are just small waves going through. So that's an example where we have a vertical flat plate and we have uh, a cooled surface. And consequently, the fluid on the surface uh, becomes more dense and it then moves downwards. And and so that is one application that we can have with a flat plate. Now, the one that we're probably more used to is where we have the flat plate being heated. And so that's what we're going to look at in this clip. And so here we can see a barbecue. Uh, there is the hot air coming up on the outside of the barbecue. Uh, it's going around a corner and so starting to separate. And then eventually it merges with the uh, byproducts of combustion coming out of the barbecue at the top. And, and so you could see the thermal boundary layer in, in that case as well for that clip. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a look and we're, we're going to look at the second video clip that, that we just saw. And that is the case of a heated vertical flat plate. So let's examine that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to sketch a vertical wall
So what we have here, we have a vertical heated wall. X is going in the vertical direction. Y is normal to the wall. And the wall temperature, we're assuming that is, it is hotter or warmer than the ambient fluid, which is out here. But what happens as we move upward along that plate, we do get a boundary layer forming. And you could see that in the barbecue video, the one where we have the heated vertical plate. And you're looking at the index refraction variations uh, within the air that is next to the uh, hot vertical surface. And it becomes uh, at a higher temperature and consequently less dense. And then that is what provides the mechanism that moves it upwards. But what will happen, just like we saw for the flat plate with force convection, we go through a transition process where we go from laminar and then we move into a turbulent uh, boundary layer that is on the surface. And so let me just sketch that out. And if we were to look at the temperature profile at any given location, now here what I've sketched, this is the boundary layer. And for now, let's assume that the velocity boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer are approximately the same thickness. That would depend upon the Prandtl number, just like we saw for uh, force convection. But if you were to go and place a thermocouple along the wall and then do a traverse, so moving the thermocouple out in the y direction, that would enable us to measure the temperature profile. And if we were to do that, the temperature profile in our boundary layer would look something like this. Remember the wall is hotter than the ambient fluid. And so eventually what we would find is that when you get outside of the boundary layer, you're going to get to a temperature that is T infinity. And as you move in towards the wall, what's going to happen is the temperature is going to increase. That's not a very good curve. Let me redo that. So you're going to get something that might look like this. So the temperature as we move in towards the wall is going to get hotter and hotter. And eventually we get to a point when you reach the wall, the boundary condition on the wall is that the fluid temperature right at the wall surface has to equal the wall temperature. So we would have that at that location, T wall, and then we would have this profile, T of X, Y, and consequently the temperature profile is going to vary not only uh, normal to the wall, but also as we move upwards along the wall. So it's a function of both X and Y. And if we were to look at the velocity profile, and the velocity profile would be quite a bit different from what we saw for uh, the boundary layer for force convection. And so I'm going to try to sketch that out. And what happens when you leave the boundary layer, you get into what we would call uh, quiescent fluid. And there, the velocity is zero. And, and that's something new. We, we didn't see that before when we were looking at force convection. So the velocity has to go to zero outside of the wall. And then if you were to, again, place a probe that enabled you to measure velocity normal to the wall, you would find a profile that would look something like this. It would spike up and then it would come back down towards zero. And this then would be the velocity profile normal to the wall. And again, it is a function of X and Y. And so that is the thermal boundary layer that we have. And, and this is going to be very important in terms of uh, determining what the convective heat transfer coefficient is. And just like uh, for the flat plate flows or any of the flows that we looked at for force convection, we'll be able to do a little bit of analysis for laminar and we have a laminar flow, but when we go to turbulent, what we're going to be forced to do is rely on empirical or experimental data. So that is what the boundary layer flow looks like uh, when we have free or natural convection.
In the last segment, we took a look at the fluid mechanics associated with free or natural convection. What we're going to do in this segment, we're going to take a look at the governing equations. And when we looked at the velocity profile, if you recall, we were drawing a plate, assuming that the plate temperature was hotter than that of the surrounding fluid, uh, we had the condition where T wall T wall was greater than T infinity, and T infinity was the quiescent or ambient fluid outside of the plate. But when we did this, what we did is we introduced a coordinate system with X going in this direction and Y being normal to the plate. And so we will continue with that coordinate system as we look at the governing equations. Now what we're going to do, we're going to begin with the X momentum equation that it has been reduced a little bit similar to the boundary layer approximations. We're not doing that in this course, but if you uh, look at my fluid mechanics course, you'll find uh, discussion about how to reduce the Navier-Stokes equations into the boundary layer equations. Uh, but with that, I will write out the X component of the momentum equation. Okay, so that is the X momentum equation. Now, one thing that you may notice immediately if you compare this to the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, we have a minus G here. And the reason for that uh, the, the reason why it is negative is because the gravity vector is acting downwards, which uh, with our coordinate system that we've just cast out here, uh, or written there, that would be a negative value. And that's why we have the negative value there. Uh, it's negative as X is acting downwards. Whereas the gravity acts downwards. Okay, so that is the X momentum. Uh, the other thing that we know, uh, we were showing that the boundary layer starts to grow from the beginning of the plate. And, and in reality, what's happening is we do have fluid being entrained. And so there would be fluid coming in from below, and that would give us a little bit of a velocity profile at the beginning. Uh, but usually what we assume is out beyond the boundary layer, that is when we get into what we call the quiescent region where quite often we make the approximation that the velocity in that region is zero. So with that approximation, <clears throat> what we can do is we can look at the X momentum equation and the X momentum equation then in the quiescent region reduces to the following. This was just minus rho infinity g is equal to the pressure gradient. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to call the X momentum equation equation 1. I'll call the quiescent region equation equation 2. And now what we're going to do, we're going to sub equation 2 into equation 1. And with that, the following results. So we obtain this equation here, and now what we're going to do, uh, we're going to focus in on this term here, how to handle the fact that we have a density difference. And in order to do that, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to introduce the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. And the volumetric expansion coefficient is defined in the following manner. So beta is related to the change in density with temperature at a constant pressure. And with this, what we can do is we can look at it for a couple of different scenarios. Uh, be it a gas or a liquid. And, and so to begin with, if we're dealing with a gas, if we're dealing with an ideal gas, we can use the ideal gas equation. And with that, we can rewrite beta in the following manner. 
and then making a substitution for the density, we get 1 over the temperature in Kelvin is beta for an ideal gas. And if we're dealing with a liquid or a non-ideal gas, in those cases, beta would be from property tables. So that's how we handle beta, which is our volumetric thermal expansion coefficient. Coming back though, uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to find a way to use beta in order to uh, figure out how to handle this term here where we have the difference in density. And so what we're going to do, uh, we're going to express beta in terms of a finite difference. So that would be beta expressed in terms of a finite difference. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to solve for rho infinity minus rho, which is what is in our momentum equation. So what we have here is an expression for the difference in density expressed now in terms of the density, the volumetric expansion coefficient, and the difference in temperature. And this is referred to as being the Boussinesque approximation. And it gives us a coupling uh, between the momentum equation and the energy equation. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite our governing equations. So we have the x-momentum equation. We have continuity. And lastly, we have the energy equation. So those are the three equations that we have that we need to solve if we want to be able to determine uh, the temperature and the velocity profile in front of or above a plate that has natural convection. So remember y was in that direction, x is in that direction, and this would be a case where the plate wall is greater than t infinity, t infinity being out here. So we have momentum, continuity, and energy, and, and those would have to be solved. Uh, what we're going to do in the next segment, we're not going to solve them. We'll actually rely on a solution that uh, others have come up with. And it turns out that in order to solve this, uh, you get two differential equations that you have to solve numerically, very similar to the Blasius solution, actually. If you look at my fluid mechanics course, uh, you'll see a discussion about that process. But uh, what we'll be doing, we're going to be uh, doing some dimensional analysis. We'll non-dimensionalize the equation, I should say, and then uh, some non-dimensional numbers will be dropping out of them, and that's what we'll be looking at in the next segment. <laughs>segment uh, we left off with the governing equations that we can use for looking at uh, convective free convection on a vertical heated plate. Uh, what we're now going to do we're going to go through a process of non-dimensionalizing the governing equations. And the governing equations that we had I'll write them out we had x momentum continuity and energy. So those are the governing equations that we have. Now what we're going to do, we're going to introduce a non-dimensionalizing process. And the purpose of non-dimensionalizing, we, we can often do this in fluid mechanics, but 
what it enables us to do is determine the order of magnitude of the different terms, which terms are important and which are less important. But in order to do this, what we'll be doing is we will be introducing non-dimensionalized variables and they will be given the star and then we'll take for example the length scale x and we'll divide by some characteristic length scale uh, we do the same with the y dimension we introduce a new variable y non-dimensionalized by our length scale l now for velocity uh, for free convection or natural convection we don't really have any specific free stream velocity that we can non-dimensionalize by, so we're just going to do some characteristic velocity, u naught, and we'll do the same for v star. And then finally for temperature, we'll do something, we do this in heat transfer quite often, we subtract by the free stream, and then T wall minus T infinity. Now, sometimes this is TS, so don't get confused. T wall, TS, they're one and the same, the surface or the wall temperature. And in this, uh, what we've done is L is a characteristic length scale. And u naught is some arbitrary reference velocity that we have not yet defined. So if we go through the process of non dimensionalizing, uh, for example, let's take a look at one of the terms that we have here. Uh, we have u du by dx. So if I was to non-dimensionalize that, uh, what I would do is I would go through the following process. I would take, and uh, that would be u star times u naught. And then inside of the partial, we have a u. So again, we would pull out a, another u naught. And then that would be partial u star. And then in the denominator, that would be partial x star, but we would have a length scale L there. So that would result in the following. It would be u naught squared over L, u star, partial u star, partial x star. So if we do that for all the different terms, uh, we'll result in a, a new equation. I won't go through all of that, but uh, if we take that final equation that we've non-dimensionalized and we multiply it by the Reynolds number squared, uh, a new non-dimensional number will drop out and that number we refer to as being the Grashof number. So with this, what happens is the Grashof number uh, comes out of our x-momentum equation. And the Grashof number, we have not seen it yet, but it is expressed in the following manner. So that is the Grashof number. We're new is equal to our dynamic viscosity divided by the density. So when we look at this, uh, what the Grashof number represents, it is a ratio of buoyancy force to viscous force. And by comparison, when we saw the Reynolds number, recall the Reynolds number was inertia, the inertia force to the viscous force. So the Grashof number is a non-dimensional number that we use quite often for natural or free convection. And it plays a very similar manner to uh, the Reynolds number did for uh, force convection over flat plate flow.
So what we see is that the Grashof number plays a very similar role as the Reynolds number did uh, for forced convection over a flat plate in that it is giving us an indication of when we will transition from a laminar a free or natural convection flow to a turbulent free or natural convection flow. And, and consequently, we will have a critical Grashof number and that is approximately 4 times 10 to the 8. Uh, however, anything from 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 uh, is commonly used. And recall what that means is that if we have our vertical flat plate here, we can have a laminar boundary layer. And then when we hit the transition point, the boundary layer will grow at a higher rate, maybe not that high. Uh, but it would go through a transition process and so here we would have laminar and then up here would be turbulent. Uh, what that means is the convective heat transfer relationships will be different as we go through this transitional point and X was in that direction and so this would be the Grashof number evaluated as a function of X at that location. So that is the Grashof number, a non-dimensional number, very, very important for free or natural convection, and we'll be using that uh, quite often as we go through the analysis in this chapter. In the previous segment, what we did is we started with the governing equations, X momentum, continuity, and energy, and we went through a non-dimensionalizing process. Well, you can use those same equations and use them to come up with a solution for the temperature and velocity profile uh, in the case of a vertically heated flat plate. And uh, what results, uh, you can come up with a solution that then enables you to get the new salt number and so for laminar flow, so this would be for a vertically heated flat plate, uh, constant temperature. Uh, but if you go through the analysis, what happens is you would use a similarity solution and it results in a, a nonlinear ordinary differential equations, a series of them, two of them. And those equations would be solved using numerical methods. And with that, uh, within the equations, uh, what we have that are related to the Grashof number, or the solutions would be, and note here, the Grashof number is expressed as a function of x. So remember, our coordinate system that we have imposed for this vertically heated flat plate, uh, x going in this direction. So we're looking at the Grashof number at some x location. And what we can do uh, with these solutions, the, the solutions will be uh, derived or obtained through the uh, numerical methods and numerical integration. And then in order to relate that to the Neusselt number, you have to go through essentially a curve fitting procedure and, and fitting functional forms to the data. And so one expression for the Neusselt number that results through that process is the following expression. And again, there will be different relationships that exist depending upon what type of curve fitting is being used. So that would be an expression that would be obtained for the new salt number. Now that gives us the local value of the new salt number, very much like what we saw for the uh, flat plate when we had forced convection. And so what that is doing is that would be quantifying the local heat flux at some location X. And so that would be location X there. Now, uh, quite often we're interested in obtaining the average convective heat transfer coefficient across a plate H bar. 
And so in order to do that, what we would have to do is integrate the local heat transfer coefficient. And so looking functionally, I won't go through it, but if you recall, the new salt number is HX over K. And with the relationship that we uh, just have put here, we see that we have Grashoff number to the one fourth. Well, Grashoff number is X cubed, so that is x to the three-fourths is the new salt number relationship and so with that we can say that the new salt number relationship is x to the three-quarters and then notice that we have the x here so if i want to isolate for h that means that h is going to then be a function of that will be one well actually it'll be k but k is a constant so we don't have to worry too much about it but uh, it'd be over x to the one quarter or x to the minus one quarter and so with that if we want to obtain and so in here we're looking at h of x and if we want to obtain the average convective heat transfer coefficient across the plate we would integrate it over whatever the length of the plate would be and we would do h of x dx just like we did earlier for the flat plate and with this uh, minus one quarter uh, when we integrate that what we end up with is a relationship that looks in the following manner So it would be four thirds of the value of H at the end of the plate. So if this is Y and this is X, so let's say this is our plate here, X equals L, we would evaluate at H at X equals L and then H bar or the average value for the entire plate is then just four thirds H at x equals L, which would be the convective heat transfer coefficient at the end of the plate. So that is what we get, and, and this is in the case of an isothermal plate that we were looking at. Where we said that this was T wall and T infinity was out here, and we said T wall was greater than T infinity. So that is the solution uh, that we can obtain. And we had the functional form for the new salt number. There are different ones that exist in different books, depending upon how the curve fit has been performed. Uh, but the main thing to remember, 4 thirds H X equals L. And this is for laminar. Uh, it's not for the case of a turbulent flow. So we have not gone through the transition process yet. <laughs>thing that we're going to take a look at in this lecture is the relationship between the new salt number which we just saw uh, we uh, came up with an expression for the new salt number for a vertically heated flat plate and the relationship between that and the non-dimensional numbers that are important for free convection new salt number obviously being one of them but uh, typically what we find is that the new salt number and so let's assume that we're expressing this in terms of uh, the length of a plate it is going to be a function of a number of different non-dimensional variables the Reynolds number being one of those another one would be the Grashoff number and that is the non-dimensional number that fell out of our non-dimensionalization of the governing equations and then finally the Prandtl number that is an important number again we saw that for force convection uh, it pops up again with natural convection. It's basically uh, a ratio of our viscous to thermal diffusion. And, and, and so what we have here is we have, uh, depending upon the Grashoff number and the Reynolds number and the ratio of those, we could be in different types of flow regimes.
So to begin with, if we have the Grashof number, remember the way that we got the Grashof number, we multiplied our governing equation by Reynolds number squared. That's why we're dividing uh, the Grashof number by Reynolds number squared here. But if this ratio is approximately equal to one, we have a flow regime that is referred to as being combined free and forced convection. And consequently, for this, we know that the new salt number is going to be a function of all three, the Reynolds number, the Grashoff number, and the Prantle number. If we have a flow where the Grashoff number divided by the Reynolds number squared is much less than one, uh, that would be a higher Reynolds number flow, and that would mainly be forced convection. And here, what we could say is our new salt number would be a function of Reynolds number and Prantle number. And then finally, If the Grashof divided by the Reynolds number squared is much larger than one, that would be mainly free convection. And in that case, the new salt number is going to be a function of the Grashof number and the Prantle number. So those are some of the orders of magnitude analysis that you can do when you're looking at this. Uh, and finally, one thing to say, we, we did come up with a correlation or a relationship for the new salt number uh, for a vertically heated uh, constant temperature flat plate. Uh, but uh, typically what we often do is we will use empirical relationships. And the reason why we do this is because quite often the shapes aren't as simple as just being a vertical plate at a constant temperature. And the relationship that we use here is you'll know, see the subscript F denoting that you're evaluating the properties at the film temperature. So we use these coefficients C and M and uh, the film temperature is T infinity plus T wall divided by two or if you're using TS for the surface temperature and be divided by two, same thing. Uh, and another thing that we have here, C and M are in tables. So look in your heat transfer book and I'm sure you'll find them. And the final thing is, notice that in the equation here we have Grashoff times Prantle. That is a non-dimensional number that is often appearing when we're dealing with natural convection. And sometimes what happens is that that is combined together into a new non-dimensional number referred to as being the Rayleigh number. Heat transfer loves non-dimensional numbers. We have a lot of them in heat transfer. Uh, but it's the Grashof times the Prantle, and that gives us the Rayleigh number. And, and you'll see the Rayleigh number uh, quite often in correlations for uh, free or natural convection. So that's a bit of an order of magnitude analysis between uh, a free convection, forced convection, and combined free and forced convection. Uh, and, and it turns out that it is quite often difficult just to have pure free convection because you do often have 
uh, mechanical forcing, people walking by, there might be ventilation in a room or something like that. And so it, it can be challenging just to have natural or free convection. It, you usually are in this combined mode. But anyways, uh, what we've seen here is the way to be able to figure out orders of magnitude. Uh, and when either the uh, free uh, convection or forced convection would be applying. In this lecture, what we'll be doing is taking a look at some of the correlations that exist for various shapes uh, dealing with natural or free convection. So what we'll do, uh, we'll begin by looking at the case of an isothermal surface. So that would be a, uh, either a plate or a vertical cylinder that is at a fixed temperature. And if you recall from the last lecture, what we said is the analytical techniques uh, can only take us so far. And quite often when we're dealing with natural convection and we're dealing with either turbulent uh, or complicated geometries, we end up having to use empirical relations. And so that's pretty much what we'll be looking at in today's lecture. Uh, but the relationship that we often use is the following. So what we have here, we have the new salt number expressing the convective heat transfer in, in any of these natural convection cases. We have a length scale L and then finally what we have in the denominator with our new salt number is a thermal conductivity for the gas evaluated at F. So wherever you see the subscript F, that is referring to properties at the film temperature and the film temperature is the wall temperature plus the ambient temperature outside of our heated object. So outside the thermal boundary layer divided by two. And that's a common approximation that we saw for force convection boundary layers as well. Now, typically uh, what we have here in this part of the equation, we have the Grashoff number, Prandtl number. That combination, if you recall from the last segment, we said that that could be uh, clumped into what we call the Rayleigh number. Now, typically uh, what we have here, we, we have this coefficient m in the equation as well. And we have this value of C, and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, but to begin with, let's take a look at the coefficient or the power M that is in this equation. So typically M will be one quarter for laminar boundary layers on our heated vertical surface. So for free convection, the, the boundary layer, if it's laminar, M would be one for Now that is typical. And Remember we said that the way to determine whether or not we had laminar or turbulent depending upon the Rayleigh number or the Grashoff times the Prandtl number and if it was less than 10 to the 9 that is what we said would be a laminar boundary layer. Now if you have a turbulent boundary layer typically M would be on the order of one third. And you may find correlations that uh, are, are using the same sort of relationship, uh, but M does not meet that one quarter or one third for be it a laminar or a turbulent boundary layer. Uh, so just be aware that this is typically the case, but sometimes there'll be correlations that don't exactly match up to this. Um, now for turbulent, remember we said that the grashoff prandtl or the Rayleigh number, that would be greater than 10 to the nine. And I should put an approximate because we're on, on the order quite close to that. But uh, whenever you're dealing with transition, that number could be plus or minus a little bit. Uh, so that is a relationship that we sometimes use for natural convection. I should get rid of that because that might confuse you. It was grashoff prandtl that we had there for the, and then that is expressed as we said Rayleigh. Okay, so that is an expression that we will quite often find for free convection on a vertical surface. Now I had mentioned that you can use this for cylinders. It's under certain approximations that you can 
uh, use this relationship for a vertical cylinder. So we can treat a vertical cylinder as a flat isothermal plate if the ratio of the diameter to the length of that cylinder satisfies this relationship here. And so what this is getting at, it's basically saying if you have a very, very large cylinder and uh, the length would be the vertical here, the diameter would be there. Uh, but if you have a very, very large cylinder with, with a large diameter and you zoom in on what is happening in the boundary layer, uh, if it, we have this requirement here satisfied, uh, then we can basically approximate the boundary layer as being that just over a plain uh, flat plate and consequently we can use the flat plate relationship. So essentially what we're saying is that the curvature would have to be uh, not that significant for the cylinder that we're looking at and would have to satisfy the requirement that we have there. So what we're going to do now, let's take a look at some of the correlations. So we'll begin by looking at the values of C and M uh, for the uh, isothermal vertical flat plate. So we'll begin by looking at the case of uh, a laminar boundary layer. And remember what we're looking at here is new salt number, uh, which is Grashoff. Oops, I forgot the C. It would be C Grashoff. to the power m. So the value of c if we have laminar 0.59 and again this is going to vary you, you can look at any heat transfer book and you might find numbers that are a little different from this uh, and because what has happened people are fitting their experimental data uh, to this functional fit or this functional form and, and so there could be slight variability. Uh, if you have turbulent if you have turbulent flow, our coefficients are going to change. And we already said that M would be one third, but C would be 0 0.10. So those would be the values of C and M for a vertical flat plate in the case of it being isothermal, so constant temperature. And there are a couple of other relationships that exist, uh, and I will provide those now. So it, it's a one correlation. That this would be a single correlation, uh, and then this would be laminar and turbulent. So that is one single correlation that would cover both laminar and turbulent. Uh, and here you can see I've replaced the Grashoff parental with the Rayleigh number in the expression and the properties should be evaluated at the film temperature. Now taking a look at uh, a correlation that works only for the laminar flow regime. And so we have that correlation there. Uh, now, which one would you use? Well, it depends on if you have a turbulent uh, Grashoff uh, Prantle number, Rayleigh number greater than 10 to the 9. Uh, if it's less than 10 to the 9, then obviously use the laminar relationship because that will give you a more accurate result. And it is interesting to note um, in the first equation, what we have is Rayleigh number to the 2 sixth which is Rayleigh to the one third, which was the value M equals one third that we said for turbulent flow. And then in this relationship here, we have Rayleigh number to the one quarter, and that would correspond with our M equals one quarter. So it's consistent with the relationship that we saw earlier, the one with C, we had Grashoff Prantle to the M, which is C Rayleigh to the M. Essentially it's the same thing, but you can see there's a bit of a correction here for parental number effects, and that is what is in the denominator in these two relationships. Uh, but those are expressions that you can use for isothermal vertical flat plates. 
And it also works for a cylinder, provided that the curvature is not that strong in the cylinder. And we saw a relationship that enabled us to determine that. In the next segment, what we'll do, we'll move on to not isothermal, but we'll be looking at constant heat flux relationships for uh, the vertical flat plate. In this segment, what we'll be doing is taking a look at the natural or free convection on a vertical flat plate under the condition of constant heat flux. So in the previous segment, we had correlations for either laminar or turbulent, vertical flat plate, or very large diameter cylinders. And uh, those were all for isothermal flows. And, and in this case, with constant heat flux, uh, sorry, isothermal plate temperature, I should say. So the plate was at a, a fixed temperature, T wall or T surface. Uh, but here with constant heat flux, what we find is that the temperature of the plate will vary with position. And so we need a way to be able to deal with that. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this segment. So what we're going to be looking at, it turns out that you can use the vertical isothermal plate uh, equation, the correlation that we looked at in the last segment, for laminar flow. So there were two relations that we had for laminar flow. There's also a third one that extended between laminar and turbulent, but we'll look at, at the laminar one here. Um, assuming an isothermal wall temperature, so that's what we did in the previous segment, and a vertical flat plate. Now it turns out that you can approximate constant heat flux quite accurately or, or close enough uh, if you replace the temperature difference, because if you recall in any of the correlations that we were looking at, we have the Grashoff number times the Prandtl number, which is the Rayleigh number, and embedded within there is this temperature differential. Now when your wall temperature is constant, th this is easy to evaluate, but if the wall temperature is changing, as it would be in constant heat flux, as you go up the vertical surface, the temperature will change. We need a way to approximate that. And it turns out that you get good approximation if you take the temperature difference at the middle of the wall. So what are we looking at here? If this is our wall, uh, remember we had the X coordinate going in this direction, Y going in this direction. We have natural convection developing. So let's say that this is the length here. So that is the vertical extent of our wall. What we're looking at doing here is taking delta T at this point. And this point would be at L over two. So X equals L over two. So what we're looking for, we're trying to find this delta T at L over two. And it turns out that if we use this temperature and we bring that into our, uh, that would be the Grashoff parental number relationship which is also Rayleigh, uh, which we have embedded within that. We had the temperature wall minus the T infinity. If we replace this for that T wall minus T infinity in that expression, using the laminar expression, isothermal wall, vertical flat plate, we'll get a pretty good approximation. So what I'm going to do is we're going to spend this segment trying to figure out how to determine this delta T L over 2. So let's go through that now. And... So essentially what we're looking at is how do we approximate that? So the place that we're going to start, we're going to begin with Newton's law of cooling. And we've seen that before uh, many, many times in the course. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to express the heat transfer in watts per square meter. So I'm dividing both sides by the area. And then we have H and I'm going to call the temperature difference delta T. And for an isothermal plate, this is pretty easy because T wall doesn't change, T infinity doesn't change, but for constant heat flux, it does. And so we now have to resolve that because it will be a function of X. But from this, what I can do is I can write out that the convective heat transfer coefficient can be expressed as watts per square meter divided by our temperature differential delta T. 
So let's park that for a moment and we'll come back and use this equation in a moment when we look at the next part. And the next part, what we're going to do, remember I said that if you use the laminar relationship, so this is assuming that we would have laminar flow on our constant heat flux surface. And remember the requirements for that was grashoff prantzel which is equal to the Rayleigh number, would be 10 to the 9 or less. And so that was our approximation that we used for laminar flow. And with this, we saw relationships for the new salt number. We saw a number of different correlations, but this was the one that had these coefficients in it. And I'm just going to use this one uh, because what we are going to do in our analysis is just look at orders of magnitude and relationships between different variables. And I could have taken the more complex one, uh, but the bottom line here, what we're looking for is the fact that uh, X will be raised to the power one quarter as will delta T uh, due to that term there, which if you recall, that was the power that we said for laminar flow. If it was turbulent, that would be one third. And so that would be a little bit different. So with this, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to sub in uh, for the convective heat transfer coefficient here. We're going to use Newton's law of cooling from just what we looked at. So let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so we get this equation here. What I've done, I've subbed in for the Rayleigh number, the grashoff prantle This here is our convective heat transfer coefficient, H. And what I'm going to do, I want to come out with a relationship uh, from this equation between X and delta T. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging and we'll work towards this relationship between delta T and X. So what I've done here is I'm looking at the proportionality between the left-hand side and the right-hand side where we have X and delta T. And I've gotten rid of all the other variables that are here because we're, we're, we're looking at the trends and the relationships between X and delta T. So from this, I can reduce this a little bit further. And so we come up with this relationship here. We find that delta T is proportional to X to the power one-fifth. And what we're going to do we're going to look, and remember this is our vertical plate. X is going in this direction. Uh, this up here would be X equals L. Down here, this would be X equals zero. And we're interested in what is going on at X equals L over two. And of course, we have our thermal boundary layer and velocity boundary layer developing over this plate. And we're considering a case of constant heat flux. So what we have is we have a constant Q coming in, and that would be our Q double prime that we have coming into the wall. And so what I want to do, I want to evaluate delta T at some arbitrary X, and I will also want to evaluate delta T at L over two, because that's where we said, if we know that temperature difference, we can put it into the laminar correlation and then get the value for the convective heat transfer coefficient. So let's go ahead and do that. So now you notice I've put an equal sign in here, and that's because I've taken the relationship at two different places, and you would assume that the relationship, the constants would be pretty much the same. And I should probably put, the, this is a little bit of an approximation, but it's pretty close. Uh, what I want to do with this equation, I want to isolate for delta T L over 2, because that's what we're looking for here. So let's go through the process of doing that. So with this, we come up with an expression for delta T L over 2 as a function of delta T at some X location. And the X location would depend upon where you have information. So what we can write is that if you do know delta T at a certain X, So if you do know delta T at a certain X, for example, at X equals L, perhaps you know the temperature difference at that point. 
Uh, then you can determine delta T at L over 2, which you then put into your correlations, and you can evaluate the convective heat transfer coefficient and then the heat loss from this vertical surface. Now, uh, with that, uh, if you have a scenario where you do not know delta T at X, that would probably be one where you would need to guess that and then go through trial and error and iterations as we do in many other uh, heat transfer type problems. But if you do know the delta T, then you can go forward. And it's kind of a straightforward calculation. Once you get this value of delta T at L over 2, you then plug that into your new salt number relationship uh, for uh, the case of laminar isothermal vertical flat plate, and you can obtain the convective heat transfer coefficient. So that's how you handle the case of a vertical flat plate under constant heat flux conditions. <laughs>
And for the heated plate, you'll notice that I put it on the bottom because that is where the correlation would work for uh, the heated plate. So what we can say is for these two different scenarios of an inclined plate, now the correlations apply for the following. So the correlations that we've seen thus far will apply, and this is for the constant temperature plate. Now the cool plate, it will work only for the upper surface, so OK, and then down here, not OK, in terms of the correlation. And for the heated plate, correlation here would be OK, and then up here, not OK. So just keep that in mind. And then uh, the other thing is that it will only act over restricted angles. So what we're looking at here, theta is the angle that we're looking at. And it turns out that the correlation works obviously from zero degrees because that would be a vertical plate that we've looked at previously. But it goes from zero degrees and theta will go up to a max of 60 degrees. And when you get both beyond that, um, you start moving into what we would call a horizontal heated or cooled plate and, and the uh, fluid mechanics becomes different and the correlations break down. Uh, another thing that we do though, uh, when we use the correlations that we've looked at for uh, the heated vertical plate, uh, we make a substitution for the gravity constant or the gravitational constant and that substitution is g cos theta uh, under the either the top surface or the lower surface so in the Rayleigh number or the Grashoff number we have the gravitational constant we make that substitution so with that uh, which correlations will apply well any of the ones that we looked at for the vertical heated plate so I'll just write those out so uh, well I guess there was the one that we had um, with new salt number was equal to c times that was Grashoff Prantall and then we had it to m with the power there so that correlation would apply but also we had the more detailed and more accurate ones and so i'll write those out now so that's the correlation that applies if we have laminar flow and remember, within the Rayleigh number, we have the Grashoff number where the gravitational constant is, so we would make that substitution. And then if you have the other uh, correlation that extended uh, to laminar and turbulent, so this was the correlation that would pertain to a wider range of Rayleigh number. And this is with, again, G equals G cos theta. And theta ranging from 0 up to 60 degrees. So that is how you handle an inclined surface uh, over this angle range. And if you want to determine what is happening in terms of the connective heat transfer coefficient on the surfaces that we were not able to do, so essentially... Uh, on the hot plate on the upper surface and on the cool plate on the lower surface. If you're looking for correlations for that, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go into the literature and uh, look in journal articles to see if people have done experiments investigating those types of flow fields because these correlations will break down. They won't work there. Uh, the flow gets three-dimensional and a little bit more complex than what we can do with uh, the equations that we have here. So anyways, that, that is how we handle inclined surfaces with free convection. In this segment, what we'll be doing is taking a look at free convection from horizontal plates. And in what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at plates that could either be round in cross-section, 
uh, or they could be square or rectangular. And so with that, we first of all need to begin with a length scale that we would use to characterize uh, a horizontal plate. And so what I'll do is I'll give you a, a number that enables us to determine, or it's an equation, uh, that we can determine the characteristic length scale to use in our non-dimensional numbers. So this is a, an equation that we can use in determining the length scale that we'll use in our non-dimensional numbers. So that would be in the Neusselt number as well as in the Grashof number. They both have length scales. And, and so that would be the value of L that you would use in both of those equations. And notice that the area, that would just be for one side of whatever shape that we're looking at. And then it'd be divided by the perimeter. And this works for square, rectangular, and circular disks. So that is the characteristic length scale that we can use in, in the correlations. Uh, now what we need to do, very similar to the incline plate, it will depend upon uh, if the, uh, where, where the surface is either heated or if it's cooled and if it's an upper hot or lower hot. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to look at a couple of different conditions and we'll begin by looking at the case of the upper surface heated or the lower surface cooled. And it turns out that both of these scenarios result in similar fluid mechanics, although they're reversed. And I'll try to sketch that here. And so let's begin with a sketch of what the flow looks like around these plates. So what we have here, uh, on the left hand side, we have the case of upper hot. And we can see as the fluid on top of the plate heats, it moves up and in the process through the continuity equation, we know that we're going to have entrainment of cooler fluid around the outside. And that's what I've sketched there. And then in the case of a lower cold surface, we have that on the right what we have the fluid on the bottom is cooling and therefore it becomes more dense and it will descend and in the process we will have again entrainment of fluid and i've shown these columns just to basically show that we have a separated flow or clumps it's a three-dimensional flow field um, and and that would be the the scenario of the flow that you would have if it's either an upper heated or a lower cooled and with that we have correlations that pertain to these types of flows uh, dependent upon whether the Rayleigh number would be in the laminar regime or if it would be in a more turbulent regime actually it'd be kind of uh, there, there's a range it's not the exact same number that we had before for 10 to the 9 it's actually 10 to the 7 uh, but let me sketch out or write out what those uh, relationships are the correlations between the new salt and the Rayleigh number Okay, so there we have our two different correlations and uh, the the first one here You'll notice that we have the Rayleigh number raised to the power of one quarter and Before when we were looking at the correlations We said that that would be an indication of laminar flow and although the Rayleigh number uh, It doesn't it's not 10 to the 9 like we saw before it's a little lower But still that would be an indication of, of more of a laminar like flow and then as the Rayleigh number increases, the uh, exponent on the Rayleigh number goes to one third. So that again could be construed as being more of a turbulent type of a regime for the flow. So that is the case of upper hot, lower cold. Now let's look at the flip side of that, where if we have the lower surface hot and the upper side cold, So again, what we have here on the uh, left-hand side, this would be a case where the lower surface was hot. 
looking at it, and I think I drew this in the wrong location. Let me flip that around. So the lower is hot. And then on the right hand side, that would be a case where the upper is cold. And so what we can see is when the lower is hot, what is happening is the fluid is moving up due to uh, the fact that it's becoming heated on the underside and then that entrains cooler fluid from below and then we would get kind of a jetting of a fluid going up on the left and right hand side and when the upper surface is cool again what it's going to do is it's going to entrain fluid down it's going to cool and then it's going to come along and that will be more dense fluid and it will move downwards and so that would be upper cold on the right and with that, when you look fluid mechanically, these do look similar. They just flip from one another. And consequently with that, we can write out the new salt number relationship. It would pertain to either of these, and it would be the following. And here, uh, this would apply from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 9. So that uh, we have to the power 1 fifth, but I would assume that that would be more of a laminar type flow that we're looking at. And, and we don't have the, the clumps of three dimensionality like we saw in the other one. And that's probably why this would be viewed more as a laminar type flow. So anyways, that is the correlations for free convection from horizontal plates for different conditions, either heated uh, oh, you know what? I think I goofed that up. This here, TS, should be on this side. And then over here, we said that lower was cold and consequently TS should be there. So the lower surface was the part that was cooled. So we would assume that that was a cooled surface. And then here, we would assume that that was a heated surface. And then for this other one, uh, the hot surface was down here. And the cold surface was up here. And so I apologize about that. Hopefully it's not too confusing. Uh, but you would have the, the heating either being on the upper or the lower surface. And you get different fluid mechanic and heat transfer correlations coming out of that. So anyways, that is how you handle the case of free convection from horizontal plates. We're now going to take a look at a couple of uh, different shapes with free convection. We're going to begin by looking at a horizontal cylinder and then we'll look at the correlation for a sphere. So uh, what we're doing, uh, very similar to the vertical plate that we've looked at before, we're considering the case of isothermal surface, so an isothermal cylinder. And just like the other ones we've looked at, properties will be evaluated at the film temperature. And the correlations, there are a couple of different correlations that exist for horizontal uh, isothermal cylinders. Uh, the first one is the relationship with the Rayleigh number. And here I denote the subscript F for properties evaluated at the film temperature. D is the diameter of the cylinder. And what we have is C, and I guess we could do Grashoff Prantl to the N. I'll do M, it doesn't matter. Uh, or you could do C, Rayleigh number based on diameter to the M. And here C and M are from tables. I'm not going to go through what the values are. Uh, any heat transfer book, uh, you can probably find those values. So that is one correlation similar to what we saw for the vertical plate. And we also do have a relationship that applies. Uh, and so let me give that correlation. And this one applies over a wide range of uh, 
Rayleigh numbers. And looking at this form, it is very, very similar to what we saw for the vertical isothermal plate where we had uh, the either the laminar or the turbulent uh, correlation. Uh, functionally very similar, Rayleigh to the one-sixth and then squares, so that gives us one-third. So that gives an indication that this one will apply to a turbulent uh, layer on uh, the cylinder. And when you look at it, what's going to happen? We have a cylinder and it will have a stagnation point here but then we're going to get this film coming up and around and that is where the heated fluid is and so it's going to depend on the differential in terms of what the nature of that flow is going to look like uh, but essentially that's kind of what the streamlines would look like if you were to look at the cylinder and the diameter here d and then t wall would be t wall or sometimes ts those are the same and then out here we have T infinity, the free stream temperature. So that is the case of the cylinder. Now let's take a look at a sphere. And for spheres, uh, for the case of a sphere, you know, the correlation that we have, this one looks a little bit more like the laminar one. So let me write it out. And so there's the correlation, and this applies for Rayleigh number based on diameter less than or equal to 10 to the 11. So not exactly the 10 to the 9 that we saw for the vertical flat plate. And parental number air and above, so 0 0.7, so anything above 0 0.7. Uh, and you'll notice the reason why I say that this is similar to the laminar is because we have the power of the 1 fourth on the Rayleigh number. And that was what we saw for the vertical plate. Uh, we, we saw with the power 1, 4, that typically indicated that the correlation was for laminar flow. When we look here, uh, 10 to the 11, that's uh, close to 10 to the 9 that we had for the flat plate. But anyways, uh, now what would the flow field look like here? Uh, just sketching it. It would be very similar to what we just saw uh, for the cylinder. Uh, so you're going to have a stagnation point there, and then the flow is going to come up and around. And depending upon the temperature differential, you're going to have slightly different isotherms and streamlines coming along. Uh, T infinity is out here. And then obviously we're assuming that this is a constant surface temperature around the perimeter of our sphere. So those are two correlations, horizontal cylinder and a sphere. Okay, so in this lecture we've looked at a lot of different correlations. Uh, what we're now going to do, we're going to solve an example problem and that will be for the isothermal vertical flat plate. So let me write out the problem statement. Okay, so what we have, we have a, a fireplace with a glass door, a fire screen, so that is what contains the fire uh, within the, the fireplace itself. And we're told that the height of this glass screen is 0.71 meters by a width of 1.02 meters. We're told that it gets up to 232 degrees C, so it's very hot. Uh, and the room temperature, the ambient room temperature is 23 degrees C, and then we're told to estimate the convection heat transfer uh, from the fireplace uh, to the room. And so uh, let's begin by going through the process of writing out what we know and what we're looking for. So that's what we know and what we're trying to find is we're trying to find Q due to convective heat transfer. Okay, so let's begin with a schematic of what we're looking at. Okay, so we have our fire 
the surface temperature is TS and we have the dimensions here and this is where we have to be careful to make sure that we get the right dimension for the vertical extent or height and so that is L uh, whenever we're dealing with a vertical flat plate with natural convection and the width We'll assign W, and that is 1.02 meters. And out here we have our ambient fluid. And so that is going to be moving adjacent to, you know what I'll do. I'm not going to put those arrows. Really the only place we would see that is right up next to the fire screen. But uh, This is cool. It is 23 degrees C. So what's going to happen is we're going to get the boundary layer growing on there. Okay, so this is obviously a case of natural convection. We don't know if it is a laminar boundary layer or a turbulent boundary layer on the vertical surface. We're assuming that it's a constant temperature, and so we'll use the isothermal relationships for constant temperature. So, uh, another thing that we're going to assume is that the room itself, there really is no bulk motion of the fluid. So the only thing driving the fluid is going to be the natural convection, which is going to occur right along this surface here. So in reality, is it going to be a uniform screen temperature? Probably not, but that will be the assumption that we're making here. Uh, the other one is that the room is quiescent, or the room air. Remember that means that there is no bulk motion of the fluid in the air. Okay, so where do we begin? Well, we have an indication that this is going to be natural convection on a vertical flat plate, isothermal, so that gives us a hint where to look. Uh, but whenever we're doing these place uh, problems, the first thing to do is to evaluate the properties. And for this particular case, for a vertical isothermal plate with natural convection, we know that we evaluate the properties at the film temperature. For this case, it's 127.5. Uh, it comes out to 400K. So going into the tables of your book, uh, uh, hopefully you don't have to do interpolation at 400K. That always makes the problems more interesting and more enjoyable. I'm joking. KF. And finally, beta. Beta we can get directly. Uh, I'll put it there. But it's 1 over the film temperature. We don't have to go to the tables for that. That's if we're dealing with air. And so that gives us that value. Okay, so we have our properties. The next thing that we're going to want to do, we'll look at the correlation that we're going to use, and we'll want to calculate the Rayleigh number, the grashoff prandtl number, in order to determine uh, if we are in the laminar flow regime or in the turbulent flow regime. And for this particular problem, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the correlation, I'll write it out here, I'm going to use the one with the C and the M. So what we need to do, uh, we don't know what C is, nor do we know what M is. That's unknown and that's unknown. We need to evaluate this to determine if we're dealing with the laminar or with the turbulent flow. So let's go ahead and evaluate the Grashoff number and then the Rayleigh number. So when we do that, we get 1.88 times 10 to the 9, and that is greater than 10 to the 9, and therefore we're dealing with a turbulent flow. So you could either use the more involved uh, correlation for turbulent flow, or you could find the values of C and M for turbulent. We said C would be 1.10. And M, remember we said, was one-third. It's one-quarter if it's laminar. It's one-third if it's turbulent. And C would change as well if it was laminar. So with that, what we can do, we can come back to this equation here. We have everything that we need in this equation. 
in order to evaluate, first of all, either the new salt number or directly the value of the connected heat transfer coefficient. So with that, we can evaluate H, and this would be the average value of H across our fire screen. And we get 5.85 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And just realize when you're dealing with natural convection, that, that's typical, you'll get numbers uh, between two and maybe seven or eight. Uh, so five, five to six uh, gives us an idea that this is a natural convection type problem. Uh, numbers much higher, 50, 60. If you're getting a number like that and you're dealing with natural convection, you might want to think about it a little bit more because it may be incorrect. Uh, but just th this is the right ballpark range that we should be expecting. So with this, the, the question, remember, asked us to determine what is the convective heat transfer uh, from the fire screen. And so with that, we can then just use Newton's law of cooling. And when you plug in values here, we get convective heat transfer equals 886.03 watts. So that's good. We've solved the problem. We've been able to determine the value of the heat transfer. Now, a question that we could ask, remember that this fire screen was at 232 degrees C. And if you've ever sat next to a fireplace, uh, you are benefiting from both the natural convection that is coming off of the, uh, the fire screen. You're also benefiting from radiation. We have radiative heat transfer going on. So let's check and see what about radiation. They didn't give us anything about the emissivity of the fire screen. I'm just going to assume that it's one. Uh, obviously it would be lower than that, but that's just going to be a starting point. And so I'm putting an emissivity of one, the area. the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And then remember when you're dealing with radiation, these temperatures need to be in Kelvin. And with that, we get that the radiative heat transfer, assuming an emissivity of one, is quite high. It's actually higher than our convective heat transfer. So that is an indication that in order to solve this problem, we really should be taking into account the fact that we have radiative heat transfer as well. Uh, and the amount of radiation that's coming off would be a little lower because we've assumed emissivity to be one, which is a little bit on the uh, optimistic side because it would be lower than that. But anyways, what it does, is it demonstrates that radiation would also be important in this problem, not just natural convection. So that's an example problem involving natural convection from a vertical isothermal plate. Up until now, we've been looking at free convection in rather open spaces where the fluid is unconstrained. Uh, but what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to take a look at free convection within enclosed spaces. So uh, for these applications, the fluid is confined and, and consequently it is an enclosed space and it is restricted in terms of where it can go. So when we're looking at free convection in enclosed spaces, essentially what we're looking at is two surfaces. They could be vertical or they could be horizontal, uh, where there's a temperature differential between those two surfaces and there is a fluid uh, between the two surfaces. And, and that fluid, uh, due to natural convection, can heat up and it can be put into motion. And so that's what we'll be looking at. Uh, when we look at free convection in enclosed spaces. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin by looking at three different geometries, two horizontal and one vertical. So let me sketch those out and then we'll discuss them.
so what we have here are three different geometries, uh, two of them horizontal and one vertical. And these are the plates that are either heated or cooled. And I've indicated the temperature is blue would be a cooler surface, red would be hotter. And there is a fluid in the space between these two uh, plates, be them horizontal or vertical. So let's begin and take a look at what is happening over here in the case of bottom heating. Now, what is going to happen with bottom heating is the fluid adjacent to the wall is going to heat up. And when it heats up, it will become less dense and consequently becomes buoyant and it moves upwards. And so it'll move up like this. And when it gets up near the upper wall, it starts to cool. And when it begins to cool, it becomes more dense and consequently it then starts to descend. And what we then find, that's not a very good arrow, let me redo that. Uh, what we then find is we get these cells developing, and, and we refer to those as being convective cells that exist within the enclosed space. And so that's what happens with bottom heating. And uh, there, there's a certain temperature differential before that begins to take place. Uh, below it, it won't take place, and we'll be talking about that in the next segment. Uh, now looking at vertical space, so this might be something like the cavity between windows uh, or in the cavity of a wall of a house where you have studs and then drywall and uh, plywood on the outside. And what is happening again, the fluid on the right hand side surface here is going to heat up and it's going to move. But we usually with a cavity, we're going to have some sort of confinement at the top and the bottom. And consequently, the fluid can't hit the top. It's going to have to start to come around. And when it comes around, it comes against this wall, which is now at a lower temperature, and it becomes more dense, and then it descends down to the bottom. But it can't hit the bottom. It's got to turn again. And when it starts to turn, it starts to come back up. And that is the convective cell that develops within a vertical cavity. And then finally, let's look at the last one here over on the right hand side. And here we have the case where the heated plate is on the top and the cool plate is on the bottom. And this one, nothing exciting happens. It's just straight conduction. And that's because this is uh, what we refer to as being stably stratified. And, and so we go just from hot down to cool and that follows uh, straight conduction going through that. So the fluid does not go into motion when you have a stably stratified system like the one on the right. So with that, th those are the three different geometries that we're going to be looking at in this lecture. Uh, and when we're dealing with this, we have a Grashof number and the Grashof number with the characteristic length is L. And L in all of those cases, hopefully I did that. No, I didn't put it here. Let me put it there. L, sometimes you'll see delta depending on the, the textbook. Sometimes they'll use a, a, a delta there, but that can get confusing because that's what we said was the boundary layer thickness. So uh, we're going to use L here. L is the separation between the two plates and expressing that as a Grashof number. And then the temperature difference is going to be the hot surface minus the cooler surface. The length scale is L. And then we divide that by our kinematic viscosity, which is squared. New salt number, uh, that is going to be evaluated, again, using L as the characteristic length scale. And then through this, we have, through Fourier's law, the double prime would be watts per square meter. Uh, and then it would just be H times T1 minus T2. So what we're going to be doing in this lecture is we're going to be finding ways, just like we've been doing with all the others, to estimate H. And we'll do that using Grashof number, Rayleigh number, uh, New Salt number, things like that. So uh, that is free convection in enclosed spaces. What we'll be doing in the next segment is we'll begin with the horizontal, uh, where we either have bottom heating or top heating, and we'll take a look at that flow field.
So in this segment, what we're going to do, we're going to take a closer look at the configurations uh, where we have enclosed space and uh, we either have heating on the top or heating on the bottom. So let's take a look at those. So we said there are three different geometries, two horizontal, one vertical. We'll focus in on the two horizontal ones. Uh, we'll begin with the less interesting of the two, where you have a stably stratified flow field. And so here is a case where the upper surface is heated. So T1 is hotter than the lower surface, which is cool. And so we have a quiescent thermally stratified fluid, meaning that uh, the fluid is not in motion. And if we were to go in and measure temperature profiles, we would find that the temperature profiles would be constant as at a given uh, vertical position. So as you move across horizontally, the temperature would not change. Gravity vector here is pointing in the downward direction. And the condition under which this would exist would be Grashoff Prantl less than 1708. And for this condition, the new salt number is going to be equal to 1. And if we remember HL over K, uh, what that is telling us is that H is just equal to K over L. And if we recall Fourier's law, we had H times we had T1 minus T2. So this is essentially plugging in the H value. We get K over L times T1 minus T2. That looks very much like Fourier's law. Remember Fourier's law when we had K dt by dx? Well, that's essentially what we're getting here. We have T1 minus T2 divided by the L, so that would be the gradient of the temperature. So that, that is uh, why we have the new salt number equal to 1. Uh, for the thermally stratified fluid. So that one is only so interesting. Uh, now the next one, when we go above that critical Grashoff number of 1,708, the fluid starts to go into motion, and that's where it gets kind of neat. So here we get a cellular flow pattern. Remember we said that the fluid will be heated on the bottom, it will then ascend up, it gets cooled once it gets up to the top and then it descends back down. And we then get these convective cells developing. And depending upon the geometry of, of the uh, cavity that we're looking at, we can get slightly different types of cells developing. So you get a pattern like that forming. And this is the case for T1 greater than T2. And here, uh, this condition would exist for grashoff Prantl greater than 1,708, and the new salt number would be greater than 1. It's no longer 1, it's going to be greater than 1. And this cellular pattern that we're looking at here, it actually has a name, and it's referred to as being the Rayleigh-Bernard convection cells. And so let's just uh, take a look at that. So Rayleigh-Bernard convection cells, and those are the uh, cells that exist between the uh, two the horizontal plates with the heated surface at the bottom. Now, what we can do, we can do a little experiment here. And so let's say you have a container that has a hot fluid in it. And if you take something like a Petri dish and you put it on the top, and in the petri dish you fill it with a little bit of water you have something like that uh, we would then have a condition where we have a free surface here and if we were able to look at this from the side and, and do a cross section uh, we would have cells that are forming and depending upon the geometry uh, you'll get slightly different cells but that each cell would have fluid coming up and down. And these are the Rayleigh-Bernard convection cells that we would see.
So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do this experiment. And, and so what I did is I used the infrared camera and I took a bowl of hot water. And here we can see there is the bowl of hot water. The one on the right is actually hotter. Uh, I put a lot of boiling water in there uh, out of a kettle. And then I put a Petri dish with cool water in it. I'm putting a little bit of cool water in the one on the left there. And then we just watch what happens with time. Now I've sped this up. And so you'll see the Rayleigh Bernard convection cells start to appear. And, and they're really quite neat. And they're, they're a little distorted there because I had a little bit of motion in the fluid. But the one on the right is much hotter. And you can see the evolution of the cells is drastically different from what we're seeing on the left. On the left, we have uh, cells that aren't really merging. But on the right, we get this supercell forming. And, and that's just due to the fact that the water was quite hot underneath. And there you can see I pour in some cold water now, and that mixes it. Now let's zoom in on what's happening with the one on the left. That was a lower temperature differential. This is over longer time. And you can see the cells starting to reassemble. They're merging. They're moving around. Uh, th this was probably about half an hour that, that I took this video clip from. Uh, and then you remove the uh, petri dish and you can see the cells in the bowl of water in the bottom and they start to go through a new transformation. So that's kind of neat to, to be able to see the Rayleigh Bernard convection cells in that configuration. Uh, I did do another experiment where the petri dish was not perfectly level and, and so the gravity vector was a little bit out of kilter and it's kind of interesting to watch what happens there. So let's move into that video clip. So here we can see I'm pouring in some boiling water into the, well, it's not boiling, but it's very close to boiling, into the bowl from below, and you see some mixing going on there. Uh, we'll speed up the mixing just that we can ensure that it's kind of uniformly mixed hot water in the bottom. And then we put the Petri dish on the top. And this is one where it was a little tilted, and, and I said the gravity vector was a little bit off. So watch what happens. We get a hot cell forming at the top, and it assimilates all of the other Bernard, Rayleigh Bernard convection cells. It's kind of eating them. And uh, it's kind of a neat thing to watch. Uh, at least it was neat for me. I hope it's neat for you as well. Uh, anyways, that, that is Rayleigh Bernard convection. You pull it away again, you can see a cellular pattern in the bowl and they change with time uh, due to a change in boundary condition. I put in some more hot water. So uh, those are Rayleigh Bernard convection cells. And now, we do have a correlation for the bottom heating, and so uh, this would be a case where we have two solid surfaces, so this would be hot, and this would be cool, and we said T1 was hot, T2 was cool, and the correlation for bottom heating is as follows. So this would not be with the free surface. We would have a surface on the top. So that's the correlation. It applies over this range of Rayleigh number. And in this, the properties are evaluated at the average temperature. So that's either T bar or T average, but that's defined as being T1 plus T2 divided by 2. So that's a correlation uh, for the case of a horizontal enclosed space uh, with the bottom hot and the top cool. In the next segment, what we'll do, we'll move into looking at vertical confined spaces or enclosed spaces with natural convection. <laughs> Okay, we're continuing looking at free convection enclosed spaces, and now what we're going to do, we're going to consider the case where we have enclosed vertical space. Okay, so when we have enclosed vertical space, what we're going to do, um, let, let's assume first of all that this here is insulated. 
as is this and consequently there is no heat transfer in those surfaces but what happens the fluid heats up uh, we were saying earlier and then it gets to the top by continuity it has to turn uh, it has to go somewhere and then it gets near this wall and it starts to cool and it goes down and we get this circular pattern developing and that is our convection cell uh, and that leads to enhanced heat transfer over if you have no fluid motion within the cavity at all. Uh, example applications where we can find this are the following. So example applications, double pane windows. And, and so with double pane windows, sometimes they'll put a gas uh, that has lower thermal conductivity inside of the cavity. Uh, but it is the process of having these convective cells in the double pane that actually leads to increased heat loss, be, uh, be it uh, heat loss in the winter in northern climates or it could be heat coming in in warmer climates if you have air conditioning on the inside. Uh, wall cavities, that's another area and that is why we put insulation in the walls of our homes. Uh, the purpose of putting the insulation there First of all, the insulation, the glass fiber is typically low thermal conductivity, but it also prevents the air from being able to go uh, either through the wall in the case of cold drafts from outside, but also the convective cells that might develop in the wall cavity. And then finally, solar collectors, that's another example, but here you would have your solar collector at an, at an angle, uh, but you can have convective cells that are developing within uh, solar collectors. This would be a case of solar thermal collection, not solar photovoltaic. Uh, solar thermal where we have some sort of working fluid within the solar collector itself. So those are example applications. Now it turns out the correlations, there are a number of different ones, uh, and the correlations vary by the aspect ratio. Now the aspect ratio here is defined as being H over L and so you can imagine if H over L is 1 we're looking at a square cavity and if H over L another aspect ratio let's say it's 10 and this was 1 if it was 10 that would mean that we would have it'd be 10 times the width and so that would be 1 there in 10 this is one to one so that would be the aspect ratio of one so a window aspect ratio will be very very high because windows tend to be uh, very large tall and, and not much of a gap between them uh, but other applications may have a lower aspect ratio so that will have an influence on the new salt number so let's take a look at the correlations now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to write them out for uh, either small aspect ratio cases or for larger aspect ratio so we'll begin with small aspect ratio Okay, so if you have small aspect ratio, so remember we said that that would be something like a square to something like that, where this would be 10 times that. There it's one to one. So if you have small aspect ratio, these are the different correlations that you use, and there's restrictions there in terms of the Prandtl number and the Grashof number. Okay, so those are the equations that you can use to calculate the uh, convective heat transfer coefficient for an enclosed vertical space where you have a cavity. Now, if you have larger aspect ratios, like you might have in the case of a double pane window, and the correlations are a little different. Okay, so different correlations that exist uh, for the case of larger aspect ratios. So things that you might find, as I said, in double pane windows. And those are the relations that exist, again, for different uh, Rayleigh numbers, different Rayleigh number ranges, and different Prandtl numbers. So that is how to handle uh, enclosed vertical spaces. And what we're going to be doing in the last segment of this lecture, we're going to be working an example problem 
uh, that uses one of the correlations for an enclosed vertical space. We're now going to work an example problem for an enclosed vertical space. And the problem that we're going to look at is that of a double pane window. Okay, and so there's our problem statement. What we have is we have a window uh, that is 0 0.8 meters high, it's double pane, and uh, we have two temperatures that we know. We know a temperature on one side and the other, and we're looking to determine the heat transfer through the window, and we're also looking for the R value. So in order to solve this problem, and we're told that the uh, a fluid in the window pane is air in the gap between the two window panes is air and atmospheric pressure. Sometimes you can reduce the pressure within the gap to reduce the density, which then reduces the amount of uh, natural convection taking place. But in this case, we're told that it is at atmospheric pressure. So let's begin this problem by writing out what we know. So that is what is known, and then what we're looking for, we want to find the heat transfer through the window. And we're also looking for the R value. Okay, so to begin this problem, what we're going to do, we're going to go and we're going to get the properties and the properties for this, uh, we're going to be using one of the correlations for uh, natural convection and vertical cavities. And for those, the properties were evaluated at the average temperature. So the properties here. At TAV. So 280 Kelvin. So going into the property table and looking up the values for error. So those are all the properties uh, that we may be using for this problem. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to write out a schematic. The schematic is not too complex for this. Basically, it's just the schematic that we looked at earlier for vertical cavities. We're told T1, T2, T1 is greater than T2, and the gap here is L, and that was 2 centimeters, and we know that there is air in here. So for the analysis, what we're going to do, we're going to begin by determining the Grashof number, and then from that we'll get the Rayleigh number. Uh, and then we'll determine which correlation we can use based on the Rayleigh number. So let's begin that. And so it turns out the aspect ratio is 40, and that's to be expected because we're dealing with a very, very tall window, and the gap between the two panes is quite minimal. Uh, that's a horrible <laughs> looking window. Uh, let me just not even do that. Okay, so we know that it's a window. Uh, it's very tall, very narrow aspect ratio of 40. Uh, the Rayleigh number here, Grashoff times the Prantl number, we have 1 times 10 to the 4. So looking back at the previous lecture, you'll be able to find the correlation. There are two that we can use. I'm going to use one that's a little bit more complex. And so with that, we have the new salt number. 
So we can plug in the values and what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the K over and the L over. So I'm going to isolate for H on the right hand side. I'll write out explicitly what all the values are. Now the parental number that we're using here, I believe the correlation said that it would apply for parental numbers greater than one. Uh, let me double check that. Yeah, we did say the parental number would be greater than 1, but 0.7, it's close enough. This is heat transfer. Um, you it, it will use that. <laughs> it's probably fine. Uh, and that's all that we have at our disposal to solve this. So that's what we're going to do. So with that, uh, what do we get? We get H is equal to 1.73 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And Q, we wanted to find out the heat transfer coming through this. We use Newton's law of cooling. Temperature difference is the hot minus the cool. Plug in the values. So 27.68 watts is what is flowing through this window. Now let's look at that uh, Q double prime or Q over A. 17.3 watts per meter squared. And we are now going to use that in determining the R value. So this is the first part of the problem and getting Q. The second part is the R value. So let's go on and take a look at that. And if you recall, we looked at this a long time ago in the course, a uh, much earlier lecture. But we had said that the R value in SI is delta T divided by Q over A. So here we know those values. So you get an R value of 0.578. And now let's put this into context of the R value that you would read if you, uh, or you would see if you went to a hardware store. And if you recall, we said you take the value, the R value SI, and you multiply by 5.679. And so with that, we get an R value of 3.28, which is pretty low. Because typically, uh, typical walls... You have an insulated wall, you could have R12, R16, R20, and here we have R3.28, and, and so therefore windows, and no real surprise here, windows are not great insulators. So what do we do about that? Well, there are a couple of things you can do. You can put different gases in the gap of the window. So sometimes argon gas they'll use or different things like that. You can lower the pressure, which I said earlier, although your window might implode, probably not something you want to do. Uh, although they're incredibly heavy, you can get triple pane windows. And so the triple pane windows, you would have one convective cell here. Uh, we'll be going like that. And then you'd have another convective cell on the other, but uh, it, it would be reduced. And so you're significantly reducing the amount of heat transfer that goes through. They're very expensive, very thick, very heavy, but triple pane windows is another way of, of bumping up the R value for a window. So anyways, that is looking at uh, the case of enclosed vertical space. And we looked at an example of a window. We use the correlation. We determine the heat loss and the R value. And, that will conclude our coverage of natural convection flows. We're now going to take a look at a form of convective heat transfer whereby the uh, fluid adjacent to our surface is going through a phase change. 
And, and so that could be going from a liquid to a vapor, in which case we call it boiling, or we could be going from a vapor back to a liquid, in which case we would call it, call it condensation. Uh, we're going to begin in the next uh, couple of lectures here looking at boiling heat transfer. And what we're going to find is that the values of the convective heat transfer coefficients for phase changes are very, very large because there's a lot of energy associated with that. Uh, but th this is a very important area industrially because we have many, many systems, be it refrigerators or uh, rank and power cycles where we have uh, vapor power cycles or vapor refrigeration cycles where we go through a phase change from liquid to uh, vapor and then vapor back to a liquid. So very important for engineering. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at the boiling processes in this lecture in the next one. So to begin with, what is boiling? Well, boiling, uh, we know it, it's when we're going from a liquid to a vapor, but there are certain conditions that must be met. And, and so let me just write those out and then we'll discuss them. Okay, so there is the description of boiling, and what is happening with boiling is uh, we have a solid-liquid interface, and the solid, so the wall temperature, the surface temperature, needs to exceed the saturation temperature of the liquid at the liquid pressure. So if you recall from thermodynamics, we use steam tables in order to determine what the saturation temperature would be for a given pressure. And that's what we'll be doing again in heat transfer. We'll be looking at uh, steam tables in order to pull out properties. And we'll be looking at the heat of vaporization that is uh, going through the phase change uh, from a liquid to a vapor. So boiling, we're, we're going from a liquid to a vapor. And when we look at boiling heat transfer, I mentioned that the convective heat transfer values are very, very large, and we'll see that both for boiling and condensation. Uh, but to describe, we just use Newton's law of cooling like we've done before. Now, for our delta T, we're going to have our surface temperature, our wall temperature, and the other temperature is going to be the saturation temperature. So typically, uh, it will make sense. You have to have the wall higher at a, a higher temperature than the saturation temperature in order to have boiling take place. And so that is the delta T that we will use. And given that we see this so many times, uh, we give this a name. So we label this Tw minus T sat as being the excess temperature. So if you're looking at plots in a book on uh, boiling heat transfer, sometimes you'll see delta Tx, sometimes you'll see delta Pe, E denoting excess. And what that is showing is T wall minus T sat, or that could be T surface minus T sat, depending upon the book that you're using. Uh, so what are we looking for here? Well, as with all of the other things that we've been doing, when we've looked at convective heat transfer, we want to know how to estimate H. So what we are after, or what we are interested in, is estimating H. But before we jump into the correlations that are used for boiling heat transfer, what I want to do is begin by looking at the physics of what is going on uh, through the boiling process. And what we're going to do, we're going to begin with an experiment that everybody studying heat transfer should do, and, and that is to take a pot of water, put it on top of a stove, and watch the water boil. And, and this is something that I did years ago when I took heat transfer, uh, and that's what we're going to do right now. We, we get to repeat the experiment. So uh, what we have here is a video, and it's going to get a little loud because boiling is not a quiet process, but... Uh, and I sped it up, don't worry, we're not going to be waiting 15 minutes for water to boil, it's going to go a little quicker. Uh, but there you can see a pot, we have the infrared camera on the lower left, and all of a sudden you can see natural convection cells starting to form there on the IR camera. And then if you look from the side view, you can see the index of refraction variations, you have natural convection going on. Uh, what I'm doing every minute, I pull out about 5 seconds of video here. 
And, and so we're watching time evolve relatively quickly. There you can see the natural convection more evident in the pot. Uh, we have more mixing on the IR camera because it's a more uniform temperature. And, and there are little bubbles that are coming out, but we're not boiling yet. So th those could just be air bubbles that are attached to the surface. Um, but, but that will become important as we watch the process. So let's continue observing what's going on. And then we have the top view camera in the upper left where we can see from the top. There's a little bit of steam coming out there. Uh, but as we move on, noise is going to start. So we start getting noise coming in here. And what that noise is caused by are bubbles forming at nucleation sites on the surface, and then they collapse, and it's that collapsing process that we hear. And now we're going to go to high-speed video. And, and so what we can see are bubbles that are forming on the surface, and they're trying to move up, but the, the, the fluid is at a cooler temperature, and the bubble uh, through heat transfer collapses. It doesn't have enough energy to make it to the top. And, and then some bubbles get a little further, so this is a little later in time. And, and you can see some bubbles ascending a little higher, but still they're collapsing. The, the cooling temperature is not hot enough in order to sustain the bubbles going to the surface. And as we go on and on in time, uh, we're going to start to see here the bubbles are starting to make it to the surface. And so there you can see the odd bubble making it to the surface. And as we wait a little bit longer, we get more boiling occurring. Uh, and there we have more and more bubbles. You see the surface is moving around quite a bit. Uh, and then finally, we're going to have full saturated cool boiling coming here. And there you can see all the bubbles making it to the surface, vapor coming out. Uh, and so that would be full boiling taking place, saturated cool boiling. Uh, prior to that, it was subcooled because we weren't at a high enough temperature. And there you can see the IR camera. Uh, as the bubbles come to the surface, we get pockets of a very hot fluid, and, and that's the uh, more yellow temperature in the red mix that we're looking at. And, and so that is a video describing boiling. And, and so you might want to do that if you have some time, go and, and put a, a pot on the stovetop and, and watch the bubbles form and then watch the boiling take place because that will help you as we go on into the next segments here throughout this lecture, looking at the different processes that occur uh, within boiling heat transfer. But what we saw in the video there, uh, at the beginning we saw subcooled pool boiling. And this was where we had bubbles that were forming, uh, but then they would shrink and they would, uh, after a while, they would collapse. So this is our free surface up here. And, and so that was subcooled pool boiling because temperature of the liquid is less than the saturation temperature. And so the bubbles lose energy as they move up. Uh, the other thing that we saw uh, later on, we saw saturated pool boiling. And here again, this is our stove top, our solid surface. And we have our liquid. Now in this case, what was happening is the bubbles were forming and they were able to make it to the surface. And then we had the vapor coming out of the surface. And this was where T liquid was approximately equal to the saturation temperature at the atmospheric pressure. This experiment was conducted uh, at an atmospheric pressure around 89 kPa, but that's not a big deal. It doesn't really matter. You get the same sort of effects uh, in terms of the visualization of it. So that is the difference between subcooled pool boiling, which is what we saw earlier, and then saturated pool boiling. But we'll look at this in more detail. Uh, in the next couple of segments as we study the aspects of boiling and boiling heat transfer. We're now going to take a look at the different types of boiling modes that can exist. So in the last segment, what we did is we looked at water boiling on top of, uh, on a stovetop. And essentially what we were watching there was pool boiling because we were not forcing the fluid in any way. 
if you recall at the beginning the process started with natural convection so pool boiling is one mode of boiling that can exist or that we can have So pool boiling, that is where we have a quiescent fluid, very much like what we had on the stovetop with what we just looked at. And what happens there, so there's our uh, liquid interface, we have bubbles forming. And as a bubble lifts off, what it does is it entrains fluid behind it. And so there'd be an entrainment mechanism as the bubble is moving up. And, and that entrainment process enhances uh, mixing that, that is occurring. And, and so that uh, provides a mechanism of free convection and, and mixing that we have going on within pool boiling. Uh, so that is one form of boiling. Another one is where we have forced convection. So where we, let's say, have a pipe uh, within a boiler and we're pumping a liquid through it and it is going through a phase change process. So that would be uh, forced convection boiling. So forced convection uh, boiling is, is rather complex and, and it's going to vary dependent upon if your pipes are vertical and you have the fluid going vertically or if they're horizontal. And what happens is we go through a phase change and so this is referred to as being two phase flow. And the fluid mechanics here are quite complex and we won't spend a lot of time or we won't spend any time looking at it. Uh, but uh, the process here, uh, we, we have the force convective heat transfer going on. We can have free convection because we'll have temperature gradients and mixing associated with that. But bubbles themselves, they have weights behind them, just like we saw cylinders uh, and the flow behind cylinders. Well, bubbles the exact same way. And as they're moving, uh, you can have slip. They, they could be moving at the free stream velocity, the local bulk velocity. They may be moving slower, they might be moving faster if they get caught in an eddy. So the fluid mechanics here become very, very complex. But anyways, that is forced convection boiling. Um, now, boiling can also be classified as, so we can either have pool boiling or forced convection. We just looked at that. Uh, but boiling can also be classified dependent upon the temperature of the fluid or the liquid. So we can have subcooled. And this is where our surface is above the saturation temperature, uh, but the liquid itself is below the saturation temperature. So subcool boiling, we saw this in the previous segment uh, where bubbles were starting to form and as they were ascending, what was happening is the fluid was cooler than the bubble temperature. So we have vapor inside of the bubble and due to heat transfer across the bubble wall, so that vapor would be losing thermal energy, uh, we have a very delicate balance with the bubble, but essentially what would happen is the bubble would get smaller, and then you could see in the video clip it would just disappear. And, and that was because the bubble, the, the liquid temperature was not high enough in order to sustain the bubble growth as it moved upwards. And so that is what was going on there. And that is subcooled uh, boiling, uh, where we do have localized boiling down at the surface at these nucleation sites, but the bubbles don't have enough to make it all the way to the top. And so we're not getting that much vapor coming out. Uh, the other type is saturated pool boiling, or it could be saturated force convection boiling as well that we usually look at pool boiling is what we're going to be talking about uh, and here the temperature of the liquid uh, equals the saturation temperature and so when we have saturated boiling uh, i'll look at the case of pool boiling again so we have our free surface our bubbles are forming and they're moving up and what's happening is the liquid temperature is approximately equal to T sat and consequently uh, the heat transfer is such that we don't lose all the energy and then we get the vapor coming out to the surface. And on the IR camera from the top 
you could see that as these splotches that would develop. And, and what those splotches were, those were the bubbles coming to the surface. And obviously they're, they're quite hot because you have the uh, vapor inside of them. Anyway, so that is the two different forms. Uh, we have pool boiling or we can have forced convection boiling. Uh, and then we have subcooled or saturated. So what we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at the boiling curve. And, and this is something that is used quite often in terms of understanding uh, what regime we're in and what types of heat fluxes we could anticipate for uh, the boiling heat transfer processes that we might be studying. So that's where we're going. We're now going to take a look at a thing called the boiling curve. And this was based on an experiment that was done by a fellow named Nukiyama back in 1934. And what this experiment enabled Nukiyama to do uh, was to identify the different regimes in saturated pool boiling. So if you recall, that is uh, pool boiling where there is no forced convection, it's just natural convection, similar to the stovetop experiment that we looked at in the first segment. Uh, however, the temperature of the liquid is at the saturation point or saturation temperature of the fluid at whatever particular pressure. Now, what Nukiyama did is he took a container So he took a container and he filled it with water and he took the container or the water up to the saturation temperature but there was a wire going across this container and through that wire he sent a current and by measuring the voltage drop and knowing the current he was able to get information in terms of the heat transfer uh, with that particular wire and if we recall power is equal to that is going to equal the heat transfer from the wire is equal to iv so the current times the voltage p equals iv power q is equal to iv uh, and also through ohm's law we know v equals ir and from there we can obtain an expression for the resistance that is going to be the voltage divided by the current. And so for his experiment, he was able to measure the voltage. He was able to measure the current. And from those two, he was able to compute the resistance. Uh, but with wires, the resistance, it's uh, fairly easy to figure out what the temperature of the wire would be once you know the resistance. And, and so he used one of those relationships and that enabled him to get the wall temperature because the temperature of the resistor, or of the wire, I should say, uh, is going to be a function of the resistance. And so he used one of those relationships and that enabled him to get the wall temperature. And he also knew the power going in, uh, Q, and he knew the dimensions of the wire, and so he was able to get heat flux that way. So he was able to get Q over A as well. And this experiment is what we would refer to as being a power controlled experiment. And what that means is he was able to vary the current uh, going through the system, but he was not able to vary the temperature. The temperature just occurred based on the voltage and the current flowing through the wire. And so he was able to control the power going in but he was not able to control the temperature of the wire. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at the boiling curve that Nukiyama was able to get by conducting this experiment. And it will give us a lot of information about uh, saturated pool boiling. Okay, 
So this is uh, a curve, a boiling curve. Now, Nukiyama was not able to get this entire curve. Uh, he was actually unable to get this section here. Uh, and that would only be, uh, you'd only be able to get that if you were to do a temperature controlled experiment instead of a power controlled experiment. But a few areas or points that, that I want to point out, and then we'll describe other ones uh, throughout the rest of this segment. Uh, but first of all, this point up here uh, at point C, this is the critical heat flux. And that had a value of Q max double prime. Another one is down here at point D. This is where we have the minimum Q, and this is called the Leiden frost point. And the Leiden frost condition, if you've ever taken a droplet of water and put it on a really hot stove, uh, you see that it kind of bounces around and skips around and it's because the vapor develops underneath the droplet and consequently it is free to move around. And that is the Leiden frost point there where you have a vapor between the solid and the liquid. Um, and other things that I want to point out, uh, from a delta TE, remember that's the excess temperature, if we look from 1 to 5, so in this range right here, this is referred to as being free convection heat transfer. And what is happening there, just like the video we watched when we saw the natural convection taking place in the pot before the bubbles started to form, uh, that's what is happening between 1 to 5 with the excess temperature. And then we go into a region uh, that goes from an excess temperature of 5 up to 30. We get a new regime forming in there. And so this would be where we have nucleate boiling. And so what is happening there is bubbles are starting to form at nucleation sites. And from 5 to 10, those are isolated bubbles. Let me do that with a different color. So from 5 to 10 in this range here, those are isolated bubbles. And then from uh, 10 up to 30, that is where we get another process taking place. And that's where the bubbles start to coalesce with one another. And uh, what we then get are jets and columns. And so you could see that in the video as well. The bubbles would start to communicate with one another and connect. And they move up into pillar-like structures. Now, it, it, when, when you're watching in the high speed, it didn't look that way. And that's because you do have isolated bubbles going up. But they, they do connect into one another with the wakes that they have uh, behind each of the bubbles. So th this is a region where we have jets and columns. And then we get up to the critical heat flux point. Uh, we then move into a regime that uh, Nukiyama was not able to investigate. And that is going up to the Leiden frost point. And I said that he wasn't able to do it because he did a power controlled experiment. He would have had to have done a temperature controlled experiment in order to investigate that. And this region is referred to as being transition. And what's happening here is we're starting to get a film forming around our surface. Uh, and so we get bubbles moving into a film. And then finally, when we go above the Leiden frost point, that's when we have film boiling. And then radiation becomes very important. But we'll be looking at that and describing it as we go on through this segment. So uh, what I want to do, I'll refer back to this plot. But this is the boiling curve. And we're going to look at each of these different areas. And I'll provide a description uh, for each of the different temperature differentials. So to begin with, we had free convection. And that's for excess temperature uh, less than 5. 
And here we saw that this is just natural convection taking place within our pool. And then, well, let's see, did I put this on the curve? ONB, I did, good. Okay, this is the onset of nucleate boiling. That's what ONB stands for. And essentially what that means, bubbles. Bubbles start to form. And sometimes they make it to the top, sometimes they don't. But they start to enhance the amount of convective heat transfer on the surface. Because remember I said bubbles, as they move up, they entrain liquid from around them. And, and so we can move through uh, isolated bubbles. That's where we will start. And we saw this in the video. We had isolated bubbles forming. And th this is when we start, uh, our pot started to make noise. And, and so you could hear it. Uh, with the sound and, and what was happening is bubbles would form and sometimes they would then collapse if they didn't have enough of a temperature but uh, the range here anywhere from excess temperature of 5 up to 10 those are isolated bubbles and then we moved into jets and columns They appear to be jets and columns, although they could be discrete bubbles, like I said before. You can see that with the high-speed video, which Nukuyama obviously didn't have when he did this experiment back in 1934. Got to give these guys credit for the amount of information they were able to extract with such rudimentary equipment. They didn't have cell phones to distract them all the time, so they were able to focus. Okay, so those are jets and columns. And then we get to point C. Point C was the critical heat flux point. And in the next segment, it will become a little more evident why we call this critical. And this is for delta TE approximately 30. And when Nukiyama was doing his experiment, this is where his experiment went a little sideways and things didn't go very well for him. And I'll talk about that in the next segment. Uh, and then we move into transition boiling. So we would only be able to get here if we were doing a temperature controlled experiment, not a power controlled experiment like Nukiyama. And this is delta XS, delta TE. Uh, from 30 to about 120. Hopefully that's what I had on the plot. Let's see, 30, yeah, that's not too bad. Transition, that looks like about 120 right there. Okay, I was estimating a log scale, which is hard to do. Uh, and what is going on here is we're starting to get an insulating layer of vapor forming around our solid. And what is happening is the bubbles are forming, the vapor is forming, and, and they are coalescing and starting to form this insulating film of vapor. Obviously, I was not able to get that on the stovetop because we remained in uh, jets and columns and individual bubbles going up. And this is where on our boiling curve, uh, Q double prime or the heat transfer is actually reducing. And then this takes us to the Leiden frost point. But if you're to look at your wire, what would happen is you start to get bubbles that are connecting with one another. And so around your, this is for Nukiyama's experiment, we get this film. And, and so connected, here might be the bubbles coming out. but but they're all starting to merge with one another. And when they do that, you get this insulating film and this insulating film is the vapor itself. And with that, you're not bring, being able to bring in liquid in order to uh, bring the surface back uh, through the convective processes that we we're looking at before. And, and so convection uh, becomes less and less being the main form of heat transfer. We start moving into radiative heat transfer. And, and then eventually we go through transition boiling and as you increase the temperature, the excess temperature, we get film boiling.
and that would be for excess temperatures uh, 120 degrees or more. And so when we get up into this range, what happens is any kind of increase in heat transfer, uh, looking at our boiling curve, remember we came up, we did this sort of a thing, we come down and we do that, where we're talking about this region in here going up. And, and so what's happening, uh, th this is our critical heat flux. Th this is where we were in transition. And then here we have film. And so what's happening in, in this film region is the increase in heat transfer is due to radiation. Uh, because if we look at our wire, our wire would be completely blanketed with this vapor film. And consequently, the convective heat transfer has been minimized and, and the temperature of the wire is going up and then it becomes radiation, uh, radiative heat transfer. And, and so our, our temperature, uh, if you recall, this is delta Te here, uh, can start to go up relatively quickly as we increase uh, the uh, heat transfer watts per square meter. So that is the boiling curve and what we're going to do in the next segment, uh, which will be the last one for this lecture, we're going to take a look at what happens when you operate in this zone and, and the troubles that it caused for Nukiyama when he was doing his power controlled experiment. <laughs>
So when you get here, and if you move up a little bit, where are you going to go? Well, the only place you're going to go is you're going to shoot across to here, and then you're going to continue going up there. But, but, now let's go down here. Remember that this is T wall minus T sat. Well, T sat is a constant, so in order to jump all the way to the right, like he did here, to come out to this point, the wall temperature, the wire temperature, jumps up really, really quickly. And it can get incredibly high, and it can get so high that what happens is your wire melts and it disappears. And that is what happened to poor Nukiyama when he was doing this experiment. He would do it. And, and the wire would burn out. And I bet he was very, very frustrated and thinking, what the heck is going on? Um, and so anyways, that is the burnout or the boiling crisis. Now, Nukiyama was very persistent, and I'll tell you how he got around this problem in a moment. But let me make a comment. So the surface temperature can jump from C to E, and I didn't put E here, but this is E, and this was C. So what happens is that we can jump from C to E. When we look at our boiling curve, uh, we can quickly go from C all the way up to E. And this can exceed the melting point temperature of the wire. And, and that's why it's sometimes called the burnout point or the boiling crisis. You do not want to operate your system there because uh, uh, if you're exceeding the the melting point of the material, it will melt down, and that happens with nuclear reactors, and it can also help happen with electric resistance heating devices like Nukiyama was using. So how did Nukiyama get around this? Well, what he did is he changed the wire. Um, he originally used a nichrome wire. Okay. So he went from nichrome, originally using nichrome with a melting point to 1500, and then he went to platinum. That had a melting point to 2045. That enabled him to go above E and collect data up in this region here. Now you might be wondering, how was the rest of the boiling curve determined between the critical heat flux point and the Leidenfrost point down here, which we call D? Well, the way that you do that, you do a temperature controlled experiment. And an example of a temperature controlled experiment is if you have a pipe and you put a uh, vapor in it that's going through a phase change. So if you change the pressure in this pipe, you can vary the saturation pressure. Uh, that would be what you would do for your wire. And then you have your pool out here. So you're gonna have two saturation temperatures, but you have two different liquids in there. You would have uh, one uh, vapor going to liquid on the inside and then your water out here. And, and with that, you can then control independently what the uh, wall temperature would be based on the pressure. So you'd vary the pressure inside here, which would drive the saturation pressure wherever you wanted. And you could then control the wall temperature. And that is how the other, the rest of the boiling curve data was eventually collected. So anyways, that is the boiling curve, boiling uh, many different aspects of it, looking at the physics. What we're going to be doing in the next lecture, we're going to be looking into the correlations that you can use in order to estimate. Remember, we're after the convective heat transfer coefficient. So we're after H, and we're going to be looking at the relationships that enable us to determine what the value of H would be when we have boiling heat transfer. <laughs>
or TSAT is a saturation temperature. And we started off, uh, let's see, and here we would go up and then we hit onset of nucleate boiling. And that was point A on our curve. And then we would curve up and over, down, and then up again. So that was the boiling curve that we looked at. Um, and then we said that this here was point B. And then this was point C, where we have our maximum heat flux, or the critical heat flux. This down here was point D. And then when we go up here, that becomes film boiling. So now if we operate down in this region here uh, this region would be prior to the onset of nucleate boiling and so the convective heat transfer correlations there would just be simple natural convection so we're not going to cover that that was covered in another section or other lectures of the course but that would be natural or free convection What we will do, however, is we're going to look uh, at relationships that enable us to determine what is going on in this region here. We'll also come up with a relationship that enables us to determine the critical heat flux there. Uh, we will have another relationship that enables us to get the minimum. So that is Q min. That's the Leiden frost condition. And then up here we had Q max. And then finally, we will have uh, relations that enable us to determine what is happening when we have film boiling occurring, which would be up here. So we're going to look at correlations for those different regions. And we will begin with nucleate pool boiling. So for nucleate pool boiling, we're from A to C on the boiling curve. And the relationship for the heat flux in the nucleate pool boiling region is as follows. So this equation is referred to as being the Rosenau equation, and it is uh, one of the most widely used equations for pool boiling. And in this equation, all properties are evaluated at the saturation temperature. And what you'll be doing is you'll be using steam tables in order to find all of the different properties because you need both the liquid and the vapor, and so the steam tables are convenient for that. Uh, L in this equation denotes liquid and then G or sorry V uh, denotes vapor and you're going to have to do a little bit of a mental gymnastic when you go to the steam table because steam tables will have different subscripts for uh, either a gas or the liquid and uh, delta Te, that was our excess temperature, which is T wall minus T sat, where T sat is the saturation temperature at the operating pressure. And the other thing that we have in this equation, notice we have this CSF and we have N. Those depend upon the material, so the solid material as well as the liquid. And you get those from tables in your heat transfer book. So a few things to point out about this equation. Uh, sigma, that is the surface tension. Uh, but the things that you might want to be careful with, HFG, HFG, when you put it into the equation, put it in joules per kilogram Kelvin, you'll probably read it out of the table in kilojoules per kilogram, and it will mess you up if you don't use it in joules per kilogram Kelvin. Another one, the specific heat capacity of the liquid, again, use that in joules per kilogram Kelvin. If you don't, it will mess you up. And those, I think, were the main things. G is the gravitational constant. Uh, and yeah, that, that's probably all that we need to worry about for that equation. So that is the equation for nucleate pool boiling. 
um, going back. So that enables us to handle anything in this region here. We now want to look at the critical heat flux. So let's look at what uh, correlation exists for that point. So this is an equation for the critical heat flux. And as before, all properties are evaluated at T sat. And notice in this equation, we have this constant C. So let's make a comment about that. So C is going to vary between 0.13 and 0.149, uh, depending upon the shape that we are doing the calculation for. Uh, and again, like before, be careful with HFG. Make sure that it's in joules per kilogram Kelvin. And surface tension, gravitational constant, those are all pretty straightforward. Um, and now the next point that we're going to look at, let's go back. Uh, we're going to look at the minimum heat flux, which is occurring down here. So let's look at the correlation for that. So this is the equation that we have for the minimum heat flux. And if you compare this to the max heat flux, the equations look very, very similar. I'll flip back and forth. The only thing different is with the minimum heat flux, we're dividing by the sum of the liquid density and the vapor density and then squared. And uh, however, it is a little bit more restrictive in terms of the types of shapes that it applies to. Uh, as before, all properties are evaluated at T sat. And the equation, the value of C is 0 0.09, and that is for large horizontal plates. Okay, so those are some of the correlations that exist. Uh, we looked at from the onset of nucleate boiling all the way up to the uh, maximum heat flux and that was for uh, just a straight nucleate pool boiling in that region. Uh, we looked at the maximum heat flux and we looked at the min. In the next segment what we're going to do, we're going to be looking at the heat transfer in this region here. We're not going to do it in this segment right now because it's a little bit more complex. Uh, but that is what we will cover in the next segment. And then we'll uh, have completed looking at the correlations for boiling heat transfer. All right, so we're continuing looking at the correlations for pool boiling. And the last one that we're going to look at is the film boiling region. So uh, we're looking at film pool boiling. And if you recall from our boiling curve, we had QS double prime, delta T E for excess and that's T wall minus T sat and our curve we go up we hit onset of nucleate boiling we go up Q max down and then up again and this is the min that's Q max which we solved for in the last segment and we also had something that enabled us to go from onset of nucleate boiling up to Q max, and that would be nucleate pool boiling in there, uh, where you have discrete bubbles and then you get jets and columns going up. But what we're going to look at now is what happens when you get up into this region here, where delta TE becomes quite large, because remember that this is a log scale here. 
and, and consequently uh, it might not look that large but it is logarithmic and consequently the delta t's can be very very large and that's why when we get above the q max if you are in a, a power control versus a temperature controlled experiment you could burn out and, and we talked about that in the last lecture uh, but for film boiling, uh, what we want to do is we want to come up with a way to be able to estimate the convective heat transfer coefficient in this region. And so the equations, uh, if you recall when we have film boiling, uh, we said that what happens is the bubbles start to coalesce along the uh, whatever surface we're looking at. But it's that coalescence that then gives us a film of vapor over the surface and consequently the mechanisms of heat transfer become uh, mainly radiation. Radiation does dominate uh, but we're going to look in a regime where we both have convective as well as radiative heat transfer and I'll show you an equation that you can use in order to estimate uh, the amount of heat transfer that would be in this film region. So let's take a look at that. Now the equation that we use the, this is, we're looking for h bar, that would be the average convective heat transfer coefficient. Now we have an equation that combines the convective heat transfer plus the radiative heat transfer and again h bar appears. So in order to solve this equation we're interested in that and we're interested in that, but we can't solve for it directly. So what we need to do, we have to do an iteration. So we have to iterate, uh, but the first thing that we need to do, let's find out what this is and what this is. And then we would know uh, that we can put them in there and go through and iterate in order to get the convective heat transfer coefficient and film boiling. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna begin with convective heat transfer. And for this, we have a new salt number. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put it on the next slide just because I'm running out of space here. I don't want to have it all in one space. There we go. Okay, so very similar to the other expressions that we've seen uh, for Qmax or even in nucleate boiling. Uh, but it's a little bit different and first of all this equation applies only to certain geometries so it applies to cylinders and spheres and the value of C notice we have this constant here and so C depends upon the geometry And it is 0.62 if we're dealing with a horizontal cylinder. And it is 0.67 if we're dealing with a sphere. Now, the properties here. Notice that we have both vapor as well as liquid. Uh, so let's begin with vapor. Vapor properties are evaluated at the system pressure. So be careful with that. And the reason why I say be careful about that uh, is because if you're at atmospheric pressure and it, the temperature is two, three, uh, well, no, it would be higher. It would be, let's say, 400 Kelvin, 500 Kelvin, something like that. Uh, you need to have a table that would have uh, the properties of steam or vapor in this case. Uh, at that high temperature and at atmospheric pressure. So, uh, but you evaluate it at the system pressure and at the film temperature, which we saw quite often when we looked at natural convection as well as forced convection. We've seen that many times before. So that is how you get the vapor properties. Uh, again, be careful with HFG. Uh, we have a prime, which I'll define in a moment. 
but make sure that you work in joules per kilogram Kelvin and I don't see the specific heat but it is in here I'll show you it's in the modified value of HFG which we just wrote out here and new is your uh, that would be the kinematic viscosity for the vapor. K is the thermal conductivity. Uh, the other properties that we have here HFG and rho liquid are at the saturation temperature of, of the liquid that we have. I assumed it's water. It's not always water. Uh, and then HFG prime, that's a modified value of HFG, and is it expressed in the following manner? And that's where you have the specific heat of the vapor, and make sure you use that in joules per kilogram Kelvin, or it will mess you up. Okay, so that gives us an equation that we can use to solve for the convective heat transfer coefficient. Remember, that's what we're after, because if we come back here, uh, we were looking for this right here. So we have an expression for that in this equation. Uh, and the radiation, that is the other term that we have in the equation. And so the way to determine radiation is with the following expression. That is the Stefan Boltzmann uh, constant. It is not the surface tension. Don't get that mixed up. Uh, epsilon is the emissivity. And remember, when we're dealing with radiative heat transfer, these temperatures need to be in Kelvin. So that is how you determine HRAD. Uh, you take both of those, you take the value of H convective and then you plug it into this equation here uh, and you need to iterate in order to solve for the value of H bar because that's what we want. And when you get that you have then estimated the convective heat transfer coefficient in the film region uh, where we said that we have a combination of both convective heat transfer as well as radiative heat transfer. Okay, so that covers things for uh, pool boiling. Now there is also force convection boiling. We're not going to cover it in this course because it gets quite complex. You're dealing with multi-phase flow uh, and as essentially what the typical one that we would look at would be pipe flow. And, and there you would have uh, fluid flow going through a pipe, but you would start with liquid flow. It would probably be turbulent, but uh, you would have your liquid flow, but then eventually you're going to start getting bubbles forming. Uh, and then multi-phase flow is going to go through different regimes. And so we can have, uh, we, we, we can have bubbles, dispersed phase bubbles. Uh, we, we can then go into slug flow, plug flow, uh, where you might have vapor here and then a liquid. And, and then you can eventually get to a point where you have uh, a core annular flow where you might have a liquid on the wall and just a vapor in the middle. And then you can get to a point where you get a mist flow and then you have entirely vapor. So it's a very complex process going through the transition uh, for multi-phase flow and consequently we're not going to look at it in this course. Uh, that, that would take quite a bit of time and it could be a course unto its own. And, and then if you look at vertical multi-phase flow, the, the dynamics would be slightly different from what we just talked about here for horizontal. So anyways, that is force convective heat transfer with boiling. We won't look at it. We only look at saturated pool boiling. And the correlations are the ones that we've looked at in this segment and the previous one. So that concludes boiling heat transfer. Uh, from here, we're going to be going into condensation, which is the flip side of, of uh, looking at heat transfer where you have a phase change. Whereas in this case, we're going to be going from the vapor back to the liquid, and that will be condensation heat transfer. And that's what we'll be doing in, in the next few lectures.
In the last few lectures, we were looking at the topic of boiling heat transfer. And what we're now going to do, we're going to move into the opposite of boiling, which is condensation. And that's where you're going from a vapor back to a liquid. So when we look at condensation heat transfer, what is happening is uh, we have a surface that is at a temperature lower than the saturation temperature of a vapor. And consequently what happens then on that surface is the vapor goes through a phase change and it goes from uh, the vapor state back into the liquid state. Now, there are a couple of different types of condensation that can occur. So the two different types of condensation that can occur on the left, what we see is what we refer to as being film condensation. And what happens in film condensation is we get a film of liquid that wets the entire surface uh, whereby we have uh, condensation occurring. And, and then that is countered by droplet condensation, which we have on the right hand side. And, and with droplet condensation, you get little droplets forming on the surface. Sometimes they will connect with one another and then uh, due to gravity or whatever the uh, angle of it might be, but usually be gravity, uh, would, would pull them down and, and then they would descend due to their own weight. So those are the two different types. And you can imagine uh, the heat transfer characteristics are very different depending upon whether or not we have film condensation or droplet condensation. And, and for the most part, what we're going to be doing in the next few lectures, we're going to be looking at film condensation versus droplet condensation, just because the heat transfer for film condensation is actually worse. And, and consequently, it's a more conservative estimate to be doing your calculations using film condensation. Okay, so why, the, the reason why film condensation is less efficient uh, is because as the film thickness grows, uh, what happens is that the condensate or the liquid that is forming on the surface actually provides a thermal resistance or almost like an insulating blanket to the surface and, and it then minimizes the amount of condensation that's occurring. And so in order to counter this, typically uh, condensing units uh, where you have condensation occurring on the outside, try to minimize the length of the vertical surface. And, and so if you look at uh, a, a condensing unit whereby you have uh, tubes that might be arranged in something like this, and we'll be looking at this type of scenario later on. Um, and th th this would be where you have what they refer to as being shell side condensation. So the condensation is occurring on the outside of the tubes uh, but it, by having these two bundles uh, like this you'll get droplets forming and then uh, the liquid will drip down and it will go on to the next surface but you're minimizing the overall length that you have in the vertical extent by having a lot of two bundles like that and then each of these additional ones we would have liquid coming and falling and then eventually at the bottom you would collect all of the condensed liquid that you could then use whatever other process that you're trying to achieve with the system. So you'd have condensation flowing down. But we minimize the vertical extent in order to minimize the film thickness and the insulating effects that it might have. And, and so here we would have droplets forming on the two bundles. And this is what they sometimes refer to as being shell side condensation.
And the opposite of that would be tube side condensation, uh, where the vapor is flowing through the tubes and you have condensation occurring on the inside. But that would be a, a different type of application. We'll, we probably will talk about that a little bit more in a later lecture. But anyway, so that is a bit of a review of the physical processes that are occurring. What we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at some engineering applications, and then we're going to look at some of the theoretical developments that uh, were put together by a fellow named Neusalt. And we've heard of Neusalt many, many times. We use the Neusalt number for convective heat transfer. Uh, he did dimensional analysis and came up with an amazing model that, that was really quite accurate for determining the amount of heat transfer uh, when we have condensation occurring. So that's where we're going. <laughs> In the last segment, we took a look at the different forms of condensation, and we said that there is film or droplet condensation. And we also said that droplet condensation was the more efficient from the heat transfer perspective. Now, in order to achieve droplet condensation in systems, quite often coatings will be added to the surface. And what these coatings do is they have an impact upon the surface tension characteristics between the solid and the liquid that is being condensed. And so coatings such as silicones, so silicones, Teflon, waxes, and fatty acids, those are examples of coatings that will change the uh, surface tension characteristics between the solid and the liquid and and that helps prevent film condensation and then it enables droplet condensation to occur. Now when we're doing engineering calculations typically what we will do is we will assume that film condensation is occurring and that gives us a bit of a factor of safety in our engineering design calculations and, and it's uh, basically a uh, worst case scenario type of estimate for the calculation. So you wouldn't be undersizing a condensing unit, for example. Okay. So, and what we're now going to do, we're going to take a look at uh, some engineering applications where condensation is, is quite prominent and is used in, in part of the system. So, what we're going to do though, we're going to begin with the most general, and, and that's looking at condensation that we experience in our everyday lives. And so, what we're going to begin with, here we can see condensation on the window of an automobile that has been placed outside overnight and, and when it gets cool at night the condensation occurs on the surface. Uh, there you can see some more condensation on a mirror and, and you'll see the droplets form together and then they run down the surface. Uh, now in Calgary, in northern climates, sometimes what happens is it freezes and there you can see evidence with frost, frost patterns form and essentially what's happening is, is the moisture in the air condenses and then it freezes. This is an example in China where the floor is actually below the dew point of the atmospheric air and so what happens is you get puddles forming on the floor due to the fact that the floor itself is cooler than the dew point in the air and you have condensation occurring on the surface. So uh, sometimes what they do is they'll put cardboard down and, and that minimizes people from slipping while walking on surfaces like that. But if you're walking around in China or other very, very humid climates and you're wondering why the floor is wet, that, that is probably the reason. It's due to condensation. Now, another type of application that we're going to look at is that of the heat pipe and and so heat pipes are, are used in many different types of applications now and we're going to begin with this one this is a bubble light and it has methylene chloride on the inside on the right we have high-speed video you can see there is boiling occurring the bubbles are moving up 
they get to an interface and then there's condensation from the tip that then runs back down. So with the IR camera we can see the bulb temperature is around 58, 57.5 degrees Celsius and then we can go into the stem region and the, the temperature drops down a bit. It's around 41.6 degrees C uh, where the bubbles are rising up and then at the tip the temperature is around 39.7 degrees Celsius. And, and when you look at the saturation uh, temperature for methylene chloride is 39.75, which agrees very, very well with what we're seeing. And so it's because there is condensation of, of the methylene chloride occurring on the inside of the tip. And it would make sense that we would be measuring the saturation temperature uh, within that device. So the, the bubble light is a bit of a novelty. It's an interesting thing to look at. Uh, but that very same system is used in many engineering applications. And so what we're going to do now, we're going to take a look at a few of those. And we're going to begin with computing. Computers, processes generate enormous amounts of power and heat. Uh, well, they don't generate power, they generate heat. And we have to dissipate that. And, and so these are coolers that are used for central processing units. And they're a bunch of different varieties of shapes, sizes. Uh, but you can see the heat pipes there. They're the copper pipes that are coming up into the fins. There it is on the side. Uh, there you can see the top of the heat pipes that extend up through the fins. And then you know, there you can see the side profile again with the heat pipes going up. So essentially this is the same as the bubble light. Uh, but inside you would have a working fluid that would boil and then it would go up and condense and come down. And, and so what we're doing here is an experiment where we put that heat pipe apparatus onto a hot plate Heat is on and so it's heating up. I have a fan blowing through it in order to provide cooling because otherwise it would overheat. And then when you look at the heat off, what's happening is uh, the, the fluid in, in the, the pipes is cooling off due to the fins. And, and so you can see the, uh, the, the fact that the temperature drops as the, the pipes go to a lower and lower temperature. This is a railroad in Qinghai to Tibet Railroad. And there, there are heat pipes on the side. Uh, to deal with the permafrost and, and here's a similar application in, in Alaska where we have heat pipes and what they're doing if there is anything on the surface in permafrost uh, they put those heat pipes under the surface and that maintains a low frozen temperature of the permafrost and so it doesn't thaw and if it thaws what would happen is the railroad would either sink or it would shift and you'd have all kinds of geotechnical problems going on. So heat pipes are, are used not only in computers but they're also used with pipelines or railroads like we saw with that one particular application. Now another application that we have for condensing is in refrigeration and so here is a picture of a refrigerator. It's an older fashioned refrigerator where we have coils on the back but what's happening on the inside of those coils is we have condensation occurring. So the refrigerant becomes a superheated vapor after the compression process and then we reject heat and it's going through a condensing process and so that's essentially what we're looking at as the refrigerant flows through those coils. And, and so that would be where you have condensation on the tube side. The condensation is occurring, occurring within the tube and it's going from uh, being a superheated vapor down to the saturation temperature and then it would go through a phase change and then you would have a liquid coming out at the bottom. Uh, but that is typically the cycle used for any kind of refrigeration system. And then finally, and the last application that we're going to look at are very large scale industrial condensing units. And so here we can see a picture of a condensing unit being fabricated. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a condensing unit and a shell and tube heat exchanger. They're uh, very, very big and you've got a lot of tubes on the inside. But in this particular one, uh, th th this was one where it was tube side condensation. And so they are relatively large tubes. They're the tubes there, they're probably one and a half to two inches in diameter. And, and so what is happening is you have condensation occurring within the tubes. And, and if I sketch that out, uh, you would have a system like this. And usually they'll incline the tubes at a bit of an angle, but you would have a vapor going through. And, and you would get condensation forming and you would get a film forming like this. You want to use gravity to draw that down. Sometimes uh, you'll also have your vapor. So you have velocity vapor coming through the central core. Um, 
And then essentially what happens is this here would be your liquid and you would have gravity driving that. Now you want to be careful because as the tube gets with more and more liquid building up, so eventually you're going to get to some point like this. Ideally you want to keep it as being stably stratified flow. And, and so you'll have your vapor up here going through. The, this is if we have what we refer to as being tube side condensation. You need to be careful because what can happen is if the vapor velocity is high with respect to the liquid velocity, so this is our liquid here, you can actually get instability waves that start to form on here and that can transition into slug flow and it, it could uh, cause a very, very high pressure drop. A multi-phase flow physics can be uh, rather complicated. Now sometimes you're okay with this, but sometimes you're not. Uh, for example, if, if the vapor has to go through another stage, ideally you don't want to be in training a liquid droplets like you would get with multi-phase flow or plugs coming out of it. So anyways, so those are examples of condensing units that are used in industrial applications. Uh, as well as many other types of uh, condensing applications that we use in not only in engineering but also that we see in everyday life. Um, and so what we're going to be doing in the next segment is we're going to be taking a look at uh, some of the correlations. We'll derive uh, the Reynolds number and then we'll move into some analysis that Newsalt did uh, coming up with very early correlations enabling us to determine the convective heat transfer coefficient for these types of systems. In this segment, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be taking a look at the Reynolds number that is defined for condensation on vertical or inclined surfaces. And we'll be using that uh, as we develop some of the correlations in the next lecture. Now the thing about condensation, uh, when we're looking at heat transfer with condensation, there are many, many different Reynolds numbers that we're going to be looking at uh, depending upon how you define it. But th th this is one definition of the Reynolds number. So V is the average velocity of the condensate flowing down the surface. Rho is the density of the liquid. Mu is the dynamic viscosity of the liquid. dH, I'm going to write it up here. This is the hydraulic diameter. And it is defined as being 4 times the cross-sectional area, AC divided by the perimeter. And that would be the cross-sectional area uh, perpendicular to the direction of which the film is moving, so the velocity, and that's going to depend upon the nature of the shape. There are two areas that we're going to use in condensation, so be very, very careful not to confuse them. We have wetted area, which is the one that we typically use whenever we're using Newton's law of cooling, and that will be A, and then we have this AC, and that is essentially uh, the cross-sectional area perpendicular to the wall or perpendicular to the velocity. So if we look at a surface where we have a film growing like that, this here, if we look, that, that is typically delta. And let's say this plate is of width B. So I'll say the width is B in this direction. Uh, okay, so there's our film coming down. The film is moving in that direction. AC is essentially this cross-sectional area here. AC, which is going to be, uh, it will be the perimeter times delta. Where perimeter, it would be for a unit length, that would be B. So just to make a comment about that. AC is equal to the perimeter times delta, and delta is the thickness of the film. 
And the perimeter, for example, uh, if we're looking at a vertical plate, it would be equal to B, as we just uh, put in this drawing. If we're looking at a vertical cylinder, however, it, it's going to be different. Now, with the vertical cylinder, uh, the radius of the cylinder, so that would be there, uh, R needs to be much larger than the thickness of the film of delta. But what will happen is you get condensation forming around. And here, the area is going to be related to the perimeter or the cross-sectional area. So the perimeter as we've defined, is equal to pi times d, and that would be for a vertical cylinder. Okay, so just be aware that this cross-sectional area, AC, uh, that is different uh, from, from A, which is wetted area that we will see in a moment as we look at Newton's law of cooling when we start coming up with the convective heat transfer coefficient. And, and so you can imagine here this cross-sectional area for a cylinder will be a little bit more complex than it would be just for the plate. But anyways, there are two different areas that we're going to use. Don't get them confused. Hopefully I haven't confused you with all of this stuff here. All right, so what we're going to do uh, we're now going to take a look at a generic plate, a vertical plate, and, and th this is one that is often used when looking at uh, condensation flowing on a surface. And uh, here is our plate. And depending upon the book that you're using, sometimes TS will be the wall temperature, sometimes TW will be the wall temperature. In any event, we're assuming that the gravity vector is going in that direction. And our coordinate system, we will draw Y normal to the plate and X in the direction of the plate. And what happens is we begin with a film that might grow something like that and let me clean that up a little okay so it's coming down and then it goes into a wavy regime and then eventually it becomes turbulent and and so depending upon the reynolds number we're actually in different regimes here and so we will be denoting those in a moment uh, before i do that however i want to put in a few other variables that are uh, within this on the outside of the film we will call that the saturation temperature. And then further out here, we have the vapor. And, and so you could have a scenario where it's superheated vapor and, and it's above the saturation temperature, or you could have it at the saturation temperature. Usually we assume it to be at the saturation temperature, but in the event that it's higher, I will denote it with TV uh, free stream. And so here, what is happening is we have mass flow rate of condensate moving down. And as the film gets thicker and thicker, the mass flow rate is going to increase because we keep adding more and more fluid uh, as we have more fluid condensing. And so M dot is going to be a function of X. And the other thing that we have here, uh, we typically define delta as being the thickness of our layer and consequently we know that delta is a function of x and the other thing that we did and, and I define this in the Reynolds number that I just uh, presented a moment ago um, with the Reynolds number I said that there is some average or bulk velocity in reality there's going to be a velocity profile here but for right now what we're going to do is assume that we have some bulk velocity of the condensate moving down uh, due to the body force or gravity. So if we were to look at this, what we have up at the top, th this would be where we have Reynolds number approximately equal to zero. And in this region here, we refer to it as being laminar and it's also called wave free. 
Then when you get to a Reynolds number of approximately 30, what happens is you get a laminar, but it is wavy. And so those waves would be instability waves developing uh, within the, the, the fluid, the, the film itself. And instability waves grow, and, and it's the process of transition from laminar to turbulent. But it is characterized by waves that we would see on the surface. And that will exist until we get to a Reynolds number of about 1800. And once we get to a Reynolds number of 1800, then our film becomes turbulent. And just like with when we looked at the flat plate boundary layer or a lot of the other things we've been doing in this course, uh, whenever you transition from one regime to another, your correlations are going to change. And so we will see that when we look at the experimental correlations that have been collected uh, for the uh, condensation on a vertical uh, surface or plate like we're looking at here. So I think that's the majority of the things that I wanted to write. It is. Okay, so now what we do, uh, I, I want to define a Reynolds number, and we looked at Reynolds number a moment ago, but I'm going to basically massage that Reynolds number, and we're going to come up with different Reynolds numbers, which you'll find is quite common when you're looking at condensation. And we're going to begin by looking at a definition for the mass flow rate. And so we can say the mass flow rate is going to be equal to the density of the liquid in the film. And it's going to be equal to, uh, it will be rho AV. And so the A here is going to be, remember the cross-sectional area. That is going to be, uh, for example, if you have a vertical plate, that's going to be delta times B, where B would be the width of the plate. And... That will also be multiplied by capital V, which is the bulk velocity of the fluid going through. So we're going to take that mass flow rate and we're going to use it in a definition of the Reynolds number. Uh, because if you look back, uh, when we had Reynolds number here, we have some of those components there. We have rho and we have V and the cross-sectional area is embedded within the hydraulic diameter which we can pull in. So it's going to enable us to be able to recast the Reynolds number in terms of the mass flow rate. So let's take a look at that now. And when I have rho here and mu I should denote that that is for the liquid phase. So what I've done here, I've recast the Reynolds number with the mass flow rate and I've also rewritten it with this capital gamma. And that is the mass flow rate in the film, which is a function of x, divided by the perimeter. And, and so the perimeter, in the case of a vertical flat plate, would just be b. Uh, in the case of a cylinder, a vertical cylinder, it would be pi times diameter, which we saw earlier. So that is one form of the Reynolds number. Now there's another form of the Reynolds number that we can come up with and for that one what we do is we take this and we relate it to uh, the convective heat transfer coefficient and I'll show you how to do that in a moment here. So what we can do we can come up with yet another Reynolds number and for this one what I'm going to do I'm going to use Newton's law of cooling So we have some average convective heat transfer over our surface multiplied by A. This is a different A from the AC. This is the wetted area. So if you have a vertical plate like this, uh, A would be that area there. So it would be uh, that. And, and if you're looking at a cylinder, it would be the external area around the entire perimeter. It's not the cross-sectional area of the film, it is the wetted area. But that will be multiplied by the saturation temperature minus the surface or the wall temperature. And that is equal to m dot, so the mass flow rate, times the heat of vaporization. So going from a vapor to a liquid or a liquid to a vapor. And you get that out of steam tables. 
And one thing that I will say, be careful because the tables often are in kilojoules per kilogram. You need to pull that out of that table in joules per kilogram or you're going to make mistakes. So don't make that mistake when you're pulling it out of the table. Make sure that you get it in joules per kilogram. And H bar here is average convection, uh, convective heat transfer. And then finally, A is going to be the length, the vertical length. And so usually what we'll do is we will denote our vertical length like this. So it will be L times the perimeter. And remember I said the perimeter could be B in the case of a plate or it would be pi times D in the case of a cylinder where D is our diameter. Okay, so we have that. Now, what are we going to do with it? Well, I want to recast and write a new form of the Reynolds number. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to take the M dot from here and basically replace it with the M dot that is up here in that Reynolds number. So let's go ahead and do that. So this here, what I'm writing is one of the important equations that you're going to be using. It's going to be heat transfer divided by the heat of vaporization. And we said heat transfer through Newton's law. We know that it's this. divided by HFG. And when we plug in the mass flow rate, we get a new Reynolds number. So that becomes another form of the Reynolds number that we can use. So what we've looked at here are three different Reynolds numbers that you can use uh, if you're dealing with convective condensation heat transfer, I should say. Where was the other one? Uh, the first one was right here. Okay, so those are three different Reynolds numbers. And then when we look at correlations, we're going to look at yet another one. Uh, there are many, many different Reynolds numbers uh, that you can have when you're looking at condensation and films forming on vertical surfaces. What we'll be doing in the next segment is we're going to go back uh, to this representation that we have here. And, and th this was a starting point that Nussel used. And he started with an object or a model that looked like this. And he came up with equations. And he went through dimensional analysis and, and came up with a way to be able to get the convective heat transfer coefficient. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next two segments, which will give us a form of the convective heat transfer coefficient. It won't be perfect because it's based on a theoretical model. And then we'll move in in the next lecture to the correlations that are actually used. And so that's where we're going to be going. In this lecture, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at some of the correlations that exist for quantifying the amount of heat transfer, the convective heat transfer coefficient when we have condensation occurring on vertical surfaces. And so what we're going to do, we're going to begin with a model that was developed by Nussalt. And we'll refer to this as being Nussalt's model. And then in the next segment, what we'll do is we'll go through some of the analysis that Nussel did to come up with an, an expression for the convective heat transfer coefficient. So Nussel came up with a model to be able to characterize what was happening with film condensation and this developed a relationship for the convective heat transfer coefficient as well as the Nussel number. Uh, and consequently, that is part of the reason why we name it after the fellow. Uh, but, but it was a very insightful type of analysis, and, and it has enabled a lot of other researchers to use his functional relationship in order to collapse their experimental data. Now, obviously, Nussel's analysis only applied to laminar flow. But what we're going to do, let's begin by drawing a schematic of, of what 
uh, the problem look like from Newsol's perspective, and then we'll work a little bit looking at some of the relationships that were existing. And so we'll begin by looking at Newsol's model. Now he was doing a combination of, of force balance and as well he was looking at dimensional re reasoning, so dimensional analysis. But let's begin with the schematic for uh, how New Salt envisioned the flow field for when we have film condensation on a vertical plate. So what we can see here, and this is the model that Newsall used to come up with a relationship that enabled him to come up with a connective heat transfer coefficient. And uh, first of all, just like before with our model, we had a representation for the thickness of the film, the condensation film, and that was denoted by delta. Uh, but another thing that he did is he looked at a differential element of fluid that would have been on the surface, and he would have assumed that to be at some Y location, so we'll have that at location Y, and then the thickness of that element he denoted as being dx. And, and the depth here is b, so what we're looking at, if I was to draw this in three dimensions, is we have a plate like that. Um, the film is forming and coming down this way, and so that would be our film. Here is our plate, and delta was the thickness and B was the width. Sometimes we assume it to be unit width. Here we will assume it to be uh, width B. A couple of things that he assumed. One was that there was no vapor drag. And, and so what does that mean? What, what that is implying is that there is no shear on the surface of the film as it is forming and moving down. And so we assume there is no vapor drag. Another assumption that he made was that the temperature profile, uh, let me do that in red, the, the temperature profile was linear with position. And so that was another approximation that enabled him to simplify uh, this scenario of what was going on. The last thing, I haven't drawn this yet, but he had the no-slip boundary condition along the wall. And so what he was assuming there was velocity equals zero at y equals zero. So that was the model that Newsalt came up with in terms of developing an equation. And, and so what he did is he considered the differential elements. So what we're now going to do, we're going to zoom in on this little differential element here, and we're going to look at the forces that are occurring on that differential element. So what we have here, looking at the differential element, there are a number of different forces that are acting on the element. To begin with, we have the weight of the element, and that can be characterized by the density of the liquid, and then multiplied by the volume. And so we have delta minus y being the width or the thickness of this little differential element, uh, the unit width b, and then dx being our vertical. And that was the weight, buoyancy force. is expressed in that manner. And then finally, shear. There is viscous shear in the fluid. And I'm going to assume that u is only a function of y, and that's why I'm putting this as an ordinary differential. Uh, u is actually evolving, and so it could be a partial as well, depending on how you're looking at the analysis. But uh, just giving kind of an order of magnitude perspective here in terms of what was involved. So what he then did is he, he looked at the downward force. and said that that was equal to the upward force. 
And with that, he had a balance between weight and viscous shear plus buoyancy. Now, I'm not going to go into details of, of how Newsalt did his analysis, but uh, you can look in many, many different textbooks on heat transfer, and they will probably uh, go through some kind of treatment in terms of covering how Newsalt did his analysis. But what we're going to begin with in the next segment is some of the results that he obtained from this model. And, and what it enabled him to do is start coming up with a relationship, which then enabled him to build up uh, the value of the convective heat transfer coefficient, and then finally the new salt number, which is named after his analysis. And that's the non-dimensional number that we use for convective heat transfer. So that's where we're going to be going in the next segment. In the last segment, what we did is we took a look at the analysis that Newsalt did for uh, convective uh, condensation heat transfer on a vertical surface. And what we're now going to do, we're going to look at the correlation or the convective heat transfer coefficient that he was able to get out of that analysis. And so he did make a number of approximations or assumptions in developing the relationship. Uh, but what he was able to do is he was able to solve for the thickness of the film as a function of x. And then he was able to get the convective heat transfer coefficient as well. So he was able to get the film thickness, uh, the local convective heat transfer coefficient, as well as integrate that to get the overall. Now looking at the film thickness, this was the relationship that he came up with. Now keep in mind that this is for Reynolds number less than 30, so it has to be for laminar flow. And that was raised to the power of one quarter. Now, we're going to see in a moment uh, this value for the heat of vaporization, it is going to be corrected. So, uh, although uh, th this is what Neusalt originally came up with, he did correct that. And we'll turn that into an HFG prime, which we will see in a moment. And so that is the one that you should be using for your analysis, not just the uh, a straightforward heat of vaporization that you get in the tables, but one that has been corrected, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so that is the thickness of the film. The local heat transfer coefficient is as follows. And whenever there's a subscript L or V, that refers to either the liquid or the vapor. And the temperatures at which you evaluate these properties is important, and we will see that in a moment. So the local heat transfer coefficient. Now, he was able to integrate that very much like we've seen for the uh, convective heat transfer over a flat plate uh, for a lot of the ones that we've done. We, we go through and perform an integration like this. But if you look at the functional form, hx is proportional to x to the minus 1 quarter. And so with that, you can go through and find that the average heat transfer across the entire plate is just 4 thirds the local heat transfer at the end of the plate. So what we're looking at here, if I draw this in three dimensions, uh, we're looking at a plate of length L. And quite often we will assume that it is unit or width B. And so we have our film forming and condensation forming like that. And then delta obviously would be the thickness of the layer. Okay, so that is the average convective heat transfer coefficient. And then taking the value that we just had earlier, basically you exchange X for L. And so let me write that out.
And so this is for laminar flow, and so this applies for the Reynolds number from 0 to 30. Now, you'll notice in here I put F. Uh, that is denoting that the properties are being evaluated. That, that's the liquid properties, but evaluated at the film temperature. And, and so I'll make a comment about that in a moment. Not all of the properties are evaluated at the film temperature. The heat of vaporization is evaluated at a different one as is the vapor density. So um, now the other thing that I had mentioned, I, I said that this heat of vaporization that we see here and here, uh, New Salt actually came up with a correction for that. And, and so I just want to make a comment on that. But when you do your calculations, use the corrected value. Do not use this value of HFG. So when we do our calculations, we replace the heat of vaporization that we get out of the steam tables with this corrected value, HFG prime. And the expression for that, HFG prime, is equal to HFG uh, plus 0 0.68 times the specific heat of the liquid. And then we have temperature saturated minus temperature of the surface or the wall temperature. So this HFG prime is a modified value. And again, be careful. It needs to be in joules per kilogram. Uh, quite often the tables will list it in kilojoules per kilogram. So you got to multiply it by a thousand when you pull it out of the table as the, the same exists for the specific heat of the liquid uh, and that you would also get out of the tables. But watch it is quite often listed as being kilojoules per uh, kilogram Kelvin. So we have this corrected heat of vaporization and you use this in all of the equations that we have just looked at. So which ones am I talking about? Here you would do HFG prime. Uh, here you would do HFG prime. So a new salt had done his analysis kind of simplified and, and this is a bit of a correction. And then again, I've already mentioned that, that you put HFG prime in that relationship. So that is the modified heat of vaporization. Now, where do we evaluate the properties? Well, I was showing it here by putting the F. Uh, the liquid property should be evaluated at the film temperature. And so the film temperature is going to be your saturation temperature, which would be the saturation temperature for the particular pressure that you're looking at, uh, plus the wall or surface temperature divided by 2. And the exception here, except for HFG, so the heat of vaporization, and the density of the vapor, those should be at TSAT. So that is New Salt's correlation. And quite often, that would then be presented a new salt. Uh, let's see, what would that be? H L over K. So H bar K, that would be K the liquid. L would be our vertical dimension that we would have for whatever we're looking at. So if we're looking at a vertical plate, uh, that would be the length of the plate like that. If we're looking at a big cylinder, uh, that would be the height of the cylinder. So that is what L would be our characteristic dimension. Uh, but anyways, that is New Salt's correlation. What we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to look at correlations that uh, in a way are based off of New Salt's analysis, but they enable us to go to higher Reynolds numbers, going into the wavy regime and then finally into the turbulent regime where you would have uh, turbulent condensation in, in your uh, uh, film forming on the cooled surface.
In the last segment, what we did is we took a look at the correlation that new salt was able to derive for the convective heat transfer coefficient for condensation on a vertical surface. And we're now going to look at other correlations uh, that extend beyond the laminar flow regime into the wavy and then finally into turbulent flow. And so what we're going to do, we're going to begin assuming that we know the thickness of the film that is forming uh, on the surface that is cooled, the, the condensation film. So these correlations can apply to either a vertical uh, plate or to a vertical cylinder provided that the radius is much larger than the film thickness that, that forms on the vertical plate. Now we're going to introduce a new Reynolds number that we will use in these correlations. And if you recall from an earlier lecture, we were talking about Reynolds number being defined in terms of the mass flow rate of the condensate running down our vertical surface. And this was the expression that we had. And here, PER, that is the perimeter. And so if you're looking at a vertical plate, the perimeter would be equal to the width of the plate. And we said the unit width would be B, not unit width, but that would be the width that we're dealing with, would be little b. And if you're dealing with the vertical cylinder, In this case, the perimeter is equal to pi times the diameter of the cylinder. And, and so with this, what we can do, we can make a substitution here. And I'm not going to go through it, but it enables us to come up with a new form of the Reynolds number defined in terms of the thickness of our film. And so with that, uh, new salt, or you can come up with a relationship for this gamma of x, which is basically quantifying the mass flow rate of the film as it's moving down the plate. But with this, we get a new Reynolds number, and that will be Reynolds number delta. And it is expressed in the following manner. And so notice we have delta in here. So that assumes that we know the thickness of our film. And that becomes the Reynolds number. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to assume that the density of the liquid, which is here, is much larger than the density of the vapor, which is usually the case. Uh, when you look at water, uh, typically for atmospheric pressure, it's a difference of about a thousand. And, and so it's a fair assumption to say that the liquid density is much higher than the vapor. But we're going to make that assumption so with that assumption, we can then express the following correlations. And we're going to begin with laminar. And so this one would need to be consistent uh, with the one that uh, Neusolt came up with analytically. But it will be defined in terms of a Neusolt number. There is our average convective heat transfer coefficient. Now the length scale here, what we're going to do uh, we're going to use, that is our kinematic viscosity. So uh, kinematic viscosity, remember, is mu L divided by rho L. We're going to make that substitution. So uh, kinematic viscosity squared divided by G raised to the power one third. And then we're going to divide by the thermal conductivity of the liquid. Uh, let me get rid of the kinematic viscosity. It's just going to confuse things. There we go. And this is then given by the following expression. And this obviously would apply only in the laminar flow regime. And so that means that the Reynolds number has to be 30 or less. Going on into the wavy regime, And so this would pertain or apply for Reynolds number between 30 up to 1800. And then finally, an expression for turbulent. So these are obtained by taking experimental data and collapsing it. That's where the last, uh, the wavy and the turbulent would come from. 
And this one, it turns out, has sensitivity to the Prandtl number. And so we see the Prandtl number starting to appear in the relationship. And that would be for the case where a Reynolds number based on delta is greater than 1800. So those are the three correlations that you can use, provided that you know your film thickness. What we'll do in the next segment, we'll look at three correlations if you don't know the film thickness. And, and it would depend upon the particular problem that you're trying to solve, whether or not you would know the film thickness. Sometimes you might know the convective heat transfer coefficient. Uh, and, and then you'd be able to uh, do calculations such as determining what the height of the cylinder needs to be if you know H. So anyways, uh, that is if you know the thickness of the film, we'll look at another set of correlations in the next segment. We're now going to conclude this lecture by looking at correlations uh, where the film thickness is unknown. So if you recall from the previous segment, we were looking at correlations for either a vertical plate or for a vertical cylinder where the radius is much larger than the film thickness. And we needed to know the film thickness in order to compute the Reynolds numbers. So what we're going to do here, uh, we're going to come up with alternative correlations that enable us to handle problems where we may not know delta. And so what we have here is a different definition for the Reynolds number. And you'll notice there is this capital P that I have in here. Uh, I haven't talked about that yet, but that is a dimensionless parameter. And it is defined in the following manner. So what we have here uh, within this, this is the thermal conductivity of the liquid. This is our length scale. So remember, if we're dealing with a vertical plate uh, like this, and the length of the plate would be like that, or if we're dealing with a very large cylinder, the length would be the vertical extent like that. And, and the diameter here, and this would be the case where R is much larger than the film thickness that would occur at the bottom of the plate. So when you solve these problems, you do have to double check to make sure that that assumption is appropriate uh, if you're using this for a vertical cylinder. Uh, but that is what L is, and then we have our modified heat of vaporization that has been corrected with uh, the specific heat of the liquid. And the other thing we have, we saw this earlier, this was in the new salt number uh, relationship. But remember, that is our kinematic viscosity, uh, which is mu L divided by rho L. Okay, so we have this value of P. Now what we're going to do, we're going to look at relationships uh, for laminar, wavy, and turbulent that use this. And so we get that relationship there. And this, remember for the Reynolds number, it applies if the Reynolds number was less than 30. Here, P needs to be less than 15.8, and that would indicate that we have laminar flow. Uh, for the wavy flow region, Uh, for the wavy flow region, P is going from 15.8 up to 2530. And then finally, we have turbulent. And just like we saw in the previous segment, when we got to turbulent, it included the parental number. And so this applies if P is greater than 2530 and it also applies for parental number of the liquid greater than or equal to 1.
So those are three different relationships that we can use to determine uh, connected heat transfer or other things that we might be trying to solve if we have a problem with condensation on a vertical surface, be it a plate or a large cylinder, and where the axis is aligned vertically. And, and this is going to be used with the following equations. So we have Newton's law of cooling, and we saw this earlier on. Uh, be careful with the area there. Remember that is the wetted area. And so what I'm referring to, that would be the perimeter times the vertical length, whatever the length scale is. And the perimeter would be pi times D if it's a vertical cylinder, and it would be B if it is a vertical plate. So perimeter equals B for plate or pi D for cylinder. And that's vertical cylinder. We'll look at uh, horizontal cylinders in the next lecture. Uh, that is for the vertical plate. Okay, so that's Newton's law of cooling. The other thing that quite often we're asked to solve for or we might be interested in is the mass flow rate of the condensate coming off of our condensing system. So for that you take your overall heat transfer and you divide by the modified latent heat of vaporization and then that is equal to the following. Okay, so what we've done, we've looked at Neusalt's uh, derivation, his model uh, came up with a, an expression that enabled us to calculate the convective heat transfer coefficient for condensation on a vertical plate uh, for laminar flow. And then what we did is we've extended that uh, from laminar into wavy and then finally turbulent. Uh, we, we have different relations depending on whether or not you know the thickness of the film. So that is coverage for the vertical plate and the vertical cylinder. And what we'll be doing in the next segment, we're going to be looking at horizontal uh, objects, mainly cylinders, and then two bundles, which would be quite common if, if you have shell side condensation in a condensation uh, unit. So that, that'll be what we'll be looking at in the next lecture. We're now going to take a look at the case of film condensation on the outside of horizontal cylinders and spheres. So the correlation that we'll be using is one that follows the correlation that was developed by Neusselt for the vertical plate. And if you recall, the form that we had was the new salt number based on diameter. Here we will have the average heat transfer coefficient on, uh, be it a cylinder or a sphere. And L, or sorry, D is the characteristic dimension. And you can see it there in the expression for the new salt number. And then there is a constant. And that constant depends on whether we're looking at a cylinder or a sphere. And from there, then the relationship would be the same as what we saw for the flat plate. So that's the correlation. And with this, C is going to depend upon whether we're dealing with a sphere. And if we're dealing with a sphere, then C is 0.826. And if our problem is dealing with a horizontal cylinder, then it would be 0.729. And again, we have a modified latent heat of vaporization. That's the one that is corrected using uh, the specific heat of the liquid. And the properties that are evaluated uh, 
all properties are at the film temperature uh, with the exception the density of the vapor and the heat of vaporization will be evaluated at the saturation temperature so that is uh, the expression that we can use for computing the uh, convective heat transfer for film condensation on either a sphere or a horizontal cylinder. Now in the case of horizontal cylinders, quite often what happens is these are packaged together into a tube bundle and, and that then forms condensing units, which uh, we saw an example of that in an earlier lecture when we were looking at engineering applications or real world applications. So uh, taking a look at tube bundles, So when we're looking at tube bundles, typically we have N tubes horizontal. So that would be the number going in the horizontal. And we also have N tubes in the vertical direction. And consequently, this bundle would have N by N tubes. And what happens here is when we have condensation, uh, we would have film condensation coming around, but then it drips and it goes down onto the next. And so progressively the mass flow rate is going to build up. And by the time that we get to the bottom, we have a very high mass flow rate coming off of the bottom tubes. And consequently, the convective heat transfer coefficient for a single tube uh, can be corrected for a vertical tier as we might have in this particular example here. So this would be a vertical tier. And the way that we correct for the convective heat transfer coefficient so we would have the convective heat transfer coefficient for N tubes in the vertical direction. And in order to compute that, what we do, we begin by computing the convective heat transfer coefficient for a single tube. And then we multiply it by the number of tubes in the vertical direction raised to the power minus one sixth. And consequently, that gives us a slightly modified convective heat transfer coefficient, uh, taking into account the fact that we have this vertical uh, tube bundle. And essentially what happens here is the convective heat transfer coefficient is going to drop down somewhat. And the reason for that is if you think about the fact that as you get more and more condensate or condensed liquid forming around the outside of each of these tubes, that then provides a bit of an insulating layer. And consequently, we would expect uh, that the amount of uh, heat transfer, convective heat transfer is going to be reduced as you get a larger and larger uh, film forming around the tubes. And, and so all of the tubes here would have this taking place and they would all then have a larger film developing around them. So that is how you can handle or do calculations for the case of uh, be it a single tube that is horizontal or a tube bundle or a single sphere. And, and so, but this one here gives us the correction for the case of a tube bundle. So what we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to solve an example problem of a condensing unit like we're looking here and and th th this would be referred to as being shell side condensation and the reason why we say shell side and sometimes we say tube side is because it is uh, thinking of this in terms of a shell and tube heat exchanger uh, where you have a larger cylindrical object and and that is essentially the shell and then on the inside, you have all of these tubes. And, and, and so in the case of shell side condensation, that means the condensation is taking place outside of the tubes and it would be dripping as we have here. Now, if it was tube side condensation, then we would be looking at a condensing unit where 
uh, we have the condensation occurring on the inside of the tubes and sometimes there'll be a little slope and the liquid will build up. If you're to look at the cross section of this, what's happening is you get the film building up on the inside, it runs down the walls and then you get a layer of liquid forming on the bottom. And so your film then is on the inside. That would be tube side tube side condensation and this is shell side condensation. So in the next segment what we're going to do we're going to take a look at the case of shell side condensation where the condensation is outside of our tube bundle. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to finish this lecture by solving an example problem of a condensing unit. And the condensing unit, uh, we will have what we call shell side condensation. And in the condensing unit, we have steam at one atmospheric pressure that is being condensed. So shell side condensation, recall from the last segment, that means that the condensation is on the outside of the tubes. And we have horizontal tubes in the tube bundle and they are aligned in a square array. And there are 20 in the horizontal and 20 in the vertical. The outside diameter of the tube, 6.35 millimeters. And the length of our tube bundle, we're told, is one meter. The surface temperature of the tubes is maintained at 88 degrees C. And given that we're dealing with an atmospheric pressure, that means that the saturation temperature of the steam is 100 degrees C. And what we're told to find is the condensation rate. So that is M dot, and we're looking for this in kilograms per hour. So let's begin with a schematic of this problem. So there we have 20 tubes in the horizontal and we have 20 in the vertical and outside of the tube bundle we have steam at atmospheric pressure and saturation temperature 100 degrees Celsius so that is roughly a schematic of what's going on and just like we talked about for two bundles we'll get a film forming that's going to drip down and the film is going to get thicker and thicker and eventually we have a very large film coming out of the bottom. If you sum up all of these, that would then give you the mass flow rate for the entire tube bundle. What we'll do, we'll begin with a single tube, looking at the relations to give us the convective heat transfer coefficient. And then we will extend that with the relationship that we had for tube bundles by looking at a vertical column. And, and then we'll multiply that by 20 and that will give us information about what is happening for the entire tube bundle in terms of the condensation. Uh, but to begin with, what we need to do, we need to evaluate the properties. So let's begin with that. So if you recall, the heat of vaporization, we take that at the saturation temperature. And remember to bring 10 to the 3 here because this is joules per kilogram. And the density of the vapor we also get at the saturation temperature. Now for the other properties we evaluate those at the film temperature which is going to be our saturation temperature plus the surface or wall temperature. And so in this particular application or problem, 
that turns out to be 94 degrees C, which is 367 Kelvin. And so chances are we're going to have to do some interpolation when we go into our tables, because typically the tables are either in units of 10 or 5. Uh, but at 367 we have to do interpolation so let's go into the tables pull out the values and i'll just write them down and so those are the properties at the film temperature now what we want to do uh, in our correlation we're going to have the modified latent heat of vaporization we won't be using that one exactly uh, we have to use the modified or corrected one, so let's evaluate that to begin with. So we get that for the modified latent heat of vaporization, and we will be using that in our correlations. Now the correlation that we use here, we're going to begin with that for a single horizontal tube. And this is assuming laminar flow. So what we can do, we can plug in all the different values uh, that we obtained out of the tables as well as our modified heat of vaporization. And with this, we obtain a new salt number of about 157. And so we can take that and then evaluate the convective heat transfer coefficient for a single cylinder. So that's what we're interested in obtaining. So doing that, So we get about 16 or 17,000 watts per meter squared Kelvin, and that is for a single tube. Now what we need to be able to do, we need to be able to extrapolate this for a bundle or a vertical column, because what we just arrived is for a single tube, but recall we're interested in being able to obtain what's happening when we have a tube bundle. So we're going to look uh, beginning with the vertical column and we'll understand what is going on there and that will be determined by this value here. So let's look at the relationship that we use for a tube bundle. And if you recall from the last segment we said that what this would do it would actually reduce the convective heat transfer coefficient. And the reason is that as the film grows on each successive tube lower on in the bundle, uh, the film itself acts as a bit of an insulating layer. And so that has the net effect of reducing the amount of the convective heat transfer coefficient. And that's reflected in the negative that we have in the power here. So when you do that, you obtain the average convective heat transfer coefficient for the vertical column is actually a little smaller. And it's uh, 10,216 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So when we obtain that, uh, then what we need to do, remember we're after the condensate and we want to know M dot coming off of this tube bundle. So now that we know the convective heat transfer coefficient, the next step that we're going to want to follow is to determine Q for the cube bundle. And once we get that, we can then solve for the mass flow rate by taking Q divided by the modified heat of vaporization. So that's where we're going. First step is going to be to get the uh, amount of heat transfer going on within this two bundle. So let's begin with that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to determine the total heat transfer for the condensing unit. So remember there are N by N or 400 tubes in this bundle. And this is Newton's law of cooling here. And so we have to multiply by the area, the wetted area, which is going to be pi dL. And L was one meter. And then we multiply that by T sat minus the surface temperature. Plugging in values. So we get about 978 kilowatts per meter. I'm assuming, that, given that we have the length of being one meter, that that's per meter. 
So now that we've obtained that, we can then go ahead and determine the mass flow rate. So let's do that next. So we then determine the mass flow rate, and that's kilograms per second. And if you recall in the problem statement, they wanted it in kilograms per hour. So we multiply that by 3,600 or 60 times 60, and we then end up with about 1,500 kilograms per hour is the amount of water that this condensing unit would be able to produce from the steam coming in. Now, one thing that we should do, uh, we, we could declare victory and say that we've solved the problem, but really what we need to do, we need to check the Reynolds number uh, on each of these horizontal cylinders. And if you recall, we were using a relationship that was very much like uh, New Salt's relationship, which was derived for a laminar flow. So this is what we were using, and it was modified a little bit to take into account the horizontal cylinder. Uh, but what we need to do, we need to check the Reynolds number. And so that's what we're going to do in the next step here. So which Reynolds number do we use? Well, in convective or condensation, I should say, uh, heat transfer with condensation, you recall there are many, many different Reynolds numbers that we've been talking about. I'm going to pull out the one that has the mass flux in it because that uh, is what we know in this problem. And we divide by the perimeter times the uh, dynamic viscosity of the liquid. Now, what is the perimeter? Well, the perimeter, if we have a tube that is like this and it's going into the plane of the page, and so the length of that tube is one meter, the perimeter is essentially just the length that... Uh, uh, it would be in this direction. So remember for the vertical plate, the perimeter was B. So when we were looking at the vertical flat plate, uh, the perimeter was B. Well, in this case, it is just going to be the length of our pipe, which turns out to be our tube bundle has a length of one meter. So the perimeter is one meter for this particular problem. And so with that, what we're gonna do, we're gonna begin with the top tube so the top tube, the mass flow rate, and now I'm going to use it in kilograms per second. And I'll divide by all 400 tubes because that will tell me the mass flow rate for an individual tube. And so with this, plugging the values into the Reynolds number, we get 14.27, which is less than 30, and therefore it is laminar, so that's good, because new salts relation was derived assuming that we had laminar film flow coming over. Now let's take a look at what's going on on the bottom tube. And so in order to get that mass flow rate, it's essentially the one for a single tube multiplied by 20, because that would be the number of tubes in the vertical direction. And we get RE bottom of 285.4 which is wavy flow or wavy laminar. So we are actually pushing it a little bit. Uh, the correlation uh, would be starting to break down here. But I did not give you a correlation for a wavy laminar on a horizontal tube and consequently we're going to have to take it as it is and assume that this is the correct answer. But, but realizing that we are pushing things a little bit because uh, by the time we get down to the bottom tube, uh, we have the case even by the second tube, we multiply that by two, we're pretty close to 30. 
So by the second tube in this vertical tube bundle, we're starting to transition and, and move into the wavy laminar regime. Now remember, turbulent would be at 1800, so we're a ways away from turbulent, but we are in the wavy laminar regime. Uh, but anyways, what that does, that demonstrates a problem uh, for a horizontal cylinder and then how to determine uh, the mass flow rate for a condensing unit when you have a tube bundle. And, and again, that was for shell side condensation because the condensation was on the outside of the tubes. All right, in the next few lectures, what we're going to be doing is taking a look at a system or systems that combine a lot of the aspects of heat transfer that we've been looking at thus far in the course. And uh, the topic that we're going to look at are heat exchangers. And heat exchangers are very interesting. There are many, many different types that exist, but essentially what we're doing is we're transferring energy, thermal energy, from one fluid to another fluid. So that is the way to describe what a heat exchanger is and does. Uh, essentially what it does is it transfers energy, remember I said thermal energy, between two fluids at different temperatures and it, we need to keep the two fluids apart and consequently they're separated by a solid wall. Now heat exchangers are used all over the place. We, we use them in many, many, many different types of engineering systems. And so let's take a look at a few different types of heat exchangers. But uh, before we get there, applications of heat exchangers uh, could consist of the following. And this is just a very limited subset. So power production, that would be uh, anything from a Rankin power plant to internal combustion engine, even a Stirling engine, uh, any of those cycles. Uh, it also is used in space heating. So heating of buildings or homes and air conditioning. So cooling of spaces, it's used for refrigeration. And other, another example, chemical processing. So we use heat exchangers in many, many different engineering applications. And what we're going to do now, we're going to take a look at some of those applications. And we'll also take a look at a couple of different designs of heat exchangers as we go through and, and look at uh, these next set of images and videos. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin with transportation and automotive transportation. And this is an old car from 1893. It's a quadricycle by Peugeot. And it was one of the very early gasoline powered automobiles. But you can see there's a heat exchanger behind the wheel. And when you zoom in uh, closer, that's another view of the heat exchanger by, by the uh, front wheel of this Peugeot automobile. This is the vis-a-vis. -vis. It is another car that was produced in France uh, by Dion and Bouton. But when you look at the front of it, you can see something that looks like a heat exchanger. And sure enough, that is a very, very early radiator, uh, similar to what we saw on the Peugeot. And there are the fins on the radiator. They're a little bent with time, but this is from 1899. And this speedy looking vehicle, this is a Ford Model T. And you can see the heat exchanger on the front. Ford, in a period of 20 years, starting in 1908, sold 15 million of these. And so uh, automob automobiles were all over. And uh, as you can see, 
Today we do have automobiles everywhere and, and this is rush hour early morning. If you look at the front of the vehicles you'll see uh, kind of a lighter temperature that signifies heat. Uh, that one doesn't have a lot of heat in it uh, but there are some that do and that would be the location of the radiator that we have in the vehicles. So anyways you can see the progression and the use of heat exchangers in power production of automobile applications. Uh, because any power cycle we always have to reject some of the thermal energy and we often do that with the heat exchanger. Now moving on, I talked about air conditioning and refrigeration, so let's take a look at those applications. And here we can see a refrigerator, this is one uh, that has the compressor and the heat exchanger in the bottom. You can see the IR camera, there's a fan circulating air. So that's a, a fluid to air heat exchanger. Uh, if you've ever stayed in a hotel, I'm sure you've heard this all night long. Uh, the, the, this is a, a, a heat pump, uh, either for heating or for cooling inside of a hotel room. And it'll cycle in and out throughout the night. There are heat exchangers within there uh, to cool the air that is, is going through that. The, this is a larger type of heat exchanger used for uh, refrigeration or cooling applications, uh, air conditioning. and You can see the... Uh, heat exchangers are at an angle. This is a view of Tokyo uh, and if you look down any large city you'll find heat exchangers. The, these are the uh, cooling systems used for rejecting the heat from the air conditioning for large large buildings and, and so that would be industrial applications that we have of both refrigeration as well as air conditioning. Now what we're going to do, we're going to go into industrial applications and we're going to begin with the aerial coolers. And, and so the aerial coolers are, uh, you, you have air on one side and, and you could have a process fluid or something else on the other, could be a gas, but uh, the aerial cooling units begin with tubes and there we can see the tubes lying uh, ready to, to have fins placed on them. This is what fins look like before they're put on the tubes, uh, they come in big rolls. Uh, they're un, unrolled and, and there you can see the fin coming out uh, and it is fed into a machine. You can see the tube spinning in the foreground there and there is the tube spinning. The fin comes in and then it is wrapped around the tube and, and so that's the process of putting fins on tubes and, and there you can see uh, the tube coming out that has the fins on it and then after doing this with many many different uh, tubes you get things that look like this and there you can see the fins on the tubes and then a big stack and and these would all be used and and eventually they would go into the aerial cooling units and and so that is what the fin tube looks like and those ultimately get attached to header boxes and so here we can see a procedure whereby the tubes are being welded to the header box on the inside and so this is a special welder that can go in and do a circular weld on the tube inside of the header box and a very very skilled uh, practice in order to do that welding as you can see this welder performing the practice there and sometimes the tubes are expanded and so here we have a tube expander uh, pneumatic driven and each of the tubes inside of the header box is expanded and that's the way that it is connected. And, and so for the aerial cooling units we attach the tubes with the fins to the header box and then this is what it looks like after and uh, here's an image of it being pressure tested to ensure everything is uh, uh, up to quality specifications. This is where it eventually goes. These are the fans that will circulate the air over the heat exchanger, you put it all together, you put it on a truck and you transport it to the field. And so here you can see aerial cooling units being assembled uh, and they could be high, they could be anywhere within the where the chemical engineers put them and the mechanical engineers have to deal with it. Uh, and then th this is an aerial cooling unit uh, at a compressor station and again you can see all of the uh, different units like we saw being fabricated. So. Uh, that is petrochemical applications or chemical processing where we have aerial cooling units. Now, another form of heat exchanger that we're going to look at in the next few lectures is the shell and tube heat exchanger. So let's begin by looking at that. 
So here we have a model of a shell and tube heat exchanger. You can see the baffles in the front. And, and so the baffles are what the tubes are going through. And then at the end, there are tube sheets. So there is the tube sheet and there is a baffle. The baffles are partially cut for the fluid to go around that, that is within the shell. And, and there you can see all the tubes together with the baffles and, and the tube sheet at the end. Uh, you, you can see again there, that's a side view of the baffles. And then that's an end view of the tube sheet. Uh, with all of the tubes coming out. And then when they're done, that's what it looks like. So that is a shell and tube heat exchanger uh, when it is completed. Now, there have been some technology innovations that have come along over time with shell and tube heat exchangers, and we'll take a look at a couple of those. Uh, the first one uh, has to do with a spiral baffle. And, and so here we can see the baffles are, uh, they're, they're, they're spiraled or helical. And what that does is it causes the fluid to flow around it. It would reduce the pressure drop and it would probably reduce bowling and increase heat transfer as well. And so that is a spiral baffle that we're looking at in this image. And there we can see a, a closer in view uh, of the spiral baffle. And this is another, this is M baffle where it's a longitudinal, basically a double pipe heat exchanger. And, and these baffles, essentially what they do, they create a lot of turbulence and enhance mixing, again, reducing fouling. So those are some of the different types of heat exchangers that we're going to be looking at. It gives you an idea in terms of where heat exchangers are used. They're used all over the place. And, and so consequently, that's why uh, heat exchangers are such a very important topic in a course on heat transfer. And the thing that's nice about it is that heat exchangers combine everything that we've been looking at thus far in this course. They combine conduction across the wall. We have convection. Uh, you can have condensation. You can have boiling. You can have everything going on within heat exchangers. And so uh, they really do represent a neat synthesis of everything that we have learned thus far in the course. So. Uh, we're going to be looking at heat exchangers in the next few lectures, and that will uh, guide us through uh, what we're going to be taking a look at. We'll look at heat exchangers. In this segment, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at the ways that heat exchangers are classified. And so the two ways that we classify heat exchangers, we look at the way that the flow is arranged and we'll be looking at examples of that. You can have parallel flow, you can have cross flow, you can have mixed fluid, unmixed fluid. Uh, and the type of construction, and, and there are different types of construction. We've already seen in the previous segment looking at different types of construction of heat exchangers. But these are the ways that we classify heat exchangers, and it also guides our analysis uh, depending upon which equations we would apply. It would depend on the type of construction or the flow arrangement. So what we're going to begin with, we're going to begin with the most simple type of design of a heat exchanger. And that's where you have two pipes, one smaller diameter than the other. They're coaxial and you have fluid going either in parallel or in counter flow with respect to one another. And there's heat exchange between uh, the, uh, the pipe wall, uh, but between the two pipes. So uh, let's begin looking at that. Okay, so here we have two different uh, types of flow arrangements uh, for what we refer to as being the double pipe heat exchanger. And in uh, both of the figures, one over here, that is inner tube flow as well. And then on the outside, we have what we refer to as being our outer tube flow. Now, with these two 
uh, the, these are basically the, the same type of construction. The only difference is the direction of the fluid. And we would refer to the one on the left as being the parallel flow configuration or arrangement. And that is because you can see the two fluid streams are going in the same direction. And that is why we call it parallel flow. And then all of the heat transfer is taking a pla place across this uh, interface here and here. So that is where our heat exchange is taking place. And then the design on the right that we refer to as being the counter flow, flow arrangement. So those are two examples of the simplest, which is the double pipe or concentric tube heat exchanger. Another flow arrangement and type of construction that we have is that for cross flow. So a cross flow heat exchanger. So this is a different type of construction. And this is one where what we have is a tube bundle. And so out of each of these tubes, we would have flow coming out. And then going perpendicular to that or near perpendicular, we would have a cross flow. And for this particular uh, type of construction, you can have fins or no fins on your tube bundle. And depending upon the type of construction, if you do have fins, you uh, may have a scenario where the cross flow does not mix with itself. And so if you imagine if you have fins that are all connected, uh, so if you had fins that were going like this and going across all of them and then another set of fins, uh, it's kind of a poor drawing. Yeah. So then another set of fins going like that and then another one. So if you have fins like that, what's going to happen is the fluid will not be able to mix uh, in the cross plane uh, in terms of the cross flow. And the two flow, obviously, the fluid there is not going to mix because they are all in individual tubes. Uh, so you can have mixed and unmixed and you can have finned and unfinned, di different types of configurations for cross flow heat exchangers. But typically this one, although not exclusively, but, but quite often, uh, th this would be gas to liquid is what we're looking at for the heat exchange. And when I say liquid, it may not be a liquid. It could be a vapor going to a liquid. And that would be the case of condensation. And I guess you could also be going through a phase change the other way, going from liquid to vapor, depending upon the particular design. Uh, but anyway, it typically gas to liquid. That is the cross flow heat exchanger. So it's an, another type of construction. And again, you can have different flow arrangements, just like I said, depending on if it's mixed or unmixed, if you have fins or no fins. Uh, and then the next type of heat exchanger that we're going to look at, these are heavier units that are used in many industrial applications, but uh, these are shell and tube heat exchangers. So let's take a look. Uh, now the arrangement is going to depend upon how many shell and tube passes you actually have. Uh, you can have two shell units sitting next to each other, shell and tube, and then you would be going through two shells there. Uh, or the tubes, you can actually have them do multi-pass in a single unit. Uh, they're all different types of geometrical configurations that you can have for this. Uh, but let me just show you the most basic one.
Okay. So what do we have here? Let's uh, label the different things that are in here. Now, uh, to begin with, we have fluid coming in, and that is on our tube inlet. And what's going to happen is that fluid is going to come into this manifold on the end, and it is going to be forced to go into these tubes and then it is going to flow along the tubes, like so. And you'll have hundreds and hundreds of these tubes. Well, it depends on the construction, but many, many tubes. And then it comes out, and it comes into another manifold where there is some mixing. But then it goes out through this exit here, and that is our tube outlet. Now, there will be another flow coming along here, and this is referred to as being the shell inlet, because that will be on the outside. There's a shell outside of our tube bundle, which is on the inside, and the shell flow is forced to go normal or cross flow across our tube sheet and then it comes here and it turns direction and goes around and then it comes and it turns direction again oh well, that's a very big section there uh, typically they wouldn't look that way i am not an artist i apologize but you get the idea we're engineers we can figure it out okay so what, what's happening is the flow is going through like that and then it's coming out in this direction shell outlet So that is the direction of the two fluid streams and we have a couple of other things in the construction here that I would like to point out. First of all, there are these plates here. You can see two of them in my drawing. These are called baffles or baffle plates and, and there are different designs that they have. Uh, sometimes they'll have designs where it's like a helical pattern and, and you get more efficient mixing that way. Um, and it, because what will happen if, if you look at the fluid mechanics here, th this is horrible fluid mechanically. You're going to have massive separation downstream of these baffles when the flow comes around uh, and you'll have significant pressure drop. Usually you're not worried about that much pressure drop with these units. Uh, well, you'll have a lot of pressure drop, but you, you have a lot of, uh, you'd have a big pump circulating the fluid through. So pressure drop is usually not your main concern. But nonetheless, uh, you're going to have separated flow downstream of these baffles and the, that will minimize the heat transfer that you're having in these regions here. So sometimes they'll change the baffles, different types of design in order to enhance mixing. Uh, the other thing that we have with the construction on this side is a tube sheet. And on the other side is another tube sheet. And so that is where the tubes come through and they're usually welded to that tube sheet. Uh, in terms of the baffles, they wouldn't be, uh, typically they're not welded, they, they are free to move back and forth if they need to. Uh, but you want to have the baffles there to minimize flow vibration. You can have flow vi vibration in these things and it also forces the flow to go around multiple times. So well, that's kind of a poor drawing of a shell and tube heat exchanger, but hopefully you get the idea in terms of what is going on. So and there we have shell flow forces the uh, flow normal to the tubes, as we mentioned, and we have baffles inside of the unit. They support the tubes. Now, if you look at the tube sheet and you take a look at what it looks like, the tube sheet will span, obviously, the entire uh, cylindrical of the shell. And within the sheet itself, we're going to have all these little holes drilled. And that is where our tube bundle is going to come through. And it'll go on. So that is what the tube sheet looks like. Now, if you look at a baffle plate, it will not span the entire. So it will look more like this. And it'll be there will be a cutout. And that's where the fluid comes around. Uh, but then you would have enough to support the tubes. And you'll notice that, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, hey, I did this good. Uh, I did it well. You, you actually have a couple of tubes or a number of tubes here that are free span. 
and, and so they are not confined by a baffle at that location. But that is to allow the fluid to get by. So if we look back at the shell and tube, you have this, and then you have this, and you have this. So the fluid is going around like that. And, and that's why you don't want the baffle plate to go all the way uh, throughout the entire cross section of your shell. So that is the shell and tube heat exchanger. Um, there is another design, although we're not going to look at it in the lectures here, but these are compact heat exchangers. So compact heat exchangers are designed in a manner where you try to maximize the contact area between the two fluid streams. And, and, and so these are ones that have very, very large contact area. You could have plates connected together with gaskets and the fluid goes between those plates. Uh, we won't be examining those, but that is another form of heat exchanger. And they're, they're called compact because they're small in, in terms of how much space they, they take, but they're very effective in terms of transferring thermal energy from one fluid stream to another. So those are different uh, designs or configurations, types of construction, as well as different flow arrangements. Uh, what we'll be doing in the next segment is taking a look at the temperature distributions between the fluid streams in these heat exchangers. When you're looking at heat exchanger problems, uh, quite often it's beneficial to write out the uh, temperature distribution as a function of position within the heat exchanger. And acknowledging there are different types of configurations that, that we have, uh, quite often this is assuming that we have a double pipe type configuration, but it, it does help the, the student of heat transfer get an idea in terms of what is happening within the heat exchanger. So we're going to sketch out a couple, uh, one with parallel flow and then the other with counter flow and take a look at what is happening to the temperatures as the fluid goes through those units. So what we have here is a schematic showing the case of parallel flow and we have a couple of different temperatures on here and, and first of all you'll notice the inlet to the heat exchanger is over here and we have our hot fluid coming in and a cold fluid coming in and typically what we'll do is we will label this T hot in and this T cold in and then this will be T hot out and T cold out. And we will also have different uh, temperature differentials, one here, and sometimes we will call that delta T at the beginning of the heat exchanger, and then this delta T over here is delta T at location L. So that is the case of parallel flow with the parallel heat exchanger. Now let's take a look at what happens with counter flow. Now, when we have a counterflow heat exchanger, a couple of things that you will notice. First of all, if you look at the cold fluid, so it's coming in over here, it can actually exit the heat exchanger at a temperature that is higher than the exit temperature of the hot fluid. So that is one thing when you have counterflow. And if we look back on parallel flow, that is not possible the temperature of the fluid exiting for the cold stream is never going to rise above the temperature exiting for the hot stream. Uh, if you have a heat exchanger of infinite area, they will come to the same temperature. You'll get thermal equilibrium. You'd never have a heat uh, exchanger that way, but uh, theoretically you could think of it. Uh, however, when we look at counter flow, we actually can have the cold fluid going to a higher temperature than the hot fluid exiting. And again, we have temperature labels and nomenclature. So uh, for this one, I would call this one T hot in, and this would be T hot out. 
and then this would be T cold in and T cold out. And, and so that's a nomenclature that you'll see appear when I'm solving problems in an upcoming lecture. Uh, and again, we have temperature differentials here. This would be delta T at zero, and this here would be delta T at L. So those are cases of parallel flow, counter flow. There are two other conditions that we can have when we're looking at the temperature distribution, and those pertain to whether or not we have the fluid going through a phase change. So let's take a look at those two right now. So uh, the first unit that we're going to look at, this is a condensing unit. And you recall from earlier lectures, we've looked at the process of condensing. And uh, what is happening here is our cold fluid stream is entering. So that would be T cold in, T cold out. And as our other fluid is going through a phase change process, uh, the cold fluid is heating up and consequently uh, again we can have so and what you'll notice is uh, T hot in T hot out could be in either one but it's not going to change because we're going through a phase change whenever we go through a phase change the temperature is constant so that, that's what a uh, condensing unit would look like and I guess this could also be T hot in and that could be T hot in as well. So it could be either way. Uh, what we have here, this is our delta T at zero. And then this here is our delta T at L. So that's a condensing unit. Uh, and then finally, the last one that we'll look at for the temperature distribution is that when we have boiling. And so we can see when we have boiling, uh, what is happening is we have a fluid and it's losing energy, so that would be T hot in, T hot out, and it is losing energy, which is causing the phase change of the other fluid stream, and so that would be at the saturation temperature, yeah, I'll just do Tsat. but that would be the cold fluid stream in or out. And what do we have? We have temperature differentials here, just like before. So those are temperature diagrams. Sometimes it helps to draw them out. I don't always do it because uh, after solving a lot of these problems, uh, you uh, start to just kind of, uh, you get a little sloppy, I guess you could say. but I will write them out when I solve the problems in the lectures. Okay, so those are different temperature diagrams. Again, they're uh, helpful when you're trying to figure out what's going on in a heat exchanger. And I do realize that when you get to the uh, different types of arrangements like shell and tube heat exchangers, or uh, if you have aerial cooling units, cross flow exchangers, th things can be a little bit more complex, but still these diagrams do kind of give you uh, some help in terms of understanding how the temperatures are with respect to one another uh, for what we call the hot fluid and the cold fluid as well as the inlet and the exit temperatures for both of those fluid streams. So those are temperature distributions. What we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at uh, the overall heat transfer coefficient, which is quite often used in heat exchangers, and we will use it later on when we do uh, the NTU analysis, uh, effectiveness NTU analysis, but uh, that will be what we'll be covering in the next segment. <laughs>to take a look at a heat transfer coefficient that is used for heat exchangers and that is what we refer to as being the overall heat transfer coefficient.
So when we're looking at heat exchangers, uh, we're exchanging thermal energy between two different fluid streams. It could be liquid or gas. Um, and typically what we have, we will have uh, convective, force convective heat transfer on one side, conduction through whatever the interface is, and then force convective heat transfer on the other side. And, and consequently, the overall heat transfer coefficient characterizes all three of those processes. And then you can have other things going on. You can have fins on the heat exchanger that you would then model. Uh, you can have fouling going on, which is buildup of deposits, which uh, negatively impacts the heat exchange between the two fluid streams. Uh, but what we're going to do, we're going to derive an expression or come up with the expression for the overall heat transfer coefficient. And we're going to begin by looking at a double pipe heat exchanger. So if you recall, uh, that was, this would be a parallel flow configuration. Uh, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to label the fluid on the inside as being TA. That's the temperature of the fluid. And I'm going to assume that the convective heat transfer coefficient on the inside is HI. And then for the fluid in the outer pipe, what I'll do there is I will label the temperature TB and H outer and that would then characterize the force convective heat transfer on the outside of the tube. Now what we're going to do we want to express this we're going to use thermal resistances and so if you recall we looked at that uh, quite a long time ago in the course but we're going to pull that out now and we're going to use it. So let's draw our thermal resistance circuit and then the different thermal resistance values. Okay, so what we have here, uh, we have three different thermal resistances. One is for convective heat transfer in A, and if we look back, A was being our internal fluid. So that is the internal. Then we have conduction through the wall, and then we have convection on the fluid on the, in the outer pipe. And consequently, we can also write here that if we look at the wall temperatures on the pipe, the inner pipe, it would go from TI to TO, and Q is flowing through. And so let's write out our thermal resistances now. Okay, so those are the three thermal resistances that we have within this system. And now what we're going to do, we're going to combine those together and we're going to solve for the heat flow, very much like what we did when we looked at thermal resistances earlier on. So in this, uh, what we're now going to do, we are going to rewrite the equation. So Q is equal to, and the form that we're looking at here, uh, you'll recognize it is this here, and that's what we've seen before. But what I am now going to do is I'm going to rewrite this in terms of this overall heat transfer coefficient, and we'll have a UA delta T. And in this, what I am doing is I am assuming that the sum of the thermal resistances is equal to the inverse of this overall heat transfer coefficient times an area that we have not yet defined. So U, this is defined as being our overall heat transfer coefficient. And it can be defined either in terms of the inner or the outer area of our double pipe heat exchanger. So what am I referring to? Well, if you look at your wall, this is the inner pipe, and we have, that's the wall thickness. So area inner would be here, and area outer would be there. So it depends if you use your uh, internal or your external radius or diameter of the interior pipe. So what we're going to do we're going to write out two different overall heat transfer coefficients. And so those are two different ways of expressing the overall heat transfer coefficient, depending if you use your inner or outer tube area. 
Now, typical values that we find in heat exchangers are as follows. So you can see a range of values. If we're going through a phase change, it's going to be quite high. Uh, if we have water to air, the water will have a higher convective heat transfer. The liquid will have a higher convective heat transfer coefficient as shown there. And then at the lower end, if you have gas, 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 you recall the convective heat transfer coefficients were not as hard, high as a liquid. And consequently, the overall value is going to drop somewhat there. So these are numbers that are, are quite often, well, will be used in the analysis. Sometimes it's given to you. Sometimes you're trying to solve it. So a lot of what we're going to be doing when we're doing heat exchanger analysis is trying to estimate uh, a unit's overall heat transfer coefficient. Now, one thing is, let's say you know uh, the value of U. So maybe you've determined this empirically. And if you know the geometry A, Things should be good, right? But let's take a look at what our equation looked like. Uh, we had Q is equal to UA delta T. So usually we're after the amount of heat transfer. Maybe we know the amount of heat transfer. That's usually what we're after. Uh, but looking at this equation, so let's say you know U, you've determined that, you know your area, and you've been asked to find Q. Well, what delta T are you going to use? And, and this is what we're going to be looking at in the next segment, uh, in the next lecture actually, because this is not a simple trivial solution. If you even just look at the simple double pipe heat exchanger like this, uh, what is happening is as the fluid is coming through, uh, one fluid stream is heating while the other is cooling, and consequently you are going to have different values of delta t, that is going to be delta t as a function of position. And we did look at this earlier on in the course when we looked at uh, pipe flow internal force convection, and we came up with an expression. We're going to come up with a very similar expression in the next lecture, uh, but that is in order to enable us to figure out how to express delta t, given that delta t changes as a function of position within the unit. So anyways, that, that's a bit of an introduction to heat exchangers. We looked at different types of heat exchangers. Uh, we looked at how to model the temperature distribution, or at least schematically represent it. And then uh, we've just looked at the overall heat transfer coefficient, which is something that we'll carry through uh, when we're doing the analysis. But uh, we're going in the next lecture, we're going to try to figure out how to estimate this value of delta T. All right, in this segment, what we are going to do, we're going to derive the equation for the log mean temperature difference. And this will be kind of a long lecture, a long segment. Uh, the derivation is not that difficult, but uh, we'll step through the process of coming up with this equation that is used quite often for heat exchanger analysis. So if we're dealing with the heat exchanger where we know our inlet and exit conditions, what we can do, we can write the heat transfer. We saw this equation in the last lecture. And U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. A is the surface area corresponding to the way that U is defined. Remember, it could either be the inner or the outer area. And finally, delta Tm so delta Tm is an appropriate, now what does appropriate mean? It's an appropriate mean temperature difference. Uh, and that is one that characterizes the temperature difference. Remember the two fluid streams are changing temperature as they flow through our exchanger. And what we're going to do, we're going to model it as being a, a double pipe a parallel flow arrangement heat exchanger. And it, 
we will come up with a value for delta tm and then if you want to apply it to different types of heat exchangers there's a correction factor f that is applied and we'll get to that uh, later on in this lecture uh, but what we're going to begin with we're going to begin with deriving delta tm okay so let's begin by drawing a schematic of a double pipe and what I'm doing here with the double pipe heat exchanger if you recall I'm zooming in on one of the walls so this is what we were talking about in terms of the geometry what it looks like for the double pipe so we have fluid going through here and we have fluid going through here now what I'm doing, I'm zooming in on one of these wall sections, and that's what we're looking at here. Okay, so that is the schematic that we're going to be using for the derivation. And, and what you can see in the upper part, we've zoomed in on the interface wall between our two fluid streams. And what's happening is the fluid, the cold fluid is coming along and its temperature is changing. We're assuming that it's going to be going up. Uh, the hot fluid is coming along and its temperature is also changing. We don't know what DTH is right yet. Uh, but we do know that the heat transfer is taking place across some differential element. We'll call that dA, and the amount of heat transfer is dQ. Now, looking at the temperature diagram, remember this is a parallel flow double pipe heat exchanger. And what we have here, we, we have our delta T, and this is actually what we're going to be trying to solve for. And again, we can see we have heat exchange going from the hot fluid stream down to the cool fluid stream. And in the process, the hot fluid is changing and the cold fluid is changing. This is acting over some differential element dA. So consistency between physically what is going on as you zoom in on a section of the heat exchanger as well as with the temperature diagram. So what we're now going to do, we're going to take this and we're going to write out a number of equations that we're going to work with that are modeling the processes that we're looking at for this particular schematic. So let's begin doing that. And we'll begin by looking at equations for the entire heat exchanger. And so looking at the hot side, and these are equations that we use over and over and over again when we're uh, looking at heat transfer and heat exchangers. It's the mass flow rate of the hot fluid times the specific heat capacity of the hot fluid. Now, you usually have to average that uh, because the fluid is going to change between the inlet and the exit. So we have that one. And then looking at the cold side, we can write out a similar equation. Ah, I made a little error here. I was wondering about that because the sine of Q would be wrong if I wrote it that way. So this should be uh, TC2 minus TC1. So be careful of that when you're working with heat exchangers uh, because cold is going, TC2 is greater than TC1. So in order for Q to be positive, we have to write it that way. Uh, now looking at the differential element, we can write out similar equations, but for the differential amount of heat transfer, And notice here for the hot side, I introduced the minus sign because the hot temperature is going down whereas the cold is going up. And so in terms of dt, the way the dt is defined, we have to introduce that negative sign in order to make those consistent. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to label these equations. I'm going to call this equation 1. And this is going to be 2. This is 3. And this is 4. And we have a few more equations, so let's keep writing those out. Now we have Newton's law of cooling that we can use. 
and this is looking at the differential amount of heat transfer using our overall heat transfer coefficient. So I'm going to do uh, the overall times delta T times dA, the differential element area. And in this expression, delta T is the hot fluid temperature minus the cold fluid temperature. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to solve for. We're trying to solve for this delta T. So I'm going to call this equation 5. And we can also rewrite The, the differential of the delta T so that's another equation that will enable us to further our analysis so now what we're going to do we have all of our equations we're going to start subbing different ones into different equations and we will begin by subbing 3 and 4 into 6 So we get that. Uh, now what we want to be able to do, uh, we want to be able to replace this. So we're going to sub equation 5 in for dq. And so we get this. Now what are we going to do with that? Let's bring the delta t over to the left hand side. So we get this equation, we have d delta t by delta t on the left. You can see that this is going to start turning into a logarithm when we integrate. Uh, and that is what we're going to do in the next step. We're going to integrate this equation. So we get this equation here. Now when we integrate the left hand side, that's where we get the natural logarithm, hence log mean temperature difference. That's where that's going to come from. So we have this. Now what we're going to want to do, we, we want to get rid of the mass flow rate on the left hand side of the equation because we want to be able to express this in terms of temperatures. And in order to do that, we're going to use equations 1 and 2. Okay, so we're going to go through and we're going to sub in for that. And we have that. Now, usually we don't look at an equation like that. We want Q on the left-hand side, so let's rearrange and get Q on the left. So we get this big long expression here, and this is our delta Tm. So that is the way to calculate the temperature between the two fluids, and this is referred to as being the log mean temperature difference. And sometimes you'll see it written with the acronym LMTD. Now, with this, we assumed a parallel flow double pipe heat exchanger. So if you want to apply this to other types of heat exchangers, uh, and we'll see later a factor, a correction factor comes in that you would get that out of figures. Uh, but what we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at the temperatures, how these temperatures map to different types of configurations, uh, be it parallel uh, or counter flow. And then we'll uh, solve some problems using the LMTD method. And it works quite well with the exception of it, you don't know all four temperatures of your fluid streams. And so we'll see later on in this lecture that this technique does break down uh, you have to do an iteration, which can be a bit of a pain. And then there's another technique, uh, the effectiveness NTU, that we'll be looking at. But, but for now, we're going to play with LMTD for a little bit and explore where it can take us. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next segments. All right, in the last segment, what we did is we derived the equation for the log mean temperature difference. And so what we're going to do now, we're going to take a look at 
how the temperature is actually within the exchanger. And remember, we're looking at parallel flow double pipe exchanger. Uh, how the temperature is mapped to LMTD. And just to write out the expression that we had. And so that's the expression. Now, one thing to note, and this is a bit of a shortcut, or not a shortcut, but it makes it a little easier to remember. And notice that this expression here, TH2 minus TC2, is the one that is in the numerator and then th1 minus tc1 is in the denominator so that is always the way that we have it configured for the lmtd uh, temperature and and so it's uh, useful if you remember those it makes it a little easier when you're doing your calculations but what we're now going to do is we're going to go back and and really th this was in the derivation but i'm going to summarize it again uh, and figure out what these temperatures are and how they map to where we are in the exchanger. And so if we're dealing with a parallel flow heat exchanger, what we have is this is T hot 1 and this is T hot 2. And this is T cold 1 and T cold 2. So that is the way that we designate the temperatures for a parallel flow double pipe. Now looking at counter flow, so if we're looking at a counter flow heat exchanger, then we would have TH1 here, TH2 there, and T cold 1 here, and T cold 2 there. So you can see that what we're doing, we're putting this as being location one, and this is location two. Again here, that is location one, location two. And then the, the temperatures would either be hot or cold, and they would correspond. And, and so that's how you can get the temperatures uh, that you would use within the LMTD expression as shown above. Now, this was derived for a double pipe heat exchanger, and so we do have to make a minor correction if we want to apply it to heat exchangers other than double pipe. Okay, so if we're trying to apply LMTD to something other than a double pipe uh, configuration, then what we would do, we would write out our heat transfer, overall heat transfer coefficient, the area that the overall heat transfer coefficient is computed for, this correction factor F, and then delta Tm. And F is a correction factor. And delta Tm is the log mean temperature difference for counter flow double pipe. So essentially what we're doing is we're mapping one to the other. Now where do you get F from? Uh, F is from figures. I'm not going to give you any of them. You would find those in any textbook. But you would have them for cross flow heat exchangers. Uh, so radiators, things like that. You'd also have them for shell and tube heat exchangers. You could find the value of F and those would be uh, tabulated in these figures and you would look up the value from that. So what we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to solve some problems using the LMTD and we'll see how it works. So that's where we're going. <laughs> We're now going to solve an example problem using the log mean temperature difference approach. And for this problem, we're looking at a feed water heater. 
And what I'm going to do, I'm going to begin just by writing out what is known. I'm not going to write out the problem statement. So we know that we have a feed water heater. We're told that it's a shell and tube heat exchanger and we're given information for both the shell and the tube. So for the shell side, we're told that it is a one pass and the fluid going through on the shell side is condensing steam with a saturation temperature of 120 degrees C. And then for the tube, Okay, uh, the other thing that we're given, we're given the overall heat transfer coefficient. And we're told to find, we're looking for the area of the heat exchanger that would correspond to that overall heat transfer coefficient. So when you look at this, uh, we know a number of things. We know the inlet temperature on the tube side. So this is the cold fluid. We know the exit temperature. We know the inlet and exit on the shell side. So that's our hot fluid because it's going through a condensation process. So the temperature will remain at 120 degrees C. So those are all the elements that we said that we need in order to apply the log mean temperature difference. So let's go ahead and use the analysis for LMTD. So we're going to use LMTD. Now note that this is not a double pipe heat exchanger. So what we're going to do, remember I told you that there are correction factors that exist when you're dealing with heat exchangers that are not double pipes. So what we're going to do, we're going to model it as a counter flow double pipe unit with the correction factor F that we'll get from a figure. I won't give you the figures, but I'll show you essentially what would be in the figure and you can find these in textbooks. Uh, the equation that we're going to use here, it's going to be the following. where delta Tm is our log mean temperature difference. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin by sketching out the temperature distribution. Remember I said that that can quite often help you when you're solving these problems in order to understand what is going on. Okay, so we have our two fluid streams in the heat exchanger uh, as shown. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to label these in order to apply the LMTD. First of all, this here is temperature hot at 1, and this is temperature hot at 2. This is temperature cold at 1, this is temperature cold at 2. So what I'm doing is assuming that that's location 1 and that's location 2. With that, we can calculate the log mean temperature difference. And the other thing that I am going to do is when we're trying to determine the uh, F factor that we have for LMTD, given that uh, this, this is a shell and tube exchanger and not a double pipe, there are other symbols and I'll show you a schematic in a moment that will help make sense in terms of where I'm getting these symbols from. But essentially, these are the fluid streams that will then enable us to determine that F factor. Or these are the temperatures for the fluid streams, I should say. Okay, so notice we have this, 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 and this. Those all lead to the F factor. Now, the equations that we have here... Uh, we're going to begin uh, by determining the amount of heat transfer by looking at the cold fluid. So this here is the cold fluid. And this up here would be the hot fluid. And it is condensing and consequently it is not changing temperature as it goes through. But what we can do, we can write out Q and this is going to be the heat exchange is the mass flow rate of water times the specific heat of water. 
and the water was the cold fluid, but I'll just put water, and then TC1 minus TC2. So that's taking the hot temperature minus the cooler temperature. Now, in this, what we need to do, we need to be careful about this because the specific heat of water uh, or of any fluid is a function of temperature. And consequently, what we need to do is we need to be able to uh, obtain that at the average temperature. So average water temperature. With that, we get CP 4182.6. Joules per kilogram Kelvin. Now, I did say CP is a function of temperature uh, for all fluids. I should make a disclaimer there because if you look in thermodynamics, helium, uh, the CP value is a constant. It is not a function of temperature. And I think it's for all of the other gases that are in that column in the periodic table. It turns out that the CP is not a, a does not change with temperature, but anyways, that's just an aside. Um, so we're dealing with this. We have the value of CP for water, and that's at the average. So with that, we can calculate the heat transfer. So we know the mass flow rate of water was 2.5 kilograms per second. Be careful when you're pulling the values out of the back of the book or wherever you're getting them from. Sometimes they're in kilojoules. Uh, per kilogram Kelvin and so you have to be uh, careful to put that in joules and then we have 100 minus 30 we end up with then 731.96 kilowatts is the heat exchange now that is giving us the heat transfer we want to determine the area so what we need to do next is determine the log mean temperature difference so let's do that next so if we go back and look at our temperature diagram, what I'm doing here is doing uh, basically the first one is T hot 2 minus T cold 2. So it's this differential. And then the other differential that we're going to be evaluating is that one there. So that's what we're doing here. And dividing by the logarithm, and remember I said that the numerator was just going to be the first term that we have here. So it's this one, and then the denominator is this one. And with that, we get delta Tm, or the log mean temperature difference, is 46.54 degrees C. Okay, so we're almost there. We have Q is UAF delta Tm and what we have thus far we've determined that uh, U was known we're looking for area we just solved for that we still need to get this F factor and that is the correction factor for the fact that this is not a double pipe heat exchanger it's a shell and tube heat exchanger and this is where we're going to pull those different temperature values that I was showing you when we looked at the temperature diagram and for that, I'm going to draw a little schematic. And, and this is going to vary from book to book. Uh, but the one that I have as a reference, they label the temperature of the shell or of the tube fluid stream. So this is going through and there's a loop. And then they show that there are baffles here. <clears throat> and then they show the tube inlet coming here with capital T. Or sorry, that's the shell inlet and the shell exit, capital T2. So with those, uh, you can then, just by looking at the schematic and, and reading the problem statement, you can figure out which is the big T and which is the little T in the temperatures. And then what you would do, uh, there would be another chart. And in this other chart, what we would have is the correction factor, and that would be plotted against some variable P that I'll define in a moment. And then there's going to be a number of different curves and these curves are going to be for different values of R, yet another factor that we'll define in a moment. So R is defined in the following manner, and P is defined in the following manner. 
And this would depend upon the figure that you're using for the particular heat exchanger. So you have to be a little careful with that. But what you would do is you go back to your temperature diagram. So let's do that. And let, let's begin. And what we're going to find out, T1 minus T2. So going back to our temperature diagram, T1 is here, is 120, and T2 is there. It's also 120. So let's look at our equation here. This here is going to be 120 minus 120, which is 0. So we're going to get an R value of 0. And there is no curve for 0. So you're going to wonder what's going on. Well, it turns out that this is a unit with a, a phase change. And whenever you have a phase change, so either condensation or boiling, with one of the streams, then we can just make the assumption that F is equal to 1.0. Okay, and so with that, now that we know F, we know Q, we know delta TM, it's pretty straightforward then to evaluate the area. So there we go. We get 7.864 square meters. This would be known as a sizing problem. You know your fluid streams and you're determining the size of the exchanger that is required. So that's the case of LMTD. It seemed to work quite well. Uh, what we'll do in the next segment is we're going to solve the problem again using LMTD where things don't work quite as well and, and that will lead us to a new approach for being able to solve heat exchanger problems. Okay, what we're going to do in this segment, we're going to solve another example problem using LMTD, again for a shell and tube heat exchanger. So I'll begin uh, by writing out what is known. Okay, <clears throat> so what we're dealing with is a shell and tube heat exchanger where uh, we have one tube pass going through our shell and tube heat exchanger and we have the area given the overall heat transfer coefficient, uh, inlet temperature, exit temperature for the liquid being water coming through and then we have gas actually coming through on the uh, other side and that is coming in at 260 degrees C. We don't know the exit temperature but we do know the mass flow rate. So things look okay in, in terms of what we've been given and what we're told is to find the mass flow rate of water. So what we're going to do, let's do this, try solving it using LMTD. and we're going to have to look up an F factor as well. So let's begin with the temperature distribution. That can often bring some clarity to what is going on with a particular problem. Okay, so when we're looking at the temperature diagram, uh, we can say this is TC2, this is TC1, and this is T hot 1. Now, we don't know the exit temperature of our hot fluid stream, so it's going to be somewhere in here. So we'll put question mark equals TH2. And then that means that we're going to have some kind of line drawn and the fluid stream will assume that it's counter flow going in that direction. So that's a bit of a problem. We don't know what that temperature is on exit. Let's take a look now at what equations we have that we can work with. Okay, so those are the equations that we have. Now what do we know here? Uh, we know U. 
we were told the area A. We don't know F because we don't know one of the temperatures on the exit, that is for our hot fluid. And we don't know delta TM, we can't evaluate that because we need that exit temperature. Now, what else do we know? Uh, we know the mass flow rate of air. Now with that, uh, we cannot determine this because usually we have to get the average to get the value of C sub P. And for the air, we know this, we don't know that. And then for the water fluid stream, we know both temperatures, so that's good. We can get the average uh, value of the specific heat, and we don't know the mass flow rate of the water. That's one of the things that we're after. So all of a sudden we're faced with a problem where we got a lot of unknowns in here, and our normal tools and techniques that we use in order to evaluate Q and then solve for mass flow rates and then go through are kind of blocked with this problem. So we don't know what mass flow rate of water is. That's what we're trying to solve in the problem. We don't know the exit temperature of our hot fluid stream. Therefore, we cannot get delta TM. We don't know that. And finally, if we do are able to get a correction factor for this, we can't determine that either because we're missing one of the exit temperatures. So how do we solve this type of problem? Well, unfortunately, the only way to solve this is to guess a temperature on exit. So you would guess H2 or TH2. And you would solve and iterate. And this is going to be a bit of a problem uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the delta TM, if you look in there, we have the natural logarithm, and so that's a nonlinear equation. You have to do trial and error in order to get the root of that equation. And, and so this is kind of a very laborious approach to solving a heat exchanger problem. There is a better way, and that is what we will look at uh, starting in the next lecture. Solution technique number two, so if we call this number one, solution number two is to use the effectiveness NTU, uh, which is the number of transfer units method, and sometimes it's just called the NTU or number of transfer methods. I unfortunately call it epsilon NTU because this epsilon, but it's really effectiveness. Uh, but anyways, that's where we're going to go in the next lecture. We're going to look at this new method, which enables us to solve problems that look like this, where we have all of these unknowns and we cannot directly apply LMTD if we have no way of determining uh, all of the inlet and exit temperatures of our fluid streams. So that's what we're going to be doing in the next lecture. Alright, so what we're going to do in this lecture, we're going to use a, a look at another method that you can use to analyze heat exchanger performance, and that is referred to as being the effectiveness, or epsilon, NTU, number of transfer units method. And if you recall, at the end of the last lecture, we looked at a problem using LMTD, where if you do not know one of your exit temperatures, uh, and you have no way of solving it, it requires an iteration in order to apply LMTD, which can be a little bit on the tedious side. And, and so that's why we're going to look at this new method, Effectiveness NTU. Okay, so if we're posed with the problem where we just know the inlet temperatures and the mass flow rates of our two fluid streams, we cannot determine the exit temperatures and consequently uh, when applying LMTD or the LMTD method, you cannot evaluate that and, and the solution requires a bit of a tedious iteration as we saw 
at the end of the last lecture when we're working an example problem that fit this description. So in these cases, we use the effectiveness NTU method. So what is the effectiveness NTU? Well, let's begin by defining effectiveness. Effectiveness is defined as being the amount of heat exchange or heat transfer that goes on within our heat exchanger divided by the maximum possible heat exchange that could take place between the two fluid streams. So with that, uh, you may ask, how do we determine what the maximum possible heat transfer is? And in order to do that, we have to look at a certain attribute of both of the fluid streams. That's what we'll talk about now. Okay. So uh, what we find is the maximum possible heat transfer can be determined by taking the minimum m dot c sub p, and we'll have a c min is what we'll be calling that in this technique. Uh, but the minimum fluid would have to undergo the maximum possible temperature difference. And the maximum possible temperature difference will be the difference in temperature between the hot fluid in and the cold fluid in. And, and so that is the way that we get Q max. So let's take a look at a temperature diagram in terms of what we're referring to here. So imagine we have a scenario where we have our cold fluid. This is a counter flow heat exchanger. T hot in is here. T cold one would be there. T cold 2 is there, T hot 2 is there. Now, if we're looking at the maximum possible temperature difference between these two fluid streams, it is going to be this difference here. And so that is the maximum possible temperature difference that exists. And so with that, what we can write is Q max m dot c sub p for our minimum fluid that would be the fluid where m dot c sub p is the smallest multiplied by the difference of hot n minus cold n that would be the maximum temperature swing that we could get and so with that if you know your effectiveness and if you know this value of Q max, you can determine the heat exchange that is occurring within your heat exchanger. And so we calculate Q in the following manner then. Okay, so that is the way we evaluate the heat transfer. If you know your effectiveness and you know your minimum fluid, uh, other terms to use, or the terms that are common in the effectiveness NTU method. We've already talked about the minimum fluid, but we define that as being C min. And C max. And we'll also look at the ratio of these two, but we won't do it here. We'll do that later on. Uh, other things we have, NTU, those are number of transfer units. Mm. 
and NTU is defined as being our overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area divided by C min for the minimum fluid. And this is going to come from uh, figures or equations. Just like with LMTD, we looked up the F factor. You'll look up an NTU factor. And NTU and effectiveness are plotted together. Uh, and from figures, or there are also equations that you can use. The equations are more accurate, but they take a little bit longer, but that's probably the better way to go. Uh, and then the effectiveness. And so here you use figures or equations again. And then effectiveness is also So another way that you can express it is just in terms of the delta T of the two fluid streams. So uh, you take the delta T of the minimum fluid divided by the maximum temperature difference in the heat exchanger. So those are some of the terms that we'll use in the effectiveness NTU. What we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to look at uh, two different types of problems that you can solve. And then we'll apply it uh, later on in this lecture, solving an example problem uh, that involves the effectiveness NTU method. All right, in this segment, what we're going to do, we're going to look at two different types of problems that you can apply the effectiveness NTU method to. And with that, we'll look at the procedures uh, for each type of problem that you can apply it to. So the first type of problem we're going to look at is referred to as being the rating problem. And if you recall, this is the problem that we ran into some trouble with when we applied the LMTD. So typically, you know the following information for this type of problem. And the unknowns, the heat transfer rate, and the exit temperature of our fluid streams. And consequently, it becomes difficult to apply LMTD because you don't know the exit values and you have to do that iteration. So uh, using the effectiveness NTU for this type of problem, we can go through a step-by-step -step procedure. And what I would recommend when you're solving these problems, don't necessarily adhere to these procedures exactly as I'm showing here. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of using common sense, looking at what you have and what you don't have. And, uh, you're, you're solving a bit of a puzzle when you're solving these problems because every one can be a little tiny different or a little a slight difference from one problem to another. But that is just a, an example of procedures that you can use for solving uh, these types of rating problems. So to begin with, uh, you calculate uh, the value of C min over C max. And we call that CR. And then we have our number of transfer units is UA divided by C min. And once you have that, you can determine epsilon or the effectiveness from the appropriate figure, if you have a figure in your book, or you can use an equation. Now remember the equation is going to be the more accurate approach. Third step. The third step is you compute the heat transfer rate. And remember, we multiply that by the maximum temperature difference, which is the hot temperature N minus the cold temperature N. And with that, uh, now that we've determined the heat transfer rate, then we can determine the outlet temperatures. Uh, 
Okay, so that's how you can go about uh, solving a rating problem using the effectiveness NTU method. Now sometimes, uh, it, depending on the nature of the problem, you can get a fun problem where you don't know which is the minimum fluid and you have to guess that and then go through and try to solve it. And if the equations don't work out, uh, that's a pretty good indication that you picked the wrong fluid as being the minimum problem. I'm not going to cover those, but you could have a problem that involves something like that. Uh, so that is a rating problem in the procedures. The other type is the one that we used and uh, applied LMTD to, and that is just a sizing problem, but I'll go through that procedure as well. And so typically when you're dealing with a sizing problem, you know the following information. And what you're trying to find is quite often the surface area. You're sizing the heat exchanger, so. Okay, so the procedure for a sizing problem, let's take a look at that. And the solution is going to depend upon if the hot fluid or the cold fluid has the minimum M dot C sub P value. But if the minimum fluid turns out to be the hot fluid, then your effectiveness is computed with the following equation. And if the minimum fluid turns out to be the cold fluid, then the effectiveness is determined with a different equation. Okay, second step, we determine the value of CR. Third step, so we know the effectiveness and we know CR so with that you can determine the number of transfer units and you get that either from appropriate figures or equations. And again, as before, using the equations will yield more accurate results. And then finally, we're looking for the size So knowing the number of transfer units, we can then get the area of the exchanger. Divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient U. So those are two different uh, methodologies or procedures that you can use to apply effectiveness NTU. Uh, we looked at either a rating problem or a sizing problem. So what we're going to do in the next segment, which will be the last segment of this lecture as well as the last segment of this course, uh, we're going to take a look at applying the effectiveness NTU to solving a heat exchanger problem. <laughs> What we're going to do now is we are going to solve the heat exchanger problem using the effectiveness NTU method. So I'll begin by writing out what we know and what we're looking for. Okay. So we know that we're dealing with an air-to-air -air cross flow heat exchanger, both fluids unmixed. Mass flow rates for both of the streams is identical at 0.5 kilograms per second. The hot air flow coming in is at 400 degrees C, whereas the cool air flow coming in is at 20. 
Uh, overall uh, heat transfer coefficient is low because we have gas to gas so it's around 40 area is 20 square meters and what are we looking for we're looking for the exit temperatures of both fluid streams so we're looking for hot exit and we're looking for cold exit so how do we go about doing this well we know we're probably not going to be able to do lmtd uh, could we do lmtd we have m dot c sub p uh, you'd have to guess c sub p and you don't know your exit temperature so that would be hard uh, we are going to use epsilon or effectiveness ntu to solve this And if you recall back from the last segment, we looked at the two different procedures. We either had a sizing problem where you're looking for area or a rating problem. And so this particular problem turns out to be a rating problem. We're looking for Q as well as the exit temperatures. So what we're gonna begin with, we're gonna begin by getting the properties of air and we have a little bit of a problem here because if we look back at what is known we know the inlet temperatures of both of the gas streams but we don't know the exit temperatures and usually we're supposed to be evaluating uh, the specific heats at the average temperature and we don't know what the average temperature is so we're going to have to do a bit of a guess here and we will begin by evaluating at the inlet temperatures. We know that it's going to be lower, but this is kind of a first step. We have to iterate this problem. Uh, and when you look up the values for the hot, and then for the cold fluid stream, we'll take properties at 20 degrees C. So when we're dealing with the effectiveness NTU method, we have to determine which is the minimum fluid. And the mass flow rates are identical here. So the minimum one is going to be the one with the lower uh, specific heat. And that is going to be our cool fluid. So that is C min and then that will be C max. So looking at the step-by-step -step procedure, I said don't use it all the time, but we will. Uh, CR is C min over C max. Mass flow rates are the same. So with that, we get the ratios to be 0 0.9408. That's the first step. Second step is to estimate the number of transfer units. And remember that is defined as being UA divided by C min. So when you compute that, you get 1.59. Now that we have CR and we have NTU, we can then go ahead and evaluate the effectiveness. We can do this in one of two ways. We can get the effectiveness off of a figure and typically I'm not going to pull out a figure. I'm just going to sketch it so that you get an idea, but it is probably in any textbook that you're using. Uh, what we have is effectiveness on the vertical and then on the horizontal we have the number of transfer units and that is UA divided by C min and then what we have are different curves for different values of CR. And so you'll find these different curves that are on this plot. And so that would be for CR equals zero. And then asymptotically, we would get CR equals one at this point here. But what you would do is you would take the value. So we said CR was 0 0.9408. And we said NTU was 1.59. So you go on to the plot, you would, let me do red so that you can see it a little better. 
uh, you find the location on here, you work your way up, and 0 0.9408 is going to be pretty close there. You then go across and you read the value of epsilon or the effectiveness. And from that, you get 0 0.59. So we get effectiveness is 0 0.59 by reading a chart. You can also obtain it by using an equation. And this is the more accurate, but it's a little bit more laborious depending on how your eyesight is. It's not always easy to read these charts. Sometimes it's a lot easier just to plug and chug things into your calculator. Okay, so you get that big long equation there, but you know everything in it. You know CR, you know NTU, CR, NTU. So you can directly evaluate. When you plug the values in, we get the effectiveness is 0 0.58. 196, which is in pretty good agreement with what we get off of the chart. So I'm just going to take the 0.59 and continue on calculating. I should use the 0.58, but anyways, I'll use 0.59, not a big deal, um, because you're so close. So with that, we can then evaluate the heat transfer. And remember, heat transfer was determined this way. And with that, get 112.73 kilowatts, fourth step, and this is the last step on this pass through the problem. Remember, we have to iterate because we guessed the properties at the beginning. And so we get T hot out, 189.1 degrees C. So it didn't drop much, but we went, oh, we're going from 400, 400 down to 189. Yeah, so it is dropping a fair amount. and. TC out, so the cool fluid out, 244.2 degrees C, so it's going up quite a bit uh, from 20 degrees C up to 244 for the way that we have this particular problem. So that would be iteration number one, and technically what you should do is you should iterate this problem again. And to do that, you compute a new average temperature for the hot fluid. And a new average for the cold fluid. And when you do that again, uh, you find that this is going to be the minimum fluid because the mass flow rates are the same. But from this step on, you go through the exact same procedure again, and, and hopefully it converges after doing the calculation one more time. But that is an example of doing a rating problem using the effectiveness NTU method. And with that, that concludes heat exchangers and it concludes this course in heat transfers. So I hope you enjoyed it and learned something about heat transfer from this course. Um, anyways, that is all that I have for you. Thank you for watching.